Section 1 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Jim Rowland, San Diego, California. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. Section 1 Introduction the sea has always been the cradle of the English race, and over 600 years ago an old chronicler wrote of our great sea tradition that English ships visited every coast, and that English sailors excelled all others, both in the arts of navigation and in fighting. In this respect, the West of England has probably played a greater part in our maritime development than any other portion of the United Kingdom, and the names of her most famous seamen, Drake, Raleigh, and Hawkins, among others, are now almost household words. There are, however, many other nautical celebrities among her sons, whose names deserve a more prominent place in our naval annals, and such an one is Captain Woods Rogers. Not only does he rank as a splendid navigator and magnificent seaman, but he also filled an important role as a colonial administrator and governor, and was one of the pioneers in the development of our colonial empire. He is indeed one of the most picturesque and romantic figures of the first half of the 18th century, and his rescue and account of Alexander Selkirk's privations on the uninhabited island of Juan Fernandez undoubtedly provided Defoe with materials for Robinson Crusoe. It is not too much to assume that had there been no Woods Rogers, Defoe's charming and immortal romance, which has delighted millions of readers, might never have been written. Nevertheless, Rogers is rather an elusive personage, and the writer of the appreciative article on him in the Dictionary of National Biography was unable to glean any particulars of his birth, parentage, or marriage. Thanks to recent research, it is now possible to supply some of these details. It is certain that his ancestors had been settled at the old seaport of Poole, Dorset, since the beginning of the 16th century, and among the mayors of Poole, the name is prominent during the reign of Elizabeth. His great-grandfather, John Rogers of Poole, married Ann Woods, and from this union the name of Woods, afterwards spelt Woodis, Rogers, was perpetuated for at least three generations until the death of Wood Rogers' infant son in 1713. Woods Rogers II, the father of the subject of this book, was a sea captain born in Poole in 1650. He eventually removed to Bristol where his family consisted of two daughters and two sons, the eldest of whom, Captain Woods Rogers, was probably born there in 1679, but the precise date is uncertain. All that we know is that Rogers, like his father, followed a sea career, and in the records of Bristol he is described as a mariner, from which we may assume that he was connected with the merchant venturers of that port. He is probably to be identified with the Captain Rogers whom the famous navigator, Captain William Dampier, mentions in his voyages published in 1699 as my worthy friend, and from whom he included three contributions in his book. One, a long letter on the African hippopotamus, as he, Rogers, had seen them in the river Natal. Two, a description of the trade winds from the Cape of Good Hope to the Red Sea. And three, an account of Natal in Afrique, as I received it from my ingenious friend, Captain Rogers, who has lately gone to that place, and hath been there several times before. This gives a lively account of the manners and customs of the natives and the natural history of the country. It is evident that at this period, the Rogers family occupied a prominent position both in the industrial and social life of Bristol, and in January 1705, the marriage of Woods Rogers to the daughter of Admiral Sir William Whetstone of Bristol, the commander-in-chief in the West Indies, took place at St. Mary Magdalene, Old Fish Street, London. This marriage proved a stepping stone to Rogers' future career and in consequence of the union between these two old families, Rogers was made a freeman of his native place, as the following entry from the city records, under the date of 16 March 1704-5, shows, quote, Wood Rogers, Jr., Mariner, is admitted to the liberties of this city for that he married Sarah, daughter of Sir William Whetstone, Knight, end quote. We now come to the year 1708, in many respects the most eventful of Wood Rogers' career. He had long been impressed by the way in which both France and Spain monopolized the whole of the trade to the South Sea, 
and he determined if possible to remedy the evil. In 1698, Monsieur de Bouchain Guin, a captain of the French Navy, went there with two ships for the purpose of establishing trade, and an account of that voyage, in the shape of the commander's journal, coming to the hands of Rogers, he eagerly perused and digested it. Elated by the success of Bouchain Guin, the French had carried on a vast trade ever since, and in one year, Rogers informs us, no less than 17 warships and merchantmen had been sent to the South Sea. In the first year, it was estimated that their ships carried home above 100 millions of dollars, or nearly 25 million sterling, besides which they convoyed the Spanish galleons and treasure ships to and from the West Indies. By this means, they had become absolute masters of all the valuable trade in those parts, and the riches thus amassed had enabled them, according to Rogers, to carry on the war against most of the potentates of Europe. This war, known as the War of the Spanish Succession, in which the forces of Great Britain, Austria, and Holland were allied against those of France and Spain, lasted from 1702 to 1713, and Rogers, as befitted a seaman of sound knowledge and wisdom, realized the truth of the old saying that he who commands the sea commands the trade. Not only did he wish to see the English take a share in this vast trade of the South Sea, but he realized that it would be a fitting opportunity to attack the enemy's commerce there, and so by cutting off her resources it would help to shorten the war and enrich his own country. To quote his own words, necessity has frequently put private men on noble takings. This was indeed a noble undertaking, and in the belief that it was both necessary and profitable to undertake such an expedition, he drew up a scheme which he presented to his friends, the merchants of his native Bristol. The time was particularly opportune for such a venture, for an act had recently been passed by Parliament which marks a crucial and important point in the history of privateering. In this act, an effort was made to restore to privateering all the old spirit of adventure which permeated our sea story in the reign of Elizabeth. Previously, the crown had reserved to itself one-fifth of all prizes taken by privateers. Now the whole interest was transferred to the owner and crew. This act marks the close of the period of decline and the opening of a period of great activity. The crown now sanctioned privateering solely for the benefit which it was hoped to derive from injury inflicted on the enemy. Under these circumstances, it was only natural that the scheme which Rogers propounded should have been looked on in a most favorable light, and the expedition was duly financed and fitted out. Rogers dedicates his book to his surviving owners, and among them it is of particular interest to note the following. Sir John Hawkins, Mayor of Bristol in 1701, Christopher Shooter, Mayor in 1711, James Hollidge, Mayor in 1709, Captain Freak and Thomas Clements, Sheriffs of Bristol, John Romsey, Town Clerk of Bristol, and Thomas Goldney, a leading Quaker of Bristol. It will be seen from this that during the voyage 1708 through 11, the whole of the corporation at one time or another were interested in the adventure. The money being forthcoming, two merchant ships, or private men of war, were fitted out. These were the Duke of 320 tons, with a crew of 117 men and mounting 30 guns, and the Duchess, a slightly smaller ship of 260 tons, with a crew of 108 men and 26 guns. How these two small ships, the equivalent of a sixth-rate ship of the Royal Navy of the day, with a keel length of about 80 feet and a breadth of about 25 feet, helped to make history the readers of Wood Rogers' cruising voyage will be able to judge. Each ship had a commission from the Lord High Admiral to wage war against the French and the Spaniards, and in order that those who sailed with him should not be forgotten, Rogers has left us the names of all the officers in the two ships, and among them may be noted the following. Captain Stephen Courtney, commander of the Duchess, a man of birth, fortune, and of very amiable qualities, who contributed to the expense of the voyage. Thomas Stubber, second captain of the Duke, president of the Council, and captain of the Marines, whose appointment appears to have been due to his financial interest in the voyage. Bright Fafreshen, a doctor of physic, he is remembered to posterity as the inventor of Dover's powder. Captain Edward Cook, who was second to Captain Courtney, 
had been twice taken prisoner by the French. The most noteworthy was undoubtedly Captain William Dampier, then in his 56th year who sailed under Rogers as pilot for the South Seas. The choice was a wise one, for probably no man living had a wider experience in those waters, having been there three times before and twice round the world. To the Spaniards his name was second only to that of Drake, a formidable asset in a voyage of this kind. That he should have consented to serve under a much younger man is sufficient testimony of the regard and esteem in which he held Woods Rogers. Among the officers of the Duke were three lieutenants and three mates. Of the latter, John Ballot, third mate, was designated surgeon, if occasion arose, he having been Captain Dampier's doctor in his last unfortunate voyage around the world. This department was further strengthened by the inclusion of Dover's kinsman, Samuel Hopkins, an apothecary, who was to act as Dover's lieutenant if we landed a party. In addition, two young lawyers, George Underhill and John Parker, were born upon the ship's books, designed to act as midshipmen. Among the officers of the Duchess under Captain Courtney was Roger's young brother John, who sailed as second lieutenant. The instructions given by the owners were embodied in a document which Roger solemnly calls the Constitution, which was signed and sealed at Bristol on the 14th of July, 1708. This document not only stipulated the exact powers of the various officers, but laid down a definite rule that all attempts, attacks, and designs upon the enemy should at first be debated by a general council of the officers, and the same applied to all discontents, differences, or misbehavior. The wisdom of this procedure was apparent from the first, and Rogers states that without this method, we could never have performed the voyage. And so within three weeks of the signing of the Constitution, Rogers and his merry men sailed from the King Road, near Bristol, on August the 2nd, on what proved to be one of the most successful voyages that ever left the shores of Great Britain. His crew consisted for the most part of tinkers, tailors, haymakers, peddlers, fiddlers, etc., not forgetting John Finch, late wholesale oilman of London, as ship steward, and the ship's mascot, a fine specimen of an English bulldog. Though the composition of the crew was Gilbertian in the extreme, its spirit, as we shall see, was in the main Elizabethan. Most of us, the chief officers, says Rogers, embraced this trip of privateering round the world to retrieve the losses we had sustained by the enemy, and the opportunity soon offered itself. Proceeding down the Bristol Channel with a fair wind and bound for Cork, they saw a large ship, but after three hours' chase lost sight of her. This was probably fortunate for Rogers, for he records that his ships were out of trim, and that in his own ship there were not twenty sailors. After several minor adventures, Cork was reached on the 6th, where the provisioning of the ships was completed by Mr. Noblet Rogers, brother of one of the owners. Here Rogers succeeded in shipping some good sailors, and clearing out the useless ones, being ordinary fellows, and not fit for our employment. The defects in the rigging of the ships were now made good, and they were also careened and cleaned. During this enforced stay in Cork Harbor, we get a glimpse of the lighter side of a sailor's life. Though they expected to sail immediately, the crew, we are informed, were continually marrying. Among others, Rogers tells an amusing story of a Danish seaman who married an Irish woman without understanding a word of each other's language so that they were forced to use an interpreter, while the rest drank their cans of flip till the last minute and parted unconcerned the Dane continued melancholy for several days after the ship sailed. Sweethearts and wives were finally left behind on September 1st when the Duke and Duchess in company with about 20 merchant ships and escorted by the Hastings, man of war, under the command of Captain Paul, shaped their course for the Canary Islands. And now having left British waters with a mixed gang, as Rogers dubbed his crew, we hope to be well manned as soon as they have learnt the use of arms and got their sea legs which we doubted not soon to teach them, and bring them to discipline. The holds of both the Duke and Duchess were full of provisions. The between decks were crowded with cables, bread, and water casks, and whereas on leaving Bristol they had only a crew of 225 all told, they now had a total of 334, so we can quite agree with Rogers when he says they were very much crowded and pestered ships. 
Under such circumstances, Rogers was no doubt glad to sail under the protection of a man of war. Strange as it may seem, things were not so bad as Rogers thought, and after chasing a small vessel, he records with evident satisfaction that the Duke and Duchess sailed as well as any in the fleet, not excepting the man of war. Prior to parting company with Captain Paul, the crews were mustered in order to acquaint them with the design of the expedition and to give an opportunity of sending home any malcontents in the Hastings. All professed themselves satisfied, excepting one poor fellow on the Duke, who expected to have been the tithing man that year in his parish, and whose lament was that his wife would be obliged to pay forty shillings in his absence. However, when he saw all the rest willing, and knew the prospect of plunder, he became easily quieted, and in common with the others, drank heartily to the success of the voyage. Six days after leaving Cork, the ships parted company with the Hastings, and as a farewell gift, Captain Paul gave them scrubbers, iron scrapers for our ship's bottom, a speaking trumpet, and other things that we wanted. By this time, Rogers was beginning to get his ships into trim, and all provisions, etc., properly stowed, they hitherto having been in some confusion, as is usual in privateers at first setting out. Taking into consideration the length of the voyage, the different climates they would pass, and the excessive cold going about Cape Horn, it was resolved to stop at Madeira to replenish their slender stock of liquor. It was Pepys who wrote that seamen love their bellies above anything else, and Rogers was of the opinion that good liquor to sailors is preferable to clothing. In spite of the assurances of his crew a few days earlier, a mutiny now occurred on board his ship. He and his consort had chased and overhauled a vessel flying Swedish colors, believed to be carrying contraband goods. Nothing, however, was found to prove her a prize, and Rogers let her go without the least embezzlement, for which courtesy the master gave him two hams and some rough dried beef, and the compliment was returned with a dozen bottles of red streak cider. This much incensed the crews of the Duke and Duchess, who had no idea of the perils of privateering without the sweets of plunder, and under the leadership of the boatswain of the Duke, several of them mutinied. The situation looked ugly, but Rogers, who was a born commander, quickly quelled it, putting ten of the mutineers in irons, while the boatswain, the most dangerous fellow, was shipped in the Crown Galley, then in company, to be carried to Madeira in irons. Five days later, the prisoners were discharged from their irons, upon their humble submission and strict promises for their future good behavior. Contrary to arrangements, it was decided to pass by Madeira, there being little wind, and to cruise a little among the Canary Islands for liquor. On the 18th of September, they chased and captured a small Spanish bark, with 45 passengers on board, who were relieved when they found that their captors were English and not Turks. Among them were four friars, one of whom, a good honest fellow, Rogers and his officers made heartily merry drinking King Charles III's health. The rest, he tersely records, were of the wrong sort. The prize was carried into Oratava, where after some delay and a threatened bombardment of the town, the Spaniards eventually ransomed her. The transaction, however, seemed to have ended to Rogers' satisfaction, and his ship sailed away well stocked with liquor, the better able to endure the cold when we get the length of Cape Horn. On the 25th of September, the ships passed the tropic, when according to the ritual of the sea, the freshwater sailors were ducked from the yard arm or forced to pay a fine of half a crown. The next place of call was the Cape Verde Islands, and on the last day of September the two ships dropped anchor in the harbor of St. Vincent. Here they wooded and watered, and their casks, which had been oil casks, were hauled ashore, burnt and cleaned the water in them having stunk insufferably. By bartering with the inhabitants, they were also able to obtain fresh provisions in the shape of cattle, goats, hogs, fowls, melons, potatoes, limes, brandy, tobacco, Indian corn, etc. Here Rogers had the misfortune to lose one of his crew, Joseph Alexander, a good linguist, who had been sent ashore with a respectful letter to the governor. This man seems to have found life more attractive on the island than the uncertainties and hardships of life aboard a privateer. After waiting a week for him, Rogers reluctantly came to the conclusion that he had deserted, and it was unanimously agreed 
that we had better leave him behind than to wait with two ships for one man that had not followed his orders. Rogers was extremely scrupulous in all his undertakings. Everything relating to the proceedings of his squadron and the affairs of both officers and men was carefully recorded in his journal. On the eve of sailing from the Bay of St. Vincent, a council was held on board the Duchess to prevent embezzlement in prizes and to hinder feuds and disorders amongst the officers and men for the future. An agreement was arrived at whereby each man was to have the following shares in the plunder. A sailor or landsman, 10 pounds. An officer below the carpenter, 20 pounds. A mate, gunner, boatswain, and carpenter, 40 pounds. A lieutenant or master, 80 pounds. And the captains, 100 pounds over and above the gratuity promised by the owners, to such as shall signalize themselves. It was also agreed that both Rogers and Courtney should have 5% over and above their respective shares, and the reward of 20 pieces of 8 would be given to him that first sees a prize of good value or exceeding 50 tons in burden. This was signed by the officers and men of both ships on the 8th of October. On the same day that ships weighed and steered for the coast of Brazil, by this time the men had found their sea legs and were more amenable to discipline, and only one act of insubordination is recorded on the voyage to Brazil. The spiritual needs of the men were not neglected, and it is pleasing to note that from the 28th of October, when the ships crossed the line, prayers were read in both ships, morning or evening, as opportunity would permit, according to the Church of England. On the 19th of November, they made the coast of Brazil, anchoring off the island of Grande. The opportunity was now taken to replenish the water cast and careen the ships. The depredations of the French corsairs had made the Brazilians suspicious of strangers, and Roger states that his boat was fired on several times when trying to land with a present for the governor of Angre de Reis. On learning that they were English, Rogers and his men were welcomed by the friars and the governor, who treated them very handsomely. Roger's account of a religious procession in which he and his men, assisted by the ship's band, took part is one of the most amusing episodes in his book. Another amusing incident was an attempt by two Irish sailors to desert, but they were so frightened by the monkeys and baboons in the woods that they were glad to return to the ship. In the afternoon of December 3rd, the ships bade adieu to the hospitalities of the island of Grande and commenced their long and arduous voyage to Juan Fernandez, a distance of nearly 6,000 miles. A succession of gales now followed, and on the 13th of December the Duchess was forced to reef her mainsail for the first time since leaving England. In spite of strong gales, with squalls from the south to the west, when nearing Cape Horn, the new year was fitly ushered in. According to the custom of the sea, there was a large tub of punch hot upon the quarter-deck, where every man in the ship had above a pint to his share, and drank our owners and our friends' health in Great Britain. After which, Rogers record, we bore down to our consort and gave him three huzzas, wishing them the light. In anticipation of the excessive cold in going about Cape Horn, six tailors were hard at work for several weeks making warm clothing for the men, and every officer handed over such items as he could spare from his own kit. The actual passage of the horn is vividly described by Rogers, and although the Duchess was for some hours in considerable danger, good seamanship brought her and her consort safely through. Having got as far south as latitude 61 degrees 53 minutes, the furthest for aught we know that anyone has yet been to southward, we now account ourselves in the South Sea, says Rogers. In fact, Dampiris pilot had carried them so far south that many of the men in both ships were nearly frozen to death, and some were down with the scurvy. The pressing need was to find a harbor in order that the sick might be recruited ashore, and for this purpose the island of Juan Fernandez was decided upon. Unfortunately, all the charts differed, and for a time grave doubts were entertained of striking it. Thanks to the skill of Dampier who had been there before, the island was sighted on the last day of January, but by that time they had slightly overshot it, for it bore west-southwest distant about seven leagues. Footnote. Over 30 years later, 
Anson experienced the same difficulty and records that not finding the island in the position in which the charts had taught us to expect it, they feared they had gone too far to westward. End footnote. With this famous landfall lay not only the destinies of the crews of the Duke and Duchess, but also of the solitary inhabitant of the island who was anxiously scanning the horizon. That same afternoon, the pinnace was hoisted out and a boat's crew under the command of Dover went in her to go ashore. When the pinnace was about a league from the island, it being then nightfall, Rogers from the deck of the Duke suddenly saw a light blaze up from the shore. The pinnace immediately made haste to return, and believing that a French squadron was lying at anchor, Rogers ordered the decks to be cleared for action. At daybreak on the following day, the ship stood in to engage, but not a single sail was to be seen. A yawl with two officers and six men, all armed, was sent forward to reconnoiter, and as it neared the shore, a man, clothed in goatskins, was seen gesticulating wildly to them. This was Alexander Selkirk, late master of the Sink Ports, who through some quarrel with his captain had been on the island four years and four months. This was the first time that an English ship had called it the island since, and his joy at seeing the English flag again and hearing the voices of his own countrymen can better be imagined than described. Though his actions reflected his gratitude, his speech, for want of use, failed him. He seemed to speak his words by halves. His adventures and privations are vividly described by Rogers, and it is not proposed to dwell on them here. Suffice it to say that Selkirk's story was first communicated to the world in the pages of Wood Rogers' cruising voyage, and that his adventures formed the basis of the romance of Robinson Crusoe. Two days after their arrival at the island, all was bustle and excitement. A ship's forge was set up ashore, sail makers were busy repairing the sails, coopers were hard at work on the casks, and tents were pitched to receive the sick men. In the words of Rogers, we have a little town of our own here, and everybody is employed. The time was indeed precious, for while at the Canaries they had heard that five large French ships were coming to search for them, and Rogers was anxious to get away as soon as possible. Thanks to the goodness of the air and the help of the Greens, and to the fact that the governor, as Rogers dubbed Selkirk, cut two or three goats every day for them, the crew soon recovered from their distemper, and only two died. The ships were quickly wooded and watered, and about 80 gallons of sea lion's oil was boiled down to be used as oil for the lamps in order to save the candles. By the 12th of February, the sick men were re-embarked, and two days later the little squadron weighed with a fair pleasant gale, with Selkirk duly installed as second mate of the Duke. The voyage was continued to the northward off the coast of Chile and Peru, with the intent of getting across the track of the great Spanish galleons from Manila to Acapulco. On the 16th of March, they captured a little vessel of about 16 tons belonging to Peta, and on the following day arrived with their prize at the island of Lobos. Here it was resolved to fit out the prize as a privateer, she being well built for sailing. This was carried out with the greatest expedition, and with the crew of 32 men and four swivel guns, she was renamed the Beginning and placed under the command of Captain Cook. While the Duke was being cleaned and tallowed, the Beginning, in company with the Duchess, was sent to cruising, and on the morning of the 26th, they captured another Spanish vessel. Among other things, they found a store of tobacco on board, a very welcome article which was distributed among the men. After being cleaned and refitted, she was christened the Increase, and Selkirk was appointed to commander. The ships continued cruising on the station till the 5th of April, and among other prizes, they took the Spanish galleon Ascension, of 500 tons, bound from Panama to Lima. So far, the financial results of the expedition had been disappointing, but spurred on by the glowing accounts given by their prisoners of richly laden ships that were expected, with the widow of the Viceroy of Peru with her family and riches, and the wealth of the Spanish South American cities, they resolved to attack the city of Guayaquil and exact a ransom. This resolution was arrived at on the morning of April 12th, and a council was held on board the Duke to discuss the project when regulations were drawn up regarding the landing parties and other details. In order that his mixed gang of most European nations should have good discipline and needful encouragement, 
Minute regulations were drawn up by Rogers and his officers concerning what was to be termed plunder. Although everything portable seems to have been considered as such, it is amusing to learn that Rogers, with his customary civility to the fair sex, resolved that money and women's earrings with loose diamonds, pearls, and precious stones should be accepted. The plunder of Waikil, being thus comfortably and amicably arranged beforehand, the ships headed for the island of Puna at the entrance to the Waikil River. On the 15th of April, when nearing their intended anchorage, an unfortunate incident occurred. In an attack on a French-built ship belonging to Lima, Roger's younger brother John was killed in attempting the border. Though he must sympathize with Rogers when he speaks of his unspeakable sorrow on this occasion, we cannot but admire his pluck when he philosophically adds that the greatest misfortune or obstacle shall not deter him from the object that he had in view. Within 24 hours, Rogers had captured the ship, eventually naming her the Marquis and increasing her armament from 12 to 20 guns. On the 19th, the landing was effected on the island of Puna, and at midnight on the 22nd, the ship's boats, with 110 men, arrived in sight of the town of Guayaquil. On the top of an adjoining hill, a blazing beacon showed that an alarm had been raised. Bells were violently rung, and muskets and guns were discharged to awake the inhabitants. A hurried consultation was now held between Rogers and his chief officers, and both Dampier and Dover were against proceeding with the attack. Cautious counsels prevailed, and the plan for taking the town by surprise, having failed, negotiations were opened with the governor for its ransom. A sum of 50,000 pieces of eight was demanded, but the town could only raise 30,000. Rogers thereupon broke off the negotiations, and while the ships bombarded the town, he landed a force of 70 men and guns. Rogers has minutely described the attack, and space forbids dwelling on it here. Suffice it to say that within an hour the enemy were in full retreat and the English were masters of the city. Other reinforcements were now landed in strategic points in the city occupied, while parties were told off to plunder. An agreement was eventually drawn up for the payment of 30,000 pieces of aid as ransom to be paid within six days. On the 27th of April, Rogers and his men marched down to the boats with colors flying, and the plunder was safely stored aboard. At eight o'clock the next morning they sailed with drums beating, trumpets sounding, and guns booming, and thus took leave of the Spaniards very cheerfully. It was now decided to make the utmost dispatch for the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Peru. In the passage there, a malignant fever contracted at Guayaquil broke out amongst the crews of both ships, and on the morning of the 17th, when in sight of the Galapagos, no less than 60 were down on the Duke, and upwards of 80 on the Duchess. On arrival at the island, it was agreed to separate in order to search for fresh water, but none was discovered. Finding that Punch preserved his own health, Rogers records that he prescribed it freely among such of the ship's company as were well, though it was thought when setting out from Bristol that they had sufficient medicines aboard. Rogers now laments that with so many sick in both ships, the supplies were inadequate. Owing to the absence of water, it was decided to steer for the island of Gorgona near the mainland. Here a supply of fresh water was available, and the sick were brought ashore and placed in tents to recruit their health. The opportunity was now taken to caulk and careen the ships and examine the prizes. In discharging the cargo of the galleon which Rogers had named the Marquis, he found in her, to his amazement, 500 bales of Pope's bowls, 16 reams in a bale, and a quantity of bones in small boxes, ticketed with the names of Romish saints, some of which had been dead seven or eight hundred years. A more inconvenient cargo for a privateer would be difficult to imagine, and as they took up such a lot of room in the ship, Rogers records that he threw most of them overboard to make room for better goods, except some of the papal bulls which he used to burn the pitch off our ship's bottoms when we careened them. In extenuation for what may seem an impious act, Rogers states that it was impossible to read them as the print looked worse than any of our old ballads. After two months' stay at Gorgona, the crew had sufficiently recuperated to continue the cruise, and on the 7th of August the ship sailed from the island bound southward. On board the Duke were 35 Negroes, lusty fellows selected from some of the Spanish prizes. 
Rogers called them together and explained his plan of campaign, telling them that if they fought and behaved themselves well in the face of an enemy, they should be free men, upon which thirty-two of them immediately promised to stand to it as long as the best Englishmen, and desired that they might be improved in the use of arms. To confirm the contract, Rogers gave them a suit of bays, and made them drink a dram all around to the success of the voyage. In order that nothing should be wanting, he staged a sham fight to exercise them in the use of our great guns and small arms, and in the heat of the engagement to imitate business, red lead mixed with water was liberally sprinkled over them. A very agreeable diversion, comments Rogers. And so for the real business, the capture of the Manila ship. All the romance of buccaneering and privateering hangs round these great treasure galleons, the annual ships from Manila to Acapulco and the sister ships from Acapulco to Manila. It was the golden dream of every sailor who sailed these seas to capture one of them. But although many had made the attempt, only one prior to this, that famous Elizabethan seaman Thomas Cavendish had actually done so in 1587. Here was a feat worthy of emulation, and so, in the November of 1709, we find Rogers and his little squadron cruising off Cape St. Lucas, waiting and watching in the very place and in the same month where Cavendish took the Manila ship, 122 years earlier. It was a long and weary watch which tested both the temper and the mettle of the men to the extreme. Through the whole of November, no sign of the treasure ship was to be seen. Several of the men mutinied and were confined in irons, and two others broke up with a storeroom and stole from the fast-diminishing stop of victuals. By the 20th of December, provisions were at such a low ebb that Rogers records, we all looked very melancholy and dispirited. And after consultation with his officers, it was agreed to make for the island of Guam with the utmost dispatch in order to re-victual. All hope of falling in with the Manila ship had been practically abandoned, when at nine o'clock on the following morning, a man at the masthead of the Duke cried out that he saw a sail distant about seven leagues, bearing west, half south of us. At this great and joyful surprise, the English ensign was immediately hoisted, and both the Duke and Duchess bore away after her. The weather had now fallen calm, and all through that day, and the next, Rogers hung on to his prey with his two pinnaces tending her all night and showing false fires that they might keep in touch. Before nightfall on the 22nd, both the Duke and Duchess cleared for action, and everything was made ready to engage the ship at daybreak. As day dawned, the chase was observed upon the Duke's weather bow, about a league away while the Duchess was ahead of her to leeward near about half as far. The ships were now becalmed, and Rogers was forced to get out eight of our ship's oars and rowed above an hour. A light breeze then sprang up and carried them gently towards the enemy. There was no time to be lost. Not a dram of liquor was in the ship to fortify the spirits of the men, so a large kettle of chocolate was boiled and served out to the crew, who when they had emptied their pannikins went to prayers like true British sailors. Ere long their devotions were disturbed by the enemy's gunfire, and about eight o'clock the Duke began to engage the Spaniards single-handed, the Duchess being to leeward and having little wind could not get up in time. The enemy presented a most formidable aspect with powder barrels hanging at each yard arm to deter us from boarding. As the Duke approached, she received the fire of the enemy's stern chasers, to which she was only able to reply with her fore chasers. Holding on her course, she soon ranged alongside the great galleon and gave her several broadsides. The precision and rapidity of the English gunners was apparent from the first, and after a little while, the Duke shot a little ahead and placing herself across the bows of the galleon, plied her guns with such good effect that the Spaniard hauled her colors two-thirds down and surrendered. The fight, which was hotly contested, according to Rogers, lasted about three glasses, and on board the Spaniard, nine men were killed and several wounded. On the English side, only two were wounded, Rogers and an Irish landsman. Rogers' wound was a serious one. He was shot in the left cheek, the bullet carrying away part of his upper jaw. As he lay on the deck, writhing in agony, he pluckily delivered his orders in writing. Two days later, although he had much ado to swallow any sort of liquids and was obviously very ill, 
It was decided to cruise for a larger ship which the prisoners stated had sailed from Manila at the same time. On Christmas Eve, the Duchess and the Marquis sailed out of the harbor of Port Segura to search for the larger ship. The inability of the former to engage the other Spanish ship in time had caused some reflections amongst the sailors, and it was decided by a majority of the council that Rogers with the Duke and the prize should wait in harbor to refit, much against our will. However, Rogers was not to be put aside. He placed two men on an adjoining hilltop to signal as soon as the Spanish ship was sighted, and on the 26th he stood out to sea to join his consorts. By nine o'clock in the morning, the Duchess was observed engaging the Spaniard, and the Marquis standing to them with all the sail she could crowd. Unfortunately, at this moment, the Duke was some twelve miles to leeward, and as the wind was light, she made little way. By the afternoon, the Duchess was joined in the attack by the Marquis, but the latter soon fell to leeward out of cannon shot, being apparently temporarily disabled. Fortunately, she soon recovered and renewed the attack with great vigor for four glasses and upwards. The brunt of the fighting having fallen on the Duchess, she now stretched ahead to windward of the enemy to repair her rigging and stop a leak. In the meantime, the Marquis kept firing several broadsides until the Duchess bore down again when the fight was renewed until nightfall. All this time, Rogers and the Duke was crowding on all sail to come to his consort's assistance. At daybreak, the wind shifted, and Rogers was able to bring his guns to bear. The Duchess, being now thwart the Spaniard's hoss and plying her guns very fast, those that missed the target exposed the Duke to a serious risk. If we had lain on her quarters and across her stern as I had designed. Rogers now ranged his sip alongside the Spaniard and for four glasses continued pouring broadsides into her. The Duke now received two shots in her mainmast which disabled her, and the fireball lighting on her quarter deck blew up a chest of gunpowder and nearly fired the ship. The Duchess was in much the same plight, and having our rigging shattered very much, Rogers records, we sheared off and brought two. A council was now held on board the Duke, and taking into consideration the damage that the ships had received, coupled with the fact that their ammunition was nearly exhausted, it was unanimously agreed to forbear any further attempts on the Spaniard. The loss of such a valuable prize caused great disappointment, and it was Roger's opinion that had the Duke been allowed to accompany the Duchess and Marquis on their first setting out, we all believe we might then have carried this great ship. However, Rogers had reason to be proud of the way in which his ships had acquitted themselves. The lofty Spaniard was the Admiral of Manila, named Begonia, a new ship of 900 tons with a crew of 450 and mounting 60 brass guns. It was estimated the English fired no less than 500 shot, 6 pounders, into her hull. From first to last, the English had fought her for 7 hours, and the casualties on the Duke were 11 wounded, while the Duchess had about 20 killed and wounded, and the Marquis too scorched with powder. Among the wounded was Rogers, who had part of his ankle carried away when the Spaniard's fireball blew up on the quarter deck. To the end of the action, he lay on his back where he fell, encouraging the men and refusing to be carried below. It was now resolved to return to Port Segura on the California coast to look after the prize already taken, and on the first day of January they were again in harbor. The Acapulco Galleon was now named the Bachelor, in honor of Alderman Bachelor of Bristol, one of the financiers of the expedition. By a majority, the council decided to appoint Dover to commander, and Rogers, ill as he was, strongly protested against the appointment. Dover was not a seaman. He was absolutely incapable of commanding and navigating the prize to England. Moreover, his temper was such that most of the seamen refused to serve under him. Finally, a compromise was arrived at, and Captains Fry and Stretton were entrusted with the navigation, sailing, and engaging of the ship, and Selkirk was appointed master. Dover, though nominally in command, was not to molest, hinder, or contradict them in their business. During the evening of the 10th of January, 1710, the four ships, Duke, Duchess, Marquis, and Bachelor, all heavily laden, left the coast of California for the island of Guam one of the Ladrones, that being the first stage on their journey home to Great Britain. Provisions were now extremely short, and five men were forced to subsist on one and a half pounds of flour 
and one small piece of meat between them per day, with three pints of water each for drink and dressing their victuals. Stern measures were therefore necessary, and a seaman who stole several pieces of pork was punished with the cat of nine tails by his messmates. During this extreme scarcity, Rogers was forced to adopt a measure which is perhaps rather a humiliating episode in his career. To his Negro sailors, whom he had promised to treat as Englishmen, and who had behaved themselves well, he could only allow six in a mess to have the same allowance as five of her own men, which will but just keep those that are in health alive. The long voyage to Guam, a distance of over 6,000 miles, occupied two months, during which the best day's run was 168 miles and the worst 41. Nothing of importance occurred until the 14th of February, when in commemoration of the ancient customs of choosing valentines, Rogers drew up a list of all the fair ladies in Bristol who were in any way related or known to them. Assembling his officers in the cabin of the Duke, Everyone drew and drank the lady's health in a cup of punch and to a happy sight of them all. Three days later, Rogers was troubled with a swelling in his throat, which incommoded him very much, and he succeeded in getting out a piece of his jawbone that had lodged there since I was wounded. On March the 11th, they arrived at Guam, where Rogers, after a little diplomatic dealing with the Spanish governor, succeeded in getting such provisions as he wanted for his depleted stores. In return, the governor and others were entertained on board the Duke, the crew diverting them with music and our sailors dancing till night. On the 21st of March, they sailed from Guam for the Moluccas, encountering very stormy weather, and owing to the unseaworthy nature of the Duke, the crew were wearied almost to death with continual pumping. By the 15th of May, provisions had again reached a low ebb, and with the shortest allowance, it was estimated that he could only subsist at sea three weeks longer. A fortnight later, the four ships were safely anchored at the island of Bhutan, by which time the Duchess was using her last butt of water. Here the king of Bhutan supplied them with various commodities, all of which were very dear. Nevertheless, as some return for the hospitality received Rogers made the king a present of a bishop's cap, which is it of interest to note he highly esteemed and gratefully accepted. Being now pretty well supplied with provisions for a fortnight or three weeks, the ships left the island on the 8th of June en route for Batavia, having taken on board a pilot who promised to carry them through the channel the great Dutch ships generally went. On the 17th, near the north coast of Java, they met a Dutch ship of 600 tons, the first eastward-bound merchantman they had seen for nearly two years. From her they had their first items of home news, the death of Prince George of Denmark, the consort of Queen Anne, and the continuation of the wars in Europe. Three days later they anchored safely in the roadstead of Batavia, betwixt thirty and forty sail, great and small. After such a long and perilous voyage, the crew were naturally overjoyed at being in port. To them Batavia was a perfect paradise. They hugged each other and thanked their lucky stars that they had found such a glorious place for punch, where they could have a rock for eight pence per gallon and sugar for a penny a pound. In spite of the humors of his ship's company, Rogers was still very ill, the doctor having recently cut a large musket shot out of his mouth, and while at Batavia several pieces of his heel bone were also removed. As the Marquis was found unfit to proceed to Europe, she was sold for 575 Dutch dollars, an extraordinary bargain, remarks Rogers. On October the 12th, after a stay of nearly four months, they sailed from Batavia and proceeded direct to the Cape of Good Hope. The Duke was in such a leaky condition that she was kept afloat with the greatest difficulty. By the end of October, she had three feet of water in the hold, and our pumps being choked, says Rogers. We were in such dangers that we made signals and fired guns for our consorts to come to our relief, but it just sucked her, i.e. pumped her dry, as the Duchess came up. On the 28th of December, the three ships arrived at the Cape, and 16 sick men were sent ashore. Several days were now spent in watering and refitting, and on the 18th of January, 1711, it was agreed that some of the plate and gold from the ships should be sold to buy several necessities and provisions. 
On account of his valuable cargo, Rogers deferred his departure until a number of homeward-bound ships collected, and it was not before April the 6th that the combined fleet, numbering 16 Dutch and 9 English ships, sailed for Europe. On the 14th of May, the Duke and Duchess crossed the line for the eighth time. A course was now steered to the westward of the Azores, and from thence northeastward around the Shetlands to the Texel, where the whole fleet anchored on the 23rd of July. Here Rogers remained some little while, having received orders from the owners at the East India Company resolved to trouble us, on pretense we had encroached upon their liberties in India. Finally, all difficulties were amicably settled, and at the end of September, the Duke, Duchess, and Marquis sailed from Holland, convoyed by four English men of war. On the 1st of October, they arrived in the Downs, and on the 14th came to anchor at Erith, which finished their long and fatiguing voyage of over three years. Thus ended one of the most remarkable expeditions that ever left the shores of Great Britain. The cost of fitting it out was less than 14,000 pounds, and the net profits amounted to at least 170,000 pounds. Of this sum, two-thirds went to the owners, and the other third was divided according to their rating among the officers and men. The prizes taken, including the ships and barks ransomed at Guayaquil, amounted to 20 sail. What a rousing welcome must have been accorded Rogers and his plucky crew when they arrived home in Bristol. By their daring and skill, they had ranged the seas in defiance of the enemy, and by their superb seamanship and courage, they had added a brilliant page to our naval history. Their voyage was epic-making. In the words of a contemporary writer, there never was any voyage of this nature so happily adjusted. Once and for all, it stripped distant and tedious navigations of those terrors which haunted them through the incapacity of their commanders, and it opened a door to the great South Sea, which was never to be closed again. Rogers was a born leader, besides being a magnificent seaman. He had a way of maintaining authority over his men which Dampier and others before him sadly lacked, and whenever the occasion arose he had a happy knack of ingratiating himself with the various authorities ashore. Whether friend or foe, he invariably parted with them cheerfully. In many respects, the voyage of Woods Rogers is more noteworthy than that of Anson thirty years later. Rogers has only two small merchant ships fitted out by private enterprise, whereas Anson's squadron was fitted, manned, and armed by the Admiralty. It comprised six ships of the Royal Navy, with 236 guns and 2,000 men, in addition to two victualling ships of the size of the Duke and Duchess. Rogers was able to bring both his ships safely home, but fate was not so kind to Anson, and only one, his flagship the Centurion, succeeded in reaching England. The success of the expedition naturally stimulated public interest, and at the request of his many friends, Rogers agreed to publish his journal, which appeared in the following year under the title of A Cruising Voyage Round the World. It is written, as its author informs us, in the language of the sea, and as such it is a picturesque human document, enlivened with the quaint humor which makes it delightful reading. During the 18th century, the book was widely read. Three editions appeared within the space of 14 years, and it was also translated into French and German. It was used as a model by later voyagers, and it is interesting to note that when Anson sailed on a similar expedition 30 years later, a copy of the cruising voyage found a prominent place in his cabin. End of section 1《section 2 》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
At this period of his life, he formed some important and influential friendships, and among his correspondents we find such well-known names as Addison, Steele, and Sir Hans Sloane. To a man of Roger's disposition, an inactive life must have been particularly irksome, and his ever-restless nature was continually looking for some outlet where the spirit of adventure was combined with service to the state. In the years following his expedition round the world, the government had under consideration various schemes for the settlement of Madagascar and the Bahama Islands, both of which had become strongholds for the pirates and were a dangerous menace to the trade and navigation in those waters. That Rogers had his own ideas on the matter is shown in the following letter to Sir Hans Sloane, dated 7th May, 1716, which in its way is a model of brevity. Sir, I being ambitious to promote a settlement on Madagascar, beg you'll be pleased to send me what account you have of that island, which will be a particular favor done. Your most obliged humble servant, Woods Rogers. For some reason or other, the proposed settlement never matured, and nothing further is heard of it. There remained, however, the question of the Bahamas, and it was not long before Rogers was called from the seclusion of his Bristol home to take command of an important expedition against the pirates of New Providence in the Bahamas, in which he was to become a pioneer in the settlement and administration of our West Indian Empire. The story of this expedition, and Rogers's subsequent career as governor of the Bahama Islands, the most northerly of our West Indian possessions, has never been told in full before. It may be taken as a typical example of the pluck and enterprise shown by our early colonial governors against overwhelming odds and difficulties, and as such, it fills an important chapter in colonial history. Although the islands had nominally belonged to Great Britain since 1670, they had been left without any systematic government or settlement for over half a century and in consequence the House of Lords, in an address to the Queen, during the early part of 1716, set forth the desirability of placing the Bahamas under the crown for the better security and advantage of the trade of this kingdom. They pointed out that twice within living memory the French and Spaniards had plundered the colony and driven out the few English settlers, and that it was now necessary to establish a stable form of government there. Owing to their geographical position, the Bahamas were a favorite haunt of the pirates, whose headquarters were at New Providence, the principal island. Nothing, however, was done in the matter until the following year, when Rogers submitted a careful and considered proposal for their settlement to the Lord's Commissioners of Trade in the summer of 1717. He emphasized the importance of those islands to British trade and navigation and the necessity of driving out the pirates and fortifying and settling the islands for the better protection of that trade. His endeavors were stoutly supported by some of the most considerable merchants of London and Bristol, who declared that Rogers was in every way qualified for such an undertaking. In the meantime, the Lord's proprietors of the Bahamas surrendered the civil and military government of the islands to the Crown with the reservation of quit rents and royalties. These they leased under an agreement dated 28th of October, 1717, to Rogers, who was described in the original lease as of London, Mariner, for a term of 21 years. For the first seven years, Rogers was to pay £50 a year. For the second seven years, £100 a year. And for the remaining period, £200 a year. Accordingly, Rogers' suggestion backed by the recommendation of Addison, then Secretary of State, was agreed to, and he was duly appointed Captain General and Governor-in-Chief in and over our Bahama Islands in America, the King reposing a special trust in his prudence, courage, and loyalty. On his appointment, he assigned his lease to W. Chetwind, Adam Cardinal, and Thomas Pitt, with the proviso that the lessee was to have the right to grant lands for not less than one penny sterling per acre. Among other things, Rogers had represented to the Crown the necessity of taking out a number of soldiers to protect the colony. And on the 14th of October, 1717, Addison wrote to the Secretary of War, 
stating that the company should consist of a hundred men at least, and that as the season was too far advanced to procure these forces from any part of America, he proposed that they should be drafted out of the guards or any other regiments now on foot or out of His Majesty's Hospital at Chelsea. This garrison Rogers had proposed to victual at the rate of sixpence per head per diem, and the treasury were asked to provide the sum of 912 pounds 10 shillings, the cost of a year's victualling, provided your lordship shall find the same to be a cheap and reasonable proposal. On the 6th of November, Rogers duly received his commission as captain of the independent company of foot, which we have appointed to do duty in our Bahama Islands in America. While in London, Rogers had an opportunity of renewing his friendship with Steele, whom he met in the tennis coffee house in the cockpit, Whitehall, on which occasions, we are told, the conversation turned upon the subject of trade and navigation, a subject which we may be sure was eagerly discussed, for Steele at the time was full of his idea for the fish pool, a scheme for bringing fish alive to London. On Friday, the 11th of April, Roger sailed from England to take up his appointment. His commission gave him full power to employ whatever means he thought fit for the suppression of piracy, and he also carried with him the Royal Proclamation of Pardon, dated 5th of September, 1717, to any pirates who surrendered before the 5th of September, 1718. At the same time, a determined effort was made by the government to stamp out piracy in the whole of the West Indian Islands, and several ships were dispatched to Jamaica, Barbados, and the Leeward Islands for that purpose. After a voyage of three and a half months, Rogers arrived at his destination, and on the 25th of July, the Delicia, with the governor and his retinue on board, escorted by Her Majesty's ships Rose and Milford, anchored off Nassau, the principal town of New Providence, and the seat of government of the Bahamas. Owing to the lateness of the evening, the pilot of the Delicia decided that it was unsafe to venture over the bar that night, and in consequence it was resolved to wait till the morning. From information received, it was learnt that nearly all the pirates were anxious to avail themselves of the royal clemency. Two notable exceptions, however, were Teach, the famous Blackbeard, and Charles Vane. The latter swore that he would suffer no other governor than himself, except on his own terms, and these he embodied in the following letter to Rogers. Your Excellency may please to understand that we are willing to accept His Majesty's most gracious pardon on the following terms, viz. that you will suffer us to dispose of all our goods now in our possession, likewise to act as we think fit with everything belonging to us, if Your Excellency shall please to comply with this, we shall, with all readiness, accept of His Majesty's act of grace. If not, we are obliged to stand on our defense. We wait a speedy answer. Rogers promptly replied by sending in the rose and the shark sloop, and after a desultory cannonade, Vane set fire to a French prize of 22 guns, and during the confusion and danger which followed, he and about 90 of his crew succeeded in escaping to sea. The morning following Vane's escape, Rogers went on shore and was enthusiastically received by the principal inhabitants. The pirates who had availed themselves of the royal pardon were not to be eclipsed in their desire to show their loyalty to the new governor. And on the way from the beach to the fort, Rogers passed between two lines of reformed pirates who fired their muskets in his honor. On arriving at the fort, the Royal Commission was opened and read, and Rogers was solemnly sworn in as Governor of the Bahamas. The next procedure was to form a council, and for this purpose Rogers nominated six of the principal persons he had brought with him from England, and six of the inhabitants, who had not been pirates and were of good repute. Within a week of landing, Rogers assembled this council, and among other business, the following appointments were made. Judge of the Admiralty Court, Collector of Customs, Chief Justice, Provost Marshal, Secretary to the Governor, and Chief Naval Officer. Having appointed his council and administrative officers, 
Rogers next turned his attention to the inhabitants and the condition of the islands generally. It was a task which required a man of strong and fearless disposition, and Rogers did not shrink from this responsibility. The secret of his success was that he found and made work for all. The fort of Nassau, in ruins and dismantled, was repaired and garrisoned. A number of guns were also mounted, and a strong palisade constructed round it. All about the town the roads were overgrown with brushwood and shrubs and rendered almost impassable. A proportion of the inhabitants were therefore mustered and employed in clearing the ground and cleansing the streets, while overseers and constables were employed to see the work carried out in an efficient manner. Those not employed on cleansing and scouring were formed into three companies of militia, whose duty it was to keep guard in the town every night to prevent surprise attacks. The neighboring islands were not forgotten, and various members of the council were appointed deputy governors of them. A militia company was also formed in each of the principal ones, and a fort constructed and provided with powder and shot. As an extra method of precaution, the Delicia was retained as the governor's guardship and stationed off the harbor of Nassau. A scheme of settlement was also devised, and in order to attract settlers to New Providence and the other islands, a plot of ground 120 foot square was offered to each settler, provided he would clear the ground and build a house within a certain time. As there was abundance of timber on the island which was free to be taken, this stipulation was not difficult to fulfill. Unfortunately, the difficulties which Rogers had to contend with bid fair to wreck his almost utopian scheme. Before many months had elapsed, the pirates found this new mode of life less remunerative and much more irksome to their roving dispositions. As Captain Charles Johnson, their historian, tersely puts it, it did not much suit the inclinations of the pirates to be set to work. As a result, many of them escaped to sea at the first opportunity and resumed their former trade. One of their number, John Auger by name, who had accepted the royal pardon, was appointed by Rogers to command a sloop dispatched to get provisions for the island. Captain John, however, soon forgot his oath of allegiance, and meeting with two trading vessels en route, he promptly boarded and rifled them. With booty estimated at 500 pounds, he steered a course for Hispaniola, little knowing that he had played his last card. Encountering a severe storm, he and his comrades were wrecked on one of the uninhabited Bahamas, where Rogers, hearing of their fate, dispatched a ship to bring them back to Nassau. Here they were quickly dealt with by the Court of Admiralty, and ten out of eleven of them were convicted and hanged in the sight of their former companions. A contemporary records that these trials were marked by Rogers' prudence and resolution, and that in the condemnation and execution of the pirates he had a just regard of the public good, and was not to be deterred from vigorously pursuing it in circumstances which would have intimidated many brave men. Whenever the occasion offered, Rogers tempered justice with mercy, and the human side of his character comes out well in the case of the man who was pardoned. His name, Rogers informs us, was George Ronceval, and I reprieved him under the gallows, he wrote in a letter to the Secretary of State, through a desire to respite him for his future repentance. He is the son of loyal and good parents at Weymouth in Dorsetshire, I hope this unhappy young man will deserve his life, and I beg the honor of your intercession with His Majesty for me on his behalf. One of the greatest difficulties which Rogers had to encounter was the smallness of the force at his disposal for the preservation of law and order. The discovery of a conspiracy among the settlers to desert the island and their friendship with the pirates were matters of urgent importance, which he brought to the notice of the home government. From first to last, his great ambition was to make the colony worthy in all respects of the British Empire, and amidst frequent disorders we find him busy about this time with plans for the development of the whale fishery and for supplying Newfoundland and North America with salt. The failure of the Admiralty to send out ships for the protection of the colony against the swarms of pirates who still infested the West Indian seas caused Rogers to complain bitterly, and in a very interesting letter to his friend Sir Richard Steele, he regrets that several of his letters have fallen into the hands of the pirates. In it he also gives an amusing account of a lady whose fluency of speech caused him considerable annoyance. To the Honorable Sir Richard Steele, to be left at Bartram's Coffee House in Church Court 
opposite Hungerford Market in the Strand, London, via Carolina, Nassau, on New Providence, January 30, 1718 19. Sir, having writ to you by several former opportunities and not hearing from you, I have the greater cause to inveigh against the malice of the pirates who took Captain Smitter, lately come from London, from whom I have since heard that there were several letters directed to me and Mr. Beecham, which the pirates, after reading, tore. Every capture made by the pirates aggravates the apparent inclination of the commanders of our men of war, who, having openly avowed that the greater number of pirates makes their suitable advantage in trade, for the merchants of necessity are forced to send their effects in the king's bottoms when they from every part hear of the ravages committed by the pirates. There is no governor in these American parts who has not justly complained of this grand negligence, and I am in hopes the several representations will induce the Board of Admiralty to be more strict in their orders. There has not been one here almost these five months past, and, as if they wished us offered as a sacrifice both to the threatening Spaniards and pirates, I have not had influence enough to make our danger prevail with any of them to come to our assistance because of their greater occupations in trade. I, however, expect to be sufficiently provided, if the Spaniards, as believed, defer their coming till April. At my first arrival I received a formal visit from a woman called Pritchard, who by her voluble tongue and mentioning some of our first quality with some freedom, and withal, saying that she was known to you, Mr. Cardinal, and Sir William Sawin, next to whom she lived, near the Stories, Westminster, that I gave her a patient hearing. She dressed well and had charms enough to tempt the pirates, and, when she pleased, could assume an air of haughtiness which indeed she showed to me when I misdoubted her birth, education, or acquaintance with those noble men and others, whom she could without hesitation call over, and indeed some very particular private passages. She had often a loose way of speaking which made me conjecture she endeavored to win the hearts of her admirers to the pretender's interest, and made me grow weary of seeing her. This my indifference, and a little confinement, provoked her to depart hence for Jamaica, saying that she would take passage for England to do herself justice, and did not come abroad without money to support her. She talked much of Sir Ambrose Crawley and his son, from whom she intends to provide a good quantity of ironwork, and with a suitable cargo of other goods she says she will soon make another turn this way, and seldom serious in her talk. I thought fit to say thus much of a woman who pretends to such a general knowledge of men, particularly of you and Mr. Addison. If our carpenters had not otherwise been employed, and I could have spared them, I should have been glad to have made her first lady of the stool. She went hence, as I thought, with resentments enough, but I have heard since from Jamaica that she has not only forgot her passion, but sent her friendly service to me, and as I expect she now is on her way home, designs to do me all the good offices that she can with all the numerous gentlemen of her acquaintance. But I can't believe it, and I beg, if you see her soliciting in my behalf, be pleased to let her know I don't expect her company here, and she can't oblige me more than to let me in my character alone. Captain Whitney, commander of His Majesty's ship the Rose, man of war, being one of the three that saw me into this place, and left me in an utmost danger so long ago, he also pretends to a knowledge of you and several of my friends in London, but he has behaved so ill that I design to forget him as much as I can. And if he is acquainted with you and sees you in London before me, I desire he might know his character from the several accounts I have sent hence, which, with what goes from other ports, may serve to convince all his friends that he is not the man that he may have appeared to be at home. I hope Mrs. Kerr and Roach, who I sent hence, has been often with you, and that this will keep your hands in perfect health, and that you have thrown away your great cane and can dance a minuet, and will honor me with the continuance of your friendship, for I am, good sir, your most sincere, humble servant, Woods Rogers. Be pleased to excuse my writing to you in such a hurry as oblige me to write this letter in two different hands. My humble service to Mr. Addison and Mr. Sansom. This comes enclosed to Mr. G., with whom I hope you will be acquainted. W.R. In his subsequent letter, he writes regretting that His Majesty's ships of war had so little regard for this infant colony, and he certainly had just cause to complain. His statement about the Admiralty, 
and the representations of other colonial governors, is borne out by the following letter from the Governor of South Carolina, written on the 4th of November, 1718. "'Tis not long since I did myself the honor to write to you from this place, South Carolina, which I hope you'll receive. But having fresh occasion grounded upon advice received by a brig, since that arrived from Providence, I thought it my duty, after having so far engaged myself in that settlement once more, to offer you my opinion concerning it. My last, if I forget not, gave you account of the mortality that had been amongst the soldiers and others that came over with Governor Rogers, and the ill state of that place both in regard to pirates and Spaniards, unless speedily supported by a greater force than are yet upon the place. And especially the necessity that there is of cruising ships and snows and sloops of war to be stationed there, without which I do assure you, it will at any time be in the power of either pirates or Spaniards at their pleasure to make themselves master of the island, or at least to prevent provisions or other necessaries being carried to it from the main, and without that it's not possible for the king's garrison or inhabitants to subsist. The pirates yet accounted to be out are near 2,000 men, and those of Vane, Thaitch, and others promised themselves to be repossessed of Providence in a short time. How the loss of that place may affect the ministry, I cannot tell, but the consequence of it seems to be not only a general destruction of the trade to the West Indies and the main of America, but the settling and establishing a nest of pirates who already esteem themselves a community and to have one common interest. And indeed, they may in time become so and make that island another sally, but much more formidable unless speedy care be taken to subdue them. I should humbly propose that two ships of 24 or 30 guns and two sloops of 10 or 12 guns should be stationed there, one ship and sloop to be always in harbor as guard. In these days of rapid transit and wireless communications, it is difficult to realize what this isolation meant to a colonial governor with the perpetual menace of the enemy within his gates and the risk of invasion from outside. The existence of the settlement depended entirely on his initiative and resource, and at times the suspense and despair in these far-flung outposts of empire must have been terrible in the extreme. The difficulties which Rogers had to contend with are vividly shown in the following letter from him to the Lord's Commissioners of Trade. Nassau on Providence, May 29, 1719 My Lords, we have never been free from apprehension of danger from pirates and Spaniards, and I can only impute these causes to the want of a stationed ship of war till we really can be strong enough to defend ourselves. I hope your lordships will pardon my troubling you, but a few instances of those people I have to govern who, though they expect the enemy that has surprised them these fifteen years thirty-four times, yet these wretches can't be kept to watch at night, and when they do come, they come very seldom sober and rarely awake all night, though our officers or soldiers very often surprise their guard and carry off their arms, and I punish, fine, or confine them almost every day. Then for work, they mortally hate it, for when they have cleared a patch that will supply them with potatoes and yams and very little else, fish being so plentiful, they thus live, poorly and indolently, with a seeming content and pray for wrecks or pirates. And few of them have any opinion of a regular orderly life under any sort of government, and would rather spend all they have at a punch house than pay me one-tenth to save their families and all that's dear to them. Had I not took another method of eating, drinking, and working with them myself, officers, soldiers, sailors, and passengers, and watch at the same time whilst they were drunk and drowsy, I could never have got the fort in any posture of defense neither would they have willingly kept themselves or me from the pirates if the expectation of a war with Spain had not been perpetually kept up. It was as bad as treason is in England to declare our design of fortifying was to keep out the pirates if they were willing to come in and say they would be honest and live under government as we called it even then. I ask your lordship's pardon if I am too prolix, but the anxiety I'm in, and it being my duty to inform your honorable board as fully as I can, I hope will plead for me till I can be more concise. I am, with the utmost ambition and zeal, your lordship's most obedient and most humble servant, Woods Rogers. 
An interesting sidelight on the Spanish attack, which Rogers mentioned in his letter to Steele, is to be found among the Treasury papers in the form of a claim for provisions supplied to Woods Rogers, Captain General, Governor, and Vice Admiral of the Bahama Islands, during the invasion from the Spaniards against the island of Providence, when the inhabitants and others of that place were forced to continue under arms for a considerable time, and the governor was obliged to be at an extraordinary charge to support near 500 men, exclusive of His Majesty's garrison. Though he had been sent out to the Bahamas as the representative of the crown, his position was more like that of a shipwrecked mariner, so completely was he cut off from the outside world. On the 20th of November, 1720, the council wrote to the Secretary of State the following letter, which reveals an amazing situation. Governor Rogers, having received no letter from you dated since July, 1719, and none from the Board of Trade since his arrival, gives him and us great uneasiness, lest this poor colony should be no more accounted as part of His Britannic Majesty's dominions. The intolerable position thus created, and the utter impossibility of getting either help or guidance from the home government, at last forced Rogers to return. The strain of the last two years had told severely on his health, and he decided to make the journey to England and personally plead the cause of the colony. In a letter written on the eve of his departure, dated from Nassau, 25th of February, 1720, 21, he writes, It is impossible that I can subsist here any longer on the foot I have been left ever since my arrival. He had been left, he stated, with a few sick men to encounter 500 of the pirates, and that he had no support in men, supplies, or warships. He had also contracted large debts through having to purchase clothing and supplies at extravagant rates. This place, he wrote, so secured by my industry, indefatigable pains, and the forfeiture of my health, has since been sold for 40,000 pounds and myself by a manager at home and co-partners factotum here. All the unworthy usage a man can have, he added, has been given me and all the expenses designed to be thrown on me. Leaving the government of the island in the hands of Mr. Fairfax, he left for England carrying with him a remarkable memorial drawn up and signed by the council, principal inhabitants, and traders of the Bahama Islands, dated 21 March 1720-21, setting forth the services he had rendered to the colony. In this document they expressed the belief that too many of these neglects of and misfortunes attending us are owing to the want of a power to call an assembly, and that the colony, being in the hands of proprietors and co-partners, who we are sensible, have it not in their power to support and defend their settlements in such a manner as is necessary more especially in young colonies. And this place being left on so uncertain a foundation and so long abandoned has discouraged all men of substance coming to us. We hope, they added, His Majesty and the wisdom of the nation will not suffer this colony to be any longer so neglected and lost to the crown, as it inevitably must, and will be soon abandoned to the pirates if effectual care is not taken without any farther loss of time. We thought it a duty incumbent upon us, as well as to the country, as to His Excellency the Governor and His Majesty's garrison here, to put these things in a full and true alight, that we might, as much as in us lies, do our Governor justice, and prevent any farther ungrateful usage being offered him at home, to frustrate his good endeavors when, please God, he arrives there, for the service of his country to preserve this settlement. For next to the divine protection it is owing to him, who has acted amongst us without the least regard for his private advantage or separate interest in a scene of continual fatigues and hardships. These motives led us to offer the truth under our hands of the almost insurmountable difficulty that he and this colony has struggled with for the space of two years and eight months past. With these assurances of goodwill and support, Rogers left for England calling en route at South Carolina where he ordered provisions to be dispatched to New Providence sufficient to last the company till Christmas. During the second week in August, he landed at Bristol and then proceeded to London. On arrival in London, Rogers met with as many difficulties as he had encountered in the colony, and he does not appear to have succeeded to any extent in the objects of his mission. That he strongly objected to return for a further tenure of office under the same conditions is apparent, and in the same year, George Finney was appointed to succeed him as governor. 
Within two months of his arrival in England, he addressed a petition to the Lords of the Treasury setting forth his services and impoverished condition, stating that in preserving the islands from destruction by the Spaniards, or from again being possessed by the pirates, he had dispersed his whole fortune and credit and stood engaged for large sums. He prayed that he might be granted an allowance of victualling for the last three years. Those who have had occasion to search into the records of the 18th century know the difficulties which confront the searcher, especially in writing for the first time the life of a man like Woods Rogers. There must inevitably be some missing links in the biographical chain, and such a missing link occurs in the years immediately following his return to England. For some reason or other, he seems to have been in bad odor with the government, possibly on account of his pugnacity and outspoken nature, and there is no record of his petition being answered. On slender authority, he is said to have gone in 1724 in the Delicia of 40 guns to Madagascar for the purpose of buying slaves for the Dutch colony at Batavia, during which voyage he narrowly escaped captured by the pirates who settled there from the Bahamas. This, however, seems an unlikely procedure for a man of Roger's attainments, and the story is not corroborated by any authoritative source. The next mention of Rogers occurs in connection with the operations against Spain. In March 1726, Vice Admiral Hosier was appointed to command a squadron which was dispatched to the West Indies for the purpose of intercepting the Spanish treasure ships lying at Portobello. On hearing of Hosier's expedition and its object, the ships were dismantled and the treasure sent back to Panama. Hosier, however, in spite of a virulent epidemic among the crew of his ships, kept up a strict blockade of Portobello. In the spring and summer of 1727, while his ships were blockading Havana and Veracruz, the epidemic continued, and Hosier himself fell a victim to the disease, dying at Jamaica on the 25th of August. The government did all in their power to prevent the Spanish treasure ships reaching Europe, and Rogers, who was in London at the time, was consulted by the government as the probable means and route the Spaniards would adopt to get their treasure home. The situation was rendered more difficult by a dispatch from William Cayley, our consul at Cadiz, informing the government of the sailing of a squadron from Cadiz to assist in bringing the treasure home. From past experience, Rogers probably knew more than any other person then in England of the difficulties of the voyage, and the report which he delivered in conjunction with Jonathan Dennis to Lord Townsend, the Secretary of State, is of considerable interest and is now printed for the first time. My Lord, according to what your Lordship was pleased to command us, we have considered the account given by Mr. Cayley from Cadiz to His Grace the Duke of Newcastle of three men of war and a ship of ten guns being sent under the command of Admiral Castaneda from that port in the month of May last, with cannon and land forces which, your Lordship apprehends, may be ordered round Cape Horn in order to bring to Spain the bullion now detained at Panama, and we give it your Lordship as our opinion that it is not only improbable, but almost impracticable for the following reasons. First, because of the time of year in which those ships sailed from Cadiz, which is at least three months too soon to attempt getting round Cape Horn or through the Straits of Magellan, especially if the nature of the ships be considered, and they're being deeply laden and having cannon and land forces on board. Secondly, because there can be no need of cannon in Peru or Chile, those provinces abounding in metal for casting them, and the Spaniards being able to do it, as they have always done, cheaper and full as well as in Spain, as to the soldiers, the transporting them that way seems altogether improbable, because of the many better methods there are of doing it. Thirdly, my lord, as the bullion is now at or near Panama, the embarking it thence to Lima, and so to be brought round Cape Horn, will require so prodigious an expense both of time and money, that renders the doing of it extremely improbable. Tis true, my lord, were the money now at Potosi, or Lima, t'would be easy enough to bring it round Cape Horn, or rather overland to Buenos Aires, where Castaneda might be gone to receive it, but as it is not, the bringing of it from Panama to Lima will require too long a time because of the difficulty of the navigation from a former to the latter place being against both winds and currents so that the Spanish ships are commonly from six to eight or ten months performing the voyage and though the French formerly often came with their money round the Cape to France yet your lordship will consider their tract of trade was never to leeward 
or to the northward of the coast of Peru, by which means the greatest fatigue of the voyage was avoided. But, my lord, what seems to us the most likely is that Castaneda, after refreshing at the Havana, may go to La Veracruz and there wait for the bullion from Panama, from whence it may be sent to La Veracruz under notion of it being reshipped for Peru, and so bring it to Havana there to join in the flota, and so come for Spain or send it home in running ships. And our reason for this suggestion is not only for the above difficulties that must and will attend bringing the bullion now at Panama to Spain round Cape Horn, or by the way of Buenos Aires, but because of the facility and dispatch with which it may be transported from Panama to Acapulco, and so by land to La Veracruz, which is what has been often practiced by the Spaniards, even when there was no blockade at Portobello, nor fear of enemies, as a conveniency for Spain is offered, for the navigation from Panama to Acapulco is very safe and easy, and the carriage from thence to La Vera Cruz is neither so difficult nor expensive as that between Lima and Buenos Aires. This, my lord, is what occurs to us worthy your lordship's notice. We are with the uttermost respect and submission, my lord, your lordship's most devoted and most obedient humble servants, Woods Rogers, Jonathan Dennis, Right Honorable Lord Townsend, London, 10, of November, 1726. In the meanwhile, things were going from bad to worse in the Bahamas. Finney, Roger's successor, had failed in his efforts to bring about a stable form of government, and he appears to have been without the commanding and organizing abilities of his predecessor. At the beginning of 1726, he wrote complaining of the difficulties of government, stating that he had been unable to get sufficient of his council together to form a quorum, and that many of them were very illiterate. Finney himself was not above reproach. It was reported that he and his wife had grossly abused their office. The governor's wife and her husband monopolized all the trade so that the inhabitants could not have any provisions without paying her own exorbitant prices, and it was reported that she sold rum by the pint and biscuits by the half real. Added to this, she had frequently browbeated juries and insulted even the justice on the bench, while Fenny himself was stated to have dismantled the fort and sold the iron for his own benefit. If half the misdemeanors attributed to Fenny and his wife are true, it is not to be wondered at that his recall was demanded by the principal inhabitants, and that a strong desire was shown by the council and others to have Rogers reinstated, as the following petition and its annexed paper dated 28 February, 1727-28 clearly shows. To the King's Most Excellent Majesty, the humble petition of Captain Woods Rogers, late Governor of the Bahama Islands in America and Captain of the Independent Company there. Shuwith. The petitioner had the honor to be employed by your royal father to drive the pirates from the Bahama Islands, and he succeeded therein. He afterwards established a settlement and defended it against an attack of the Spaniards, on your majesty's happy accession, he humbly represented the state of his great losses and sufferings in this service, praying that you would be graciously pleased to grant him such compensation for the same as might enable him to exert himself more effectually in your majesty's services, having nothing more than the subsistence of half pay as Captain Afoot given him on a report of the Board of General Officers, appointed to inquire into his conduct, who farther recommended him to his late majesty's bounty and favor. The petitioner, not having the happiness to know your royal pleasure, humbly begs leave to represent that the Bahama Islands are of very great importance to the commerce of these kingdoms, as it is well known to all concerned in the American trade, and the weak condition they now are in renders them an easy prey to the Spaniards if a rupture should happen, but if effectually secured they will soon contribute very much to distress any power which may attempt to molest the British dominions or trade in the West Indies. Your petitioner therefore humbly prays that your most sacred majesty will be graciously pleased to restore him to his former station of governor and captain of an independent company of these islands, in which he hopes to give farther proofs of zeal for your majesty's service. Or if it is your royal pleasure his successor be continued there, he most humbly relies that through your great compassion and bounty he shall receive such a consideration for his past sufferings and present half pay as will enable him to be usefully employed for your majesty's and his country's advantage, and in some measure retrieve his losses that he may support himself and family, 
who for above seven years past have suffered very much by means of this employment wholly for the public service. And your majesty's petitioner, as in duty bound, shall ever pray, etc. At the same time, a petition bearing 29 influential names, among who was Sir Hans Sloan, Samuel Shute, ex-governor of Massachusetts, Alexander Spotswood, deputy governor of Virginia, Benjamin Bennett, ex-governor of Bermuda, and Lord Montague was sent to Sir Robert Walpole in favor of Rogers, stating, We never heard any complaint against his conduct and his duty there, nor that he behaved otherwise in that employ than with the utmost resolution and fidelity, becoming a good subject, though to the ruin of his own fortune. It is evident from this petition that at the time the government were considering the question of the Bahamas and the policy to be pursued there. The influential support which Rogers had received and the general desire shown by the colonists for his return were factors which could not be ignored in the situation. By the end of the year it was decided to recall Finney and send Rogers out for a second tenure of office. His commission, drawn up in December 1728, gave him, among other things, power and authority to summon and call general assemblies of the said freeholders and planters in our islands under your government, which assembly shall consist of 24 persons to be chosen by a majority of the inhabitants, instead of the previously nominated council. As captain general and governor-in-chief, he was to receive a salary of 400 pounds a year. Just prior to sailing, he had a family picture painted by Hogarth, which represents him with his son and daughter, outside the fort at Nassau. On the wall is a shield with the motto, Dum Spiro Spero. In the early summer of 1729, Rogers, with his son and daughter, sailed for New Providence, and among other things, it is interesting to note that he took with him two little flagons, one chalice, one patent, and a receiver to take the offerings for the use of His Majesty's Chapel there, the building of which had commenced a few years earlier. One of his first duties on arrival was to proceed with the election of an assembly, which met on the 30th of September in that year. In its first session, no less than 12 acts were passed, which it was judged would be beneficial to the welfare of the colony, and efforts were made to encourage the planting of cotton and the raising of sugar canes. Praiseworthy as these endeavors were, they were fraught with considerable difficulties. The settlers, which it was hoped to attract from the other islands in the West Indies and from the American colonies, were not forthcoming in sufficient numbers, principally owing to the poverty of the colony. In the October of 1730, Rogers wrote, I found the place so very poor and thin of inhabitants that I never mentioned any salary to them for myself or anyone else, and the fees annexed to all offices and places here being the lowest of any part in America, no one can support himself thereon without some other employment. Nevertheless, the spiritual needs of the colony, as we have seen, were not neglected, and Rogers says that they were in great want of a chaplain, and that the whole colony had requested him to get an orthodox divine as soon as possible. To add to his other embarrassments, Rogers had considerable difficulty with the members of his assembly, and the opposition led by the speaker, did all in their power to wreck the various schemes that were brought before them. In a letter to the Lord Commissioners of Trade, dated February 10, 1730-31, he mentions an incident which caused him to dissolve the house. During the sessions of the last assembly, I endeavored, pursuant to His Majesty's instructions, to recommend to them the state and condition of the fortifications, which must wanted all the assistance possible for their repair to which I did not find the major part of the assembly averse at first, but since they have been diverted from their good intentions by the insinuations of one Mr. Colebrook, their speaker, who imposed so long on their ignorance that I was obliged to dissolve them, lest his behavior might influence them to fall into schemes yet more contrary to the good of the colony and their own safety. Another assembly is lately elected, and I still find the effects of the above Mr. Colebrook's influence on the most ignorant of them, who are the majority. He added that the present ill state of his health, which has been lately much impaired, obliges me to have recourse to His Majesty's permission of going to South Carolina for a change of air, from which I hope to return in three weeks or a month. The growth of constitutional government in the colony and the molding of the powers and procedure of the legislature on similar lines to the home government 
are vividly brought out in the official reply to Rogers' dispatch. This reply is dated 29th of June, 1731, and it is evident from the tone of it that they realized the difficulties which he had to contend with. It would be proper, they wrote, that the proceedings of the Assembly also should resemble those of the Parliament of Great Britain, so far as the circumstances of the colony and your instructions will permit. It would be a pretty difficult task to lay down a plan for the proceedings of your Assembly in future times, but in general we may observe to you that the Constitution of England owes its preservation very much to the maintaining of an equal balance between the branches of the legislature, and that the more distinct they are kept from each other, the likelier they will be to agree, and the longer they will be likely to last. Up till this date the Crown had only taken over the civil and military jurisdiction of the colony, and the retention of the lands by the proprietors and lessees of the islands undoubtedly hampered their economic progress and well-being. Finally, in response to a suggestion from the Crown, the proprietors in a letter of April 11, 1730, offered to sell out their rights for 1,000 guineas each, clear of all fees, and Rogers, in a letter to the Board of Trade, emphasized the necessity of the Crown taking this step and so bringing to an end the discouraging contest on titles to land. By an irony of fate, Rogers was not spared to see this suggestion carried into effect. Though his efforts on behalf of the colony had undermined his health, he did not spare himself or shrink from his responsibility. How great that responsibility was, and how we overcame a widespread conspiracy by Colebrook to overthrow his government, is shown in the following letter to the Board of Trade, written from Nassau on the 10th of June, 1731. How great an enemy Mr. Colebrook hath been to this government, and what vile means he used to make the garrison mutiny, and stir up a spirit of discontent and opposition in the inhabitants, by the great influence which he had artfully gained over the most ignorant of them, while he was Speaker of the Assembly, from all which I humbly hope that the method taken to prevent his proceeding in his seditious and wicked designs will meet with His Majesty's and Your Lordship's approbation. The method taken was the arrest and indictment of John Colebrook for sedition. He was tried before the Chief Justice of the Bahamas at the end of May and found guilty. A fine of 750 pounds was imposed, and he was ordered to be confined during His Majesty's pleasure, and was not to be discharged until he had given sufficient security for his future good behavior. The influence that such a person could wield over an ignorant community 200 years ago is strangely reminiscent of the 20th century. In spite of Colebrook's detention, the danger was not yet over, and the canker of sedition seems to have been very deeply rooted. Two months later, in August 1731, Rogers thus reports on the situation. I can yet procure no assistance from the inhabitants towards the fortifications, though I have, without any help from them, built a new barrack for the garrison in the fort, and have made upwards of twenty new carriages for guns of this country timber, and shall continue to do all I can towards the fortifications as soon as the heat of the summer is over, that I can put the garrison to work again without endangering their health and as soon as possible will try in a new assembly what I can do, though I fear little public good is to be expected from them if Mr. Colebrook and his accomplices here can have any influence to prevent the people's working, they being too poor to contribute anything worth contributing in money. At what period Colebrook was released we do not know, but that he appealed to the home government is certain, and in order that the Lord's Commissioners of Trade should have all the facts at their disposal, Rogers dispatched his son to England with the following letter, dated 14 October, 1731. As I am at a loss what complaints Mr. Colebrook may make, I entreat your lordships will please to allow me to refer you to my son, who will have the honor to wait on your lordships with this, and is instructed to give you such particular information as you may desire to be apprised of, either with regard to Mr. Colebrook or anything else related to this colony. I have also transmitted herewith transcripts of the Council and Assembly proceedings, and answer to your Lordship's queries, together with an account of every family on this island in as particular a manner as possible. I hope soon to visit Columbia, alias Cat Island, which being esteemed the most fertile of any in this government, I shall transmit to your Lordship's a particular account thereof. This was his last official dispatch of any importance. 
and his death is recorded at Nassau on the 15th of July, 1732. His will, drawn up on the eve of departure from England and dated 26th of May, 1729, was proved in London on the 24th of November, 1732. In it, he bequeaths his property to his son, William Whetstone Rogers, and his daughter, Sarah Rogers. The probate act describes him as late of the parish of St. Margaret, Westminster, but dying at the Bahama Islands, a widower. And so, amid the tropical grandeur of his island home, with the surge of the broad Atlantic for his requiem, passed all that was mortal of Woods Rogers. No tombstone stands to mark his last resting place, but somewhere in Nassau we may be sure that his spirit looks out past the great statue of Columbus, standing sentinel over Government House to the shipping and harbor beyond. One wonders how many of the thousands of visitors who bask in the perpetual sunshine of a winter's day in this queen of coral isles realize how much they owe to Woods Rogers and his successors. A great seaman and splendid patriot, he deserves well of his country. May this reprint of his cruising voyage be a fitting tribute to his memory. This edition of Woods Rogers' Cruising Voyage Round the World is printed from the original and scarce edition of 1712. In the introduction, I have attempted to tell the full story of the author's life from the original documents in the Public Record Office and the British Museum. For the facilities offered me at both these institutions, and also at the London Library, I beg to tender my sincere thanks. I have also to acknowledge my indebtedness to Mr. A. G. H. McPherson for his kindness in allowing me to reproduce three illustrations from his unique collection of naval prints, and to the facilities at the National Portrait Gallery for their courtesy in granting me permission to reproduce the beautiful portrait of Captain William Dampier. Finally, I have to thank Dr. Philip Goss, whose enthusiasm for Woods Rogers spurred me to complete this edition of one of the most interesting voyages in the English language. G. E. Manwaring. The Dedication To the worthy gentlemen, my surviving owners, the worshipful Christopher Shooter, Esquire, Sir John Hawkins, Knight, John Romsey, Esquire, Captain Philip Freak, Mr. James Hollidge, Francis Rogers, Thomas Goldney, Thomas Clements, Thomas Coots, John Corsley, John Duckenfield, Richard Hawksworth, William Saunders, John Grant, Lawrence Hollister, and Daniel Hickman, Merchants in Bristol. Gentlemen, as you did me the honor to approve my proposals for the following voyage, and generously fitted out two ships in which you gave me the principal command, I no sooner resolved to publish my journal than I determined to choose you for my patrons, and thereby to take an opportunity of expressing my gratitude to you who had the courage to adventure your estates on an undertaking which, to men less discerning, seemed impracticable. I heartily congratulate you on the success and profit of this long and hazardous voyage, which might have been greater, but the following sheets will show it was not my fault. I shall only add on this head that I used my utmost endeavors to promote your interest, which was always preferred to my own. I make no doubt it will be to your lasting honor that such a voyage was undertaken from Bristol at your expense, since it has given the public a sufficient evidence of what may be done in those parts, and since the wisdom of the nation has now agreed to establish a trade to the South Seas, which, with the blessing of God, may bring vast riches to Great Britain. I wish you entire health and happiness, and am, gentlemen, your most humble servant, Woods Rogers. End of Section 2 Section 3 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by K. Hand. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. Ireland to Caribbean. Begun August 1, 1708, and finished October 14, 1711. By Captain Woods Rogers, Commander in Chief. Though others who give an account of their voyages do generally attempt to imitate the style and method which is used by authors that write ashore, I rather choose to keep to the language of the sea, which is more genuine and natural for a mariner. And because voyages of this sort have commonly miscarried, tis necessary that I should keep to my original journal, that the methods we took to succeed in our designs may appear from time to time in their native light. Therefore, without any disguise, I shall publish the copies of all our material regulations and agreements, and keep to the usual method of sea journals, omitting nothing that happened remarkable to ourselves, or that may serve for information or improvement to others in the like cases. Every day's transactions begin at the foregoing day, about twelve o'clock, and end at the same hour the following day, carrying that date. Since custom has likewise prevailed for sailors to give an account of such countries upon whose coasts they touch or pass by, I shall so far comply with it as to give a description of those that occurred in the course of my navigation, especially of such as are or may be of most use for enlarging our trade, wherein I have consulted the best authors upon the subject and the manuscript journals of others as well as informed myself by inquiry upon the spot, and from those that have been in the respective countries I treat of. 1708, August 2nd. Yesterday, about four in the afternoon, we weighed from King Road near Bristol, on board the Duke Frigate, whereof Captain Woods Rogers was commander, in consortship with the Duchess, Captain Stephen Courtney, commander, both private men of war, bound to Cork in Ireland, and thence to the southward a cruising. The Duke burden about 320 tons, having 30 guns and 117 men, and the Duchess burden about 260 tons by measure, 26 guns and 108 men, both well furnished with all necessaries on board for a distant undertaking. We had in company the Scipio, Peterborough Frigate, Prince Eugene, Bristol Galley, Berkeley Galley, Beecher Galley, Pompey Galley, Sherstone Galley, and Diamond Sloop. At ten at night, having little wind, we made the signal for the fleet to anchor between the Holmes and Minehead. We lay near two hours, and about twelve we fired a gun, and all came to sail, a fine gale at southeast and east southeast. We ran by Minehead at six in the morning, having stemmed the flood from the place we anchored at. We came up with a sloop about ten o'clock, but she could not hold way with the fleet, being all light and clean ships and good sailors. August 3rd. The wind veered to the northeast and east-northeast. Our ship and the Duchess did not sail so well as the major part of the galleys, our masts and rigging being all unfit for the sea, our ships out of trim, and everything in disorder, being very indifferently manned. Notwithstanding our number, we had not twenty sailors in the ship, and it's very little better on board the Duchess, which is a discouragement, only we hope to get some good sailors at Cork. We saw a sail at five last night, the Duchess gave chase, and came near her. She seemed a large ship, but we lost sight of her at eight o'clock. Being informed at Bristol that the Jersey, a French man of war carrying forty-six guns, was cruising betwixt England and Ireland, it obliged us to keep our hammocks up and a clear ship for a fight all night. About two this morning the rest of the fleet that lay astern of us came up, and we kept an easy sail, with a light out all night. But when day came we saw nothing, so that this proved a false alarm, which happened well for us, since had it been real we should have made but an indifferent fight for want of being better manned. August 4th. The Bristol Galley, Berkeley Galley, Prince Eugene, and the Beecher Galley, being bound to the westward, left us at six in the evening. Little wind at east-southeast and smooth water. August 5th. We saw the land, and finding we had overshot our port, came to an anchor at twelve o'clock off of the two rocks called the Sovereign Bollocks, near Kinsale, being calm. August 6th. At about eight last night we weighed with the flood, a small gale at east. 
it came on to blow and veered to the northward we had a kinsale pilot on board who was like to have endangered our ship it being dark and foggy before day he would have turned us into the next bay to the westward of cork had i not prevented it which provoked me to chastise him for undertaking to pilot a ship since he understood his business no better the rest of our company except the diamond and sure stone galley got into cork before us only our consort stayed in the harbor's mouth till we came up with her august seventh yesterday at three in the afternoon we came to an anchor with our consort in the cove wind at north northeast august eighth came in the arundel a queen's ship and ordered us to strike our pendant which we immediately did all private commission ships being obliged by their instructions to pay that respect to all her majesty's ships and fortifications august ninth yesterday afternoon came in the hastings with the fleet under her convoy which we left in king road as also the elizabeth a merchant ship of five hundred tons about twenty-six guns and well manned with a fleet under her convoy from liverpool bound to the westward with us and the hastings etc fair weather the wind southerly august tenth we were well pleased with the men mr noblet rogers got for us at cork upon which we cleared several of those brought from bristol and some of em run away being ordinary fellows and not fit for our employment august eleventh it blowed fresh and dirty weather we had four lighters from cork to discharge our ships that we might have them well stowed and the provisions in the bottom when they came aboard us we lengthened our mizzenmast four foot and a half by placing it on a step on the gun deck got our foremast forward and did what we could in order to be in a better trim than before against we had better men to work the ship who lay all ready to come aboard from cork august twelfth blew fresh and dirty weather we cleared and run near forty of our fresh-water sailors the shoreham captain saunders came hither to convoy a fleet back to bristol august sixteenth continued dirty weather so that we could not have an opportunity to heal our ship and clean her bottom and were forced to keep our provisions covered in the lighter and men to watch em this morning about ten one boat loaded with men came down from cork to us the fellows appeared to be brisk but of several nations and i sent to mr rogers to stop the rest till we were ready our ships being pestered august twenty ninth nothing happened worth notice since the sixteenth but that we had good weather to clean and tallow our ships five streaks below the water-line and to take in our provisions and men etc this morning we fell down to the spit end by the hastings man of war as our consort did the night before when i came without the spit end i saluted the hastings with seven guns they returned five and i three for thanks we had now above double the number of officers usual in privateers and a large complement of men to each ship we took this method of doubling our officers to prevent mutinies which often happen in long voyages and that we might have a large provision for a succession of officers in each ship in case of mortality our ship was now so full that we sent our sheet cable and the other new store cordage to mr noblet rogers at cork to make room for our men and provisions having three cables besides and being willing rather to spare that than anything else we had aboard our crew were continually marrying whilst we stayed at cork though they expected to sail immediately among others there was a dane coupled by a romish priest to an irish woman without understanding a word of each other's language so that they were forced to use an interpreter yet i perceived this pair seemed more afflicted at separation than any of the rest the fellow continued melancholy for several days after we were at sea the rest understanding each other drank their cans of flip till the last minute concluded with a health to our good voyage and their happy meeting and then parted unconcerned i think it necessary to set down here the names of all the officers in both ships with the number of our men because it is proper that the persons whom this journal concerns should be known officers of the duke woods rogers captain a mariner thomas dover a doctor of physic second captain president of our council and captain of the marines carlton van brew merchant now our owner's agent robert fry a mariner chief lieutenant charles pope second lieutenant thomas glendall third lieutenant john bridge master william dampier
pilot for the South Seas, who had been already three times there and twice round the world. Alexander Vaughan, chief mate. Lance Appleby, second mate. John Ballet, rated third mate, but designed surgeon if occasion. He had been Captain Dampier's doctor in his last unfortunate voyage round the world. Samuel Hopkins, being Dr. Dover's kinsman and an apothecary, was both an assistant to him and to act as his lieutenant if we landed a party anywhere under his command during the voyage. George Underhill and John Parker, two young lawyers designed to act as midshipmen. John Vigor, a reformado, to act as Captain Dover's ensign when ashore. Benjamin Parsons and Howell Nethel, midshipmen. Richard Edwards, coxswain of the pinnace, to receive midshipmen's pay. James Wassa, surgeon. Charles May, his mate. John Lancy, assistant. Henry Oliphant, gunner, with eight men called the gunner's crew. Nathaniel Scorch, carpenter. John Jones, his mate, with three assistants. Giles Cash, boatswain, and John Pillar, his mate. John Shepherd, cooper, with two assistants. John Johnson, Thomas Young, Charles Clovet, and John Bowden, all four quartermasters. John Finch, late wholesale oilman of London, now ship's steward. Henry Newkirk, sailmaker. Peter Vandenhend, smith and armorer. William Hopkins, ship's corporal. Captain Dover's sergeant, and cook to the officers. Bartholomew Burns, ship's cook. Officers of the Duchess. Stephen Courtney, Captain, a mariner. Edward Cook, second captain. William Stretton, chief lieutenant. John Rogers, second lieutenant. John Connolly, third lieutenant. William Bath, owner's agent. George Milburn, master. Robert Nolman, chief mate. Henry Duck, second. Simon Hatley, third. James Goodall, fourth. And William Page, fifth mate with all other inferior officers much the same as aboard the duke most of us the chief officers embraced this trip of privateering round the world to retrieve the losses we had sustained by the enemy our complement of sailors in both ships was three hundred thirty three of which above one-third were foreigners from most nations several of her majesty's subjects on board were tinkerers tailors haymakers peddlers fiddlers etc one negro and about ten boys with this mixed gang we hoped to be well manned as soon as they had learnt the use of arms and got their sea legs which we doubted not soon to teach them and bring them to discipline september first we took sailing orders the better to keep company with the hastings and fleet and having agreed with our consort captain courtney on signals between us which are so common that i need not insert them here and appointed places of rendezvous in case of separation and how long to lie for each other at every place about ten this morning we came to sail with the hastings and about twenty merchant ships bound to the southward and westward wind at north by west we should have sailed yesterday but could not weigh and cast our ships clear of the rest some at that time drove and the sure stone galley run quite ashore on this bit in the night it drew moderate weather and captain paul got her off to sail with us our holds are full of provisions, our cables, a great deal of bread and water casks between decks, and 183 men aboard the Duke, with 151 aboard the Duchess, so that we are very much crowded and pestered ships, not fit to engage an enemy without throwing provision and stores overboard. September 2nd. We and our consort stood out of the fleet to chase a sail we saw to windward our ships sailed as well as any in the fleet not excepting the man-of-war so that we began to hope we should find our heels since we go so well though deep loaden and pestered we found the chase to be a small vessel coming into the fleet from baltimore one hunt master called the hope galley a small french-built snow belonging to mr james vaughan of bristol bound for jamaica wind at north by west moderate weather september third the wind, very veerable from the west-southwest to the northwest, blowed strong with squalls, so that we reefed often, and our ship was a little leaky in her upper works. September 4th. It blew fresh this morning, but not so much wind as yesterday, and the water smoother. Captain Paul made a signal for me, Captain Courtney and Captain Edwards, commander of the Scipio, and, after speaking with him, he sent his boat for us, being larger than ours. 
we with captain dover and mr vanbrugh went in with her and dined with captain paul aboard his ship where we were very handsomely treated he proposed to me and consort when he left the fleet which would be very soon to cruise a few days together off cape finister after having asked us what we wanted that he could supply us with he gave us scrubbers iron scrapers for our ship's bottom a speaking trumpet and other things that we wanted but he would accept nothing from us because our voyage would be long but told us he should be well pleased if our owners returned him the same necessaries for his ship when he returned wind from the north northwest to the northwest by west moderate september fifth we came from on board captain paul to our own ships yesterday at six in the afternoon and now thought it fit to discover to our crew whither we were bound that if any disorder should have risen upon it we might have exchanged our malcontents whilst in company with one of her majesty's ships but i found no complaint on board the duke except from one fellow who expected to have been tithing man that year in his parish and said his wife would be obliged to pay forty shillings in his absence but seeing all the rest willing he was easily quieted and all hands drank to a good voyage i and captain courtney writ to our owners alderman bachelor and company in the same letter a method we designed to continue in the whole voyage for all the things that related to it a brisk gale and clear weather september sixth the hastings and we parted at six last night the reason why we did not keep him longer company was our ships being very full and our consort unwilling to lose time so near home so that we were obliged to break measures with captain paul i excused it to him and saluted him which he answered and wished us a prosperous undertaking winds north by west and clear weather our ship does not sail so well as she did two days before the crown galley of biddeford keeps us company bound for the madeiras wind from north to northwest to north by east september eighth everything now begins to come into order we having been hitherto in some confusion as is usual in privateers at first setting out we had a good observation moderate weather wind at west northwest latitude forty degrees ten minutes north this day the chief officers dined on board me and the next day on board the duchess september ninth now we begin to consider the length of our voyage and the many different climates we must pass and the excessive cold which we cannot avoid going about cape horn at the same time we had but a slender stock of liquor and our men but meanly clad yet good liquor to sailors is preferable to clothing upon this we held our first committee to debate whether it was necessary for us to stop at madeira as follows at a committee held on board the duke frigate resolved by the general consent of the following persons that both the ships duke and duchess do touch at madeira to make a larger provision of liquors the better to carry on our long undertaking being but meanly stored for so large a number of men as are in both ships and in case of separation between this place and madeira then to meet at the island st vincent one of the cape de verde islands to wood and water our ships but if we miss one another at that island or that the first ship finds it inconvenient for stopping then to proceed to praia on st jago another of the same islands to wait at both these islands fourteen days and then if the missing ship does not appear the other to proceed to the isle of grande in latitude twenty three degree thirty minutes south on the coast of brazil there to wait three weeks and then if we don't meet let the single ship proceed on the voyage according to the orders given from our owners this is our opinion this ninth day of september seventeen o eight thomas dover president stephen courtney woods rogers edward cook william dampier robert fry charles pope carlton van brew thomas glendall john bridge john ballet september tenth at six in the morning we saw a sail after speaking with our consort we both chased i gave the duchess about a mile start of us in order to spread the moor it blew fresh with a great sea and the chase being windward we crowded extravagantly wind at northwest september eleventh at three yesterday afternoon we came up with the chase who bore down right upon us shewing swedish colors i fired twice at her before she brought two then went aboard her with my yawl captain courtney's boat being just before me we examined the master and found he came round scotland and ireland we suspected he had contraband goods on board because some of the men we found drunk told us they had gunpowder and cables so we resolved to examine her strictly 
put twelve men on board her, and kept the Swedes master and twelve of his men on board our ships. This morning, after we had examined the men and searched the ship, we found it difficult to be proved whether she was a prize, and not willing to hinder time to carry her into any harbour to examine her farther, we let her go without the least embezzlement. The master gave me two hams and some roughed dried beef, and I gave him a dozen bottles of red streak cider. They saluted us at parting with four guns. She belonged to Stadt, near Hamburg, and was a frigate-built ship of twenty-two guns, about two hundred seventy tons. While I was on board the Swede yesterday, our men mutinied, the ringleaders being our boatswain, and three other inferior officers. This morning the chief officers, having kept with me in the after part of the ship, we can find the authors of this disorder, in which there was not one foreigner concerned. We put ten of the mutineers in irons, a sailor being first soundly whipped for exciting the rest to join him. Others less guilty I punished and discharged, but kept the chief officers all armed, fearing what might happen. The ship's company, seeming too much inclined to favor the mutineers, made me the easier forgive. Some begged pardon, and others I was forced to wink at. However, they began to find their design frustrated, which was to make a prize of the Swede, who they alleged had much contraband goods aboard, though we could see none. Yet they obstinately insisted that we apparently gave away their interest by letting her go without plundering her. I labored to convince them of the necessity of our making dispatch, and that if we could make her a prize it would unman our ships too much to send her into any port, besides other disadvantages it might procure to ourselves and owners should we be mistaken, which pacified the major part. Our consort's men were at first very uneasy, but finding the malcontents quelled aboard our ship, they all kept quiet. September 12th. Yesterday the wind was very little and veerable, and we had an observation, 34 degrees, 30 minutes north. September 13th. Those in irons discovered others who were ringleaders in the mutiny, whom we'd also punished, and confined one of them in irons with the rest. Alexander Winter was made boatswain, instead of Giles Cash, one of the mutineers. Fair pleasant weather, little wind at northwest by west. September 14th. I agreed with the captain of the Crown Galley to carry my boatswain, who was the most dangerous fellow among the mutineers, in irons with him to Madeiras. I did not at his first confinement think of sending him off, but this day a sailor came aft to the steerage door with near half the ship's company of sailors following him, and demanded the boatswain out of irons. I desired him to speak with me by himself on the quarter-deck, which he did, where the officers assisted me, seized him, and made one of his chief comrades whip him. This method I thought best for breaking any unlawful friendship amongst themselves, which, with different correction to other offenders, allayed the tumult, so that now they began to submit quietly, and those in irons beg pardon and promise amendment. This mutiny would not have been easily laid were it not for the number of our officers, which we begin to find very necessary to bring our crew to order and discipline, which is always very difficult in privateers, and without which tis impossible to carry on any distant undertaking like ours fine pleasant weather, and moderate gales. It being little wind and contrary, we agreed to pass by Madeiras, and cruise a little amongst the Canary Islands for liquor, to prevent loss of time. So we took leave of the Crown Galley, who was bound in to Madeira. September 15th. Last night we sent Giles Cash aboard her in irons, with several letters by the commander at large to our owners. We parted at twelve o'clock at night, fair weather, very little wind, from west-northwest to north by east, and had a very good observation. Latitude thirty-one degrees, twenty-nine minutes north. September 16th. I discharged the prisoners from their irons, upon their humble submission and strict promises of good behavior for time to come. While they continued in irons, they had sentries over them, and were fed with bread and water. Those that were officers we restored to their places, and everybody was ordered to obey them. John Pillar, the boatswain's mate, was advanced to be boatswain, so that we are all quiet again. About eight this morning we saw land, and found it to be Salvage's Island, bearing south-southwest, distant eight leagues, latitude twenty-nine degrees, forty-five minutes, wind very light and veerable, with fair, clear weather. September 17th. Moderate gales of wind. The Salvage's at a distance is not unlike the island Lundy in Bristol Channel about two miles long, a high island. This morning we saw the rock that appeared to us a good league to the southwest of the island, and took it to be a sail till we came near it. Little wind between the north-northeast and the west. September 18th. 
at four yesterday in the afternoon we came in sight of pico tenerife bearing southwest by west distant about eight leagues steered south southeast and southeast by south for grand canaries this morning about five o'clock we spied a sail under our lee bow between the islands of grand canaries and forteventura we chased her and at seven came up with her our consort being a little ahead fired a gun and made her bring two she proved a prize being a spanish bark about twenty-five tons belonging to oratava on tenerife and bound to forteventura with about forty-five passengers who rejoiced when they found us english because they feared we were turks amongst the prisoners were four friars and one of them the padre guardian for the island forteventura a good honest old fellow we made him heartily merry, drinking King Charles the Third's health, but the rest were of the wrong sort. We used them all very well without searching them, etc. Fresh gales and fair weather, wind from the north-northeast to the east-southeast. September 19th. After we had took the prize, we stood to the westward for Tenerife, in order to have her ransomed, where our agent, Mr. Van Brew, pressed to go ashore with some of the prisoners. At eleven last night, the wind being at northeast when we were very near the shore, we could hardly weather Cape Nago, the easternmost part of Tenerife, till the wind veered to the northward. We stood off till day. In the morning it proved moderate, so we stood in for Oratava, and sent the Spanish master of the bark to it in his boat, being manned with some of the prisoners. Mr. Van Brew, still insisting to go ashore, I consented, though against my judgment, and he went with them to treat for the ransom of the whole of the bark her small cargo, which consisted in two butts of wine and one hogshead of brandy, and other small matters, we designed for our own use in both ships, the agents of each being to take an account of it the first opportunity. Fresh gale of wind at northeast. September 20th. About eight this morning came a boat off from Oratava with a flag of truce, and brought a letter signifying that unless we would immediately restore the bark and cargo, Mr. Van Brew should be detained. I sent to Captain Courtney, who agreed with me on an answer. We stood in with our ships within a league of the town, to tow in the boat for dispatch, and about eleven they went ashore again. Wind at northeast by east, very fresh. The letter sent us was as follows. Captain Rogers and Captain Courtney. Gentlemen. Port Oratava, 20th September, 1708. Your lieutenant coming ashore, and having given an account to our governor of your having taken a boat belonging to this place bound to Forteventura, we must inform you that Her Majesty is graciously pleased to allow a trade between her subjects and the people of these islands, whereof we suppose you are not ignorant, and that it is approved of not only by His Catholic Majesty, but also by the most gracious Christian King, who has sent express orders unto his consul here, that none of his men of war or others shall molest any ship trading to these islands. And there has been actually an example of a ship belonging to the subjects of Her Britannic Majesty, which was taken by a French privateer, and upon due application to the French consul the ship was restored. Wherefore, we are all of opinion that there can be no room for your making a prize of this Spanish bark, for it will be extremely prejudicial to Her Majesty's subjects that reside here, and likewise to those in England trading hither, by prohibiting of all future trade, by making more than sufficient reprisal upon our effects here, and perhaps on our persons, by reason of the evident breach on our part of the stipulated trade which has been concerted with us." wherefore we must once more desire you to restore the spanish bark as you will answer the contrary before her majesty who has so far approved of the private trade that she was pleased to allow of two men of war viz the dartmouth captain cock and the greyhound captain harriet the last year who had express orders to molest in no manner of way any vessel belonging to the spaniards which accordingly they observed wherefore as you have a due regard to what is so much the interest of her majesty's subjects we expect at the return of this boat that you will make restitution of the said bark otherwise mr van brew will not be permitted to go off and there will be extravagant reprisals made upon our estates and persons which we expect you will take into your consideration and we cannot omit to let you know that there is now a spanish bark actually in england which is daily expected with other english ships to load wine which they will not be admitted to do in case you don't restore this bark we don't doubt but the people here out of complaisance will make you some acknowledgment of a refreshment 
gentlemen you are very humble servants j polden vice-consul j cross bernard walsh g fitzgerald pray excuse haste that we have not time to transcribe the rest of the merchants are in the city where our governor generally resides being about six leagues hence our answer was thus on board the duke frigate september twentieth gentlemen we have yours and observe its contents but having no instructions given us with our commission relating to spanish vessels trading amongst these islands we can't justify the parting with this bark on your single opinions it was mr van brew's misfortune to go ashore and if he is detained we can't help it to have convinced us satisfactorily of what you say you ought to have sent us a copy of her majesty's orders or proclamation but we doubt there's no such thing in this case if mr van brew is unjustly detained we'll carry the prisoners we have on board to the port we are bound to let the consequence be what it will we are required to be accountable no further than we are obliged by our instructions which we have given sufficient security already to follow and don't fear a premunary when we comply with them we know fishing boats are excused on both sides and all trading vessels from rio la Ache to the river of chagre in the spanish west indies we admire the master and passengers should be so ignorant of a thing so necessary to be known by em for we never had the least word or intimation from them of what you write the example you give us of a trade here allowed by the french king and duke of anjou we don't admire it at because it is for the benefit of the spaniards and we know the english ships are protected no farther than an anchor ground and since we took this vessel at sea we shan't part with her unless on our own terms if you are positive in what you wrote us and conscious what detriment it will be to the english trade you have no way to prevent it but immediately to ransom this bark and if it be her majesty of great britain's pleasure and we are better informed in england then we can justify our conduct to the gentleman that employed us and you will be again reimbursed we shall wait but a short time for an answer having water and provisions for ourselves and prisoners to the english settlements where we are bound we are apprehensive you are obliged to give us this advice to gratify the spaniards and with respect are gentlemen your humble servants woods rogers stephen courtney if you send us mr van brew and the man with him we'll send you the prisoners but will not part from the bark unless ransomed though the value is not much we will not be imposed on we desire you to use all manner of dispatch without loss of time which we can't allow nor answer it to our employers september twenty first at six last night the spanish boat came again to us with a dilatory answers to our last insisting on behalf of the spaniards that the goods should be returned them though they consented to ransom the bark to which we immediately returned an answer for we were angry at their tediousness and our ill treatment our time being precious because we were informed that they expected every hour a small privateer that usually cruised off madeira as also a spanish ship from the west indies designed for santa cruz so that it looked like a design to keep us here in suspense till these ships might get safely in on the other side of the island our answer was to this effect that it had not been out of respect to our officer on shore we would not have stayed one minute but would now stay till morning for their answer and take a cruise among the islands some time longer than we intended in order to make a reprisal and though we could not land our men would visit the town with our guns by eight next morning adding that we hoped to meet with the governor's frigate and should repay his civility in his own way but wondered that they being englishmen should trifle with us the letter had its effect for this morning at eight o'clock we stood in close to the town and spied a boat coming off which proved to be one mr cross an english merchant and mr van brew our agent with him with wine grapes hogs and other necessaries for the ransom of the bark upon his coming up we immediately went to work discharged the bark and parted the small cargo between our two ships we treated mr cross as well as we could and at his desire gave the prisoners back as much as we could find of what belonged to their persons particularly to the friars their books crucifixes and relics we presented the old padre guardian with a cheese and such as were stripped with other clothes so that we parted very well satisfied on all sides mr cross told us the spaniards ashore were very inquisitive whither we were bound and understanding by the prisoners that our ships were sheathed and so full of provisions they suspected we designed for the south sea and he informed us that four or five french ships from twenty-four to fifty guns sailed thence about a month before on the same voyage but we did not think fit to own there that we were bound to any other place than the english west indies 
these islands being so well known i need not add any description of them we saw the pike of tenerife plain but once while there it being generally clouded you may often see the top above the clouds when the rest is all covered with them now we are indifferently well stocked with liquor and shall be the better able to endure the cold when we get the length of cape horn which we are informed has always very cold bad weather near it september twenty second last night just as we had finished with mr cross and delivered the spaniards their bark we spied a sail to the westward of the island between three and four in the evening we immediately made what sail we could and steered west by north along the shore at eight o'clock we were in sight of gomera bearing south southwest distant three leagues palma west by north distant five leagues we lost sight of the sail before night spoke with our consort and agreed to keep between palma and gomera in our voyage it being uncertain to meet with the chase the next day since last night she was near five leagues from us so that we believe she might get into a place of safety if an enemy before we could see her besides there came on a stiff gale which put us quite out of hopes of seeing her again to advantage fair weather fresh gales at northeast by north september twenty third about five yesterday in the afternoon when at least thirty six leagues distant we saw the pico tenerife very plain fine pleasant weather fresh gales with smooth water wind at northeast by east september twenty fourth we sent our boat for captain courtney captain cook mr stratton and mr bath their agent who stayed and dined with us and whilst they were aboard we held a council the result of which was as follows at a committee by desire of captain woods rogers captain thomas dover and captain stephen courtney held on board the duke we have examined all letters and proceedings that happened at and after the taking of the spanish bark and the reason of both ships stay off of tenerife and amongst canary islands and we do approve of all that was transacted and wrote the major part of us having at the time when twas done advised the commanders to do it witness our hands thomas dover president stephen courtney woods rogers william dampier edward cook carlton van brew william bath william stratton robert fry charles pope thomas glendall john bridge john ballet whilst the committee were together mr van brew complained i had not treated him as i ought upon which i offered to refer it to all present that we might not have needless misunderstandings at the beginning of our voyage and they came to the following resolution whereas there has been some difference between captain woods rogers and mr carlton van brew the ship's agent it being referred to the council we adjudged the said mr van brew to be much in the wrong in witness whereof we have set our hands the twenty fourth of september seventeen o eight thomas dover president stephen courtney william dampier edward cook robert fry william stratton william bath charles pope thomas glendall john bridge john ballet september twenty fifth this day according to custom we ducked those that had never passed the tropic before the manner of doing it was by a rope through a block from the main yard to hoist him above halfway up to the yard and let him fall at once into the water having a stick crossed through their legs and well fastened to the rope that they might not be surprised and let go their hold this proved of great use to our fresh-water sailors to recover the color of their skins which were grown very black and nasty those that we ducked after this manner three times were about sixty and others that would not undergo it chose to pay half a crown fine the money to be levied and spent at a public meeting of all the ship's companies when we returned to england the dutchmen and some englishmen desired to be ducked some six others eight ten and twelve times to have the better title for being treated when they come home wind northwest by west and veering to the northward and eastward september twenty sixth yesterday in the afternoon we sold the loose plunder of the bark amongst the sailors by auction fair weather moderate gales at north northeast had a very good observation latitude twenty one degrees thirty three minutes north september twenty ninth betwixt nine and ten at night sailor going up to furl the main top gallant sail fell suddenly without any noise from the main top overboard occasioned as i supposed by a fit at nine this morning we saw land and supposed it to be sal one of the cape de verde islands bearing southeast by south distant at about twelve leagues at twelve o'clock at noon it bore east southeast distant four leagues fair weather smooth water fresh gales at northeast 
latitude seventeen degrees five minutes north longitude west from london twenty three degrees sixteen minutes september thirtieth after being satisfied the island was sol we stood from it west and west by north for st vincent at four o'clock sol bore east by south one quarter south distant ten leagues at six st nicholas bore southwest by west distant eight leagues we went with an easy sail till four this morning and lay by to make the islands because we had none aboard either ship that was acquainted with them when day broke we saw the islands all in a range much as is laid down in the drafts at ten o'clock we anchored in the bay of st vincent in five fathom water tis a fine bay the northmost point bore north near a mile distant and the westernmost port bore west distant about two miles monk's rock which is like a sugar loaf high and round and bold on every side lies almost in the entrance of this fine sandy bay on the west side of the island but nearest the north point of the bay sailors must be careful as they come in not to run too near under the high land of the north point for fear of being becalmed and sudden flaws coming every way upon them there being a small shoal about three ships length almost without the point but giving it a small berth it's bold enough we ran within two cables length of the first round point next to the long sandy bay and came to an anchor in clean sandy ground monk's rock bore northwest by north distance three-quarters mile the body of the island st antonio bore northwest half north distance nine miles this is a fine bay and a good landing but the best at northernmost point the wood lies in the middle of the sandy bay and the water between the north point and the place where we anchored there is good anchoring all over the bay and the monk's rock will direct any stranger into it there being no other like it about this island on the side opposite to st antonio it blows here a constant trade wind betwixt the east by north and the north northeast except in the months of october november december and january it sometimes blows southerly with tornadoes and rain october the first we cleared our ship yesterday but it blowed too hard to row our boat loads of empty butts ashore and we could do but little to wooding and watering till this morning we were forced to get a rope from the ship to the watering place which is a good half mile from our anchoring place and so hauled our empty casks ashore by boat loads in order to have them burnt and cleaned in the inside being oil casks and for want of cleaning our water stunk insufferably i borrowed a cooper from the duchess and having five of my own made quick dispatch october third we sent our boat over to st antonio with joseph alexander a good linguist and a respectful letter to the governor who accounts himself a great man here though very poor to get in truck for our prize goods what we wanted they having plenty of cattle goats hogs fowls melons potatoes limes ordinary brandy tobacco indian corn etc our people were very meanly stocked with clothes and the duchess's crew much worse yet we are both forced to watch our men very narrowly and punish several of them to prevent their selling what clothes they have for trifles to the negroes that came over with little things from st antonio's the people at all these islands rather choose clothing or necessaries of any sort than money in return for what they sell the letter sent by the linguist to the governor of st antonio's senior joseph rodrigues was as follows honorable sir the bearer hereof is one of our officers whom we have sent to wait upon your honor with our due respects and to acquaint you with our arrival in the bay of st vincent and further that being subjects and servants of her majesty the queen of great britain a high ally and confederate of his sacred majesty the king of portugal and having several necessaries which we suppose the inhabitants of your island may want and supposing they can accommodate us per contra we are desirous of an immediate traffic with them we arrived three days ago but being strangers were unacquainted in these parts and not sooner informed of your honor's residence in the neighboring islands else we had been earlier with our respects and if not too great a favor we should be proud to see your honor on board our stay cannot exceed two days more so that dispatch is necessary we have money or goods of several kinds to pay or exchange for what they bring the bearer can inform your honor of the public occurrences of europe and the great successes of the confederate arms against the french and spaniards which no doubt must soon be followed with a lasting peace which god grant we subscribe ourselves with much respect your honors most obedient humble servants woods rogers stephen courtney end of section three
Section 4 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. Section 4 Caribbean to Grande. October 4th. Our boat returned this morning, but the landing place being far from the inhabitable part of St. Antonio, they brought nothing but a few limes and fowls, and left our linguist behind to get what we wanted. We struck two of our gun-room guns into the hold, being useless in their place, and the ship having too much top weight and not very stiff. We had plenty of fish here, but not very good. Winds at north-northeast. October 5th, our boat went to St. Antonio to see for our linguist, according to appointment. We healed and cleaned our ships and got a great deal of wood and water aboard. Wind at northeast, fine weather. October 6th, our boat returned with nothing but limes and tobacco and no news of our linguist. But soon after, there came another boat belonging to that part of the island where the governor lives, with his deputy governor, a negro, who brought limes, tobacco, oranges, fowls, potatoes, hogs, bananas, musks, and watermelons, and brandy, which we bought of him and paid in such cheap prize goods as we had left of the bark's cargo cheap enough. They are poor people and will truck at any price for what they want, in such payments as they can make. October 7th. We sent our boat at three this morning to see if our linguist was returned. The deputy governor told us he promised him to wait at the waterside all that night where we put him ashore, and that there were cattle for us if we would fetch them. We were ready to sail, a good wind at northeast and a fresh gale. October 8th. Our boat returned yesterday in the afternoon with two good black cattle, one for each ship, but no news of our linguist upon which we consulted with the officers of both ships and all unanimously agreed that we had better leave him behind than to wait with two ships for one man that had not followed his orders we held a committee on board the duchess to prevent embezzlements in prizes and to hinder feuds and disorders amongst our officers and men for the future because the small prize had shewed us that without a method to be strictly observed in plunder it might occasion the worst of consequences to both ships and such quarrels as would not easily be laid so with the consent and approbation of the officers appointed for a committee we unanimously agreed on it to prevent those mutinies and disorders amongst the men of both ships who were not yet reconciled since the taking the small canary prize they all insisted there was never any privateer's crew hindered from plunder so that we were forced to agree on the following instrument of a dividend when we should meet with any prize and that the things we deemed to be plunder, according to custom in privateering, should tend as little as possible to the disadvantage of the owners, we did for that end take care by the second article in the said instrument and agreement with the men to reserve the power of adjudging what should be deemed plunder unto the superior officers and agents, exclusive of the crew, etc. For we found it would be next to a miracle to keep the men in both ships under command, and willing to fight resolutely on occasion, if we held them to the letter of agreement with the owners, which was not duly considered of at home. We had a particular regard, however, to the sentiments of the owners, delivered on this head in discourses at several times with divers of the committee, as myself, Captain Dover, Captain Courtney, Mr. Robert Fry, and Mr. Carlton Van Brew, and particularly in King Road, to the men, at the time of signing of their instrument. By all which we judged that the owners could not but approve of the measures that we took on this occasion, and that the good effects of them would abundantly answer our intentions. Although the officers and men did voluntarily allow Captain Courtney and me five per cent each out of the value of all plunder, it was much less than our due and we would have been glad to have let all alone, provided we could, with the advice of our chief officers in both ships, have contrived any other method to be safe in the prosecution of our designs with our men, and have kept them to their duty on all occasions, at so great a distance from home. Without their being easy, we must unavoidably have run into such continual scenes of mischief and disorder as have not only tended to the great hindrance, but generally to the total disappointment of all voyages of this nature that have been attempted so far abroad in the memory of man. The agreement we made was as follows. At a committee held on board the Duchess, the 8th of October, 1708, it is agreed by the officers and men of both ships to the sundry particulars following. 
impressed that all plunder on board each prize we take by either ship shall be equally divided between the company of both ships according to each man's respective whole share as shipped by the owners or their orders two that what is plunder shall be adjudged by the superior officers and agents in each ship three that if any person on board either ship do conceal any plunder exceeding one piece of eight in value twenty-four hours after the capture of any prize he shall be severely punished and lose his shares of the plunder the same penalty to be inflicted for being drunk in time of action or disobeying his superior officer's commands or concealing himself or deserting his post in sea or land service except when any prize is taken by storm in boarding then whatsoever is taken shall be his own as followeth a sailor or landman ten pounds any officer below the carpenter twenty pounds a mate gunner boatswain and carpenter forty pounds a lieutenant or master seventy pounds and the captains one hundred pounds over and above the gratuity promised by the owners to such as shall signalize themselves four that public books of plunder are to be kept in each ship attested by the officers and the plunder to be appraised by officers chosen and divided as soon as possible after the capture also every person to be sworn and searched so soon as they shall come aboard by such persons as shall be appointed for that purpose the person or persons refusing shall forfeit their shares of the plunder as above five in consideration that captain rogers and captain courtney to make both ships companies easy have given the whole cabin plunder which in all probability is the major part to be divided as aforesaid we do voluntarily agree that they shall have five per cent each of them over and above their respective shares as a consideration for what is their due of the plunder aforesaid six that a reward of twenty pieces of eight shall be given to him that first sees a prize of good value or exceeding fifty tons in burden seven that such of us who have not signed already to the articles of agreement indented with the owners do hereby oblige ourselves to the same terms and conditions as the rest of the ship's company have done half shares and half wages etc to which articles of agreement we have set our hands as our full intent and meaning without any compulsion signed by the officers and men of both ships october eighth at seven in the evening after having put the deputy governor ashore where he must lie in a hole of the rocks there being no house on that part of the island we came to sail our consort got before us and lay with a light for us there were several negroes on the island that came from st nicholas and st antonio to make oil of turtle there being very good green turtle at this time of the year which i sometimes gave our men to eat they have likewise wild goats but in no great plenty wild asses guinea hens and curlews in abundance of sea fowls captain dampier and others aboard each ship that had formerly stopped at st jago another of these cape de verde islands told us that though this island is not often frequented by ships yet it is preferable to st jago for stopping outward because tis a much better road for ships and more convenient for water and wood and has better landing the island is mountainous and barren the plainest part lies against this sandy bay where we rode the wood that grows in it is short and for no use but firing they have very large spiders here which weave their webs so strong betwixt the trees that tis difficult to get through em where we watered there's a little stream that flows down the hill from a spring and is very good but in other parts tis brackish this island was formerly inhabited and had a governor but is now only frequented in the season for catching tortoises by the inhabitants of the other islands who are for the most part negroes and mulattoes and very poor the stock of wild goats in this island is almost destroyed by the people of st nicholas and st antonio the heats are excessive to us who came newly from europe so that several of our men began to be sick and were blooded some of our officers that went ashore a-hunting could meet no game but a wild ass which after a long chase they got within shot and wounded yet he afterwards held out so as to tire them and they returned weary and empty-handed these islands are so well known that i need not say much of em they are ten in number of which st iago st nicholas bonavist st ontario bravamayo and fuego are inhabited the latter is so named from a volcano 
St. Iago is much the largest and best, and the seat of the chief governor. It produces a small matter of indigo, sugar, and tobacco, which, with their goatskins and others, they send to Lisbon. The capital is of the same name, and the see of a bishop. There is also a town called Ribera Grande, which is said to consist of five hundred houses, and has a good harbor towards the west. The air of this island is not very wholesome, and the soil uneven. Their valleys produce some corn and wine. Their goats are fat and good meat, and the she-ones are said to bring three or four kids at a time once in four months. St. Nicholas is the best peopled next to St. Iago. The island Mayo has a great deal of salt naturally made by the sun from the sea-water, which is left from time to time in pits on shore. It's known they loaned many ships with that commodity in a year, and are able to furnish some thousands had they vent for it. The fine Marroquin leather is made of their goat skins. The other inhabited islands afford more or less of provisions. They have their name from Cape Verde on the African coast, from whence they lie about 160 leagues to the westward the portuguese settled here in fifteen seventy two we had very hot weather here on the eighth a brisk gale at east northeast at nine last night st antonio's bore northwest by north distance three leagues from whence we took our departure for the isle of grande in brazil october ninth fair weather brisk gale of wind at northeast we saw abundance of flying fish at twelve o'clock, being near the latitude fourteen north, we hailed up southeast by south to get well to the eastward, expecting as usual to meet with southerly winds when near the equinoctial. Had an observed latitude twelve fifty three. October tenth, fair weather, moderate gales of wind at northeast by east. These twenty four hours we met with several great whipplings as if a current, which had it been calm we would have tried. October 11th, wind and weather as before till seven last night, when we had much lightning, followed by a hard shower of rain, and a calm ensued. Such weather is customary as we draw near the line. October 14th, cloudy weather, with moderate gales from the south-southwest to the southwest by west, all last night. But this morning cloudy weather, with hard showers of rain. This day we put up the smith's forge, and he began to work on such things as we wanted. October 21st, Yesterday I dined on board Captain Courtney. Nothing remarkable happened since the 14th but veerable winds and frequent showers of rain with calms. We agreed with our consort, if possible, to stop at the island Trinidado, and not to water and refresh at Brazil for fear of our men deserting and losing our time. October 22nd. Close, cloudy weather all night with squalls of rain. At 10 this morning it cleared up. Captain Courtney came aboard of us and sent back his boat for Captain Cook, with orders to bring Mr. Page, second mate, with him, to be in the room of Mr. Ballet that we exchanged out of our ship. Page, disobeying command, occasioned Captain Cook, being the superior officer on board, to strike him, whereupon Page struck him again, and several blows passed. But at last Page was forced into the boat and brought on board of us. And Captain Cook and others telling us what mutiny had passed, we ordered Page on the forecastle into the bilboes. He begged to go into the head to ease himself. Under that pretense the corporal and the rest left him for a while, upon which he leapt overboard, thinking to swim back to the Duchess, it being near calm, and the captains out of the ship. However, the boat being alongside, we soon overtook him and brought him on board again, for which, and his abusive language, he was lashed to the main gears and drubbed, and for inciting the men to mutiny was afterward confined in iron to board the Duke. October 28th at five last night we were on the equinoctial and spied a sail about four leagues distant to windward bearing south by east and thinking she had not seen us we lay by in her way from six o'clock till half an hour past ten hoping to meet her if bound to the west indies but at growing dark and she having as we suppose seen us before night and altered her course we saw no more of her this day we began to read prayers in both ships mornings or evenings as opportunity would permit according to the church of england designing to continue it the term of the voyage cloudy weather moderate gales at southeast by south october twenty ninth this morning i let mr page out of irons on his humble submission and acknowledging his fault with promises of amendment fair pleasant weather with a fresh gale november first this morning between one and four o'clock the sea seemed to be in a breach as far as we could see being a moonlit night the watch being surprised called me up for they supposed it to be something extraordinary and hove the lead 
but finding no ground were all easy and afterwards believed that it was the spawn of fish floating on the water fair weather with moderate gales november second this morning two persons being accused of concealing a peruke of the plunder in the canary bark two shirts and a pair of stockings and being found guilty i ordered them into the bilbos after which they begged pardon promised amendment and were discharged pleasant weather and moderate gales of wind from east southeast to southeast by south had an observed latitude seven fifty south november fourth yesterday about four in the afternoon we spoke with our consort and agreed to bear away for the island of grande in brazil it being uncertain to fetch the island of trinidado and besides by the time we could get the length of it being generally close weather and the sun in the zenith we might miss so small an island which would prove a great loss of time to us close weather with a fresh gale of wind at southeast by east november thirteenth nothing remarkable since the fourth we have had the winds very veerable now we draw near the land the wind veers to the northward and often strong gales with hazy weather about eleven last night we made a signal to our consort and both lay by thinking ourselves to be near the land this morning came on moderate weather and we made sail again wind at north by east november fourteenth this morning at five we made the land of brazil very plain bearing northwest we had several soundings on the sand called in the maps bonfunda from twenty eight to fifty fathom water brown fair sand with gray stones amongst it we had several showers of rain with very little wind from north northeast to north by west latitude twenty two nine south november fifteenth at ten o'clock last night we had a heavy tornado with lightning which fell as if it had been liquid while this storm held which was not above an hour we had all our sails furled yet the ship lay along very much wind at southwest but afterwards calm and little wind the sun being near the zenith here at this time occasions such weather as soon as day appeared we saw the land bearing west about seven leagues distance a small breeze at north northwest we stood in with it but could not be certain what land it was we had sundry soundings from forty to fifty fathom water coarse sand november sixteenth yesterday evening having a brave breeze at east we stood in with the land and supposed it to be the island of cape frio it makes the southernmost land of several other islands it is high and uneven this island appears in two hills to the southward the least looks like a saddle and appears at a distance like two islands but as you draw near it you see that it joins november seventeenth this morning the weather being calm our pinnace went ashore with captain dampier into a sandy bay about two leagues off they brought aboard a large tortoise which our people eat the tortoises on this coast have a strong taste foggy weather and very little wind from the east to the southwest sometimes calm november nineteenth yesterday in the afternoon we came to an anchor in twenty-two fathom water the east end of the large island which we took to be grande bore west southwest distant about four leagues and there is a high woody point at the west end of the low sandy bay which at last we run by about one league and a half from us we sent our pinnace ashore well manned to this point with captain william dampier in order to be certain whether it was the entrance of grande between the two lands the boat returned about ten o'clock at night with a confirmation that it was the island of grande as we had supposed so we immediately weighed with a small breeze but it soon falling calm we came to anchor again then weighed with another small breeze and rowed and towed by the help of which at twelve o'clock we came to an anchor in the middle of the entrance of the island by grande in eleven fathom water the entrance goes in west by south a remarkable white rock on the larboard side of the bay bore southeast about a mile and a half tis a long entrance near five leagues from the place we anchored at november twentieth yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon we sent our boats in with a lieutenant in one boat and captain dampier in the other to sound all the way to our watering place and see if no enemy lay there i borrowed the duchess yawl and kept her ahead sounding but having a breeze against us we got little ground this morning at four we weighed again with the wind at northeast and got both into the bay on the west side of the isle of grande but could not reach the cove where we designed to water heavy showers of rain took us at eleven we rowed and towed into the cove where our consort had been an hour before us a portuguese boat came from a small cove on our starboard side as we came in and told us they had been robbed by the french not long before november twenty first yesterday afternoon it rained so hard that our men could not work at four o'clock captain courtney put eight of his men in irons for disobeying command and knowing them to be ringleaders was willing to secure them whilst here where they could run away 
about six o'clock it began to clear up and our pinnace with captain cook and lieutenant pope went to angre de reyes as it's called in sea draughts but the portuguese call it nostra senora de la concepcion a small village about three leagues distant to wait on the governor and acquaint him with our arrival with a present of butter and cheese to procure his friendship if any of our men should run away the boat returned at twelve at night and told us that when they came near the town it was almost dark that the people suspecting they were french fired on them several times but did no hurt and when they came ashore begged their pardon the friars invited them to the convent and told them they were often plundered by the french or they should not have been so ready to fire at them the governor was gone to rio janeiro a city about twelve leagues distant but was expected back every day this morning our men went in our boat to haul our fishing net and caught some very good fish much better than those at st vint's november twenty second yesterday afternoon we got our empty casks ashore and sent our carpenter with the portuguese to look out wood for trussel trees our main and four trussel trees being both broke but the weather proved so wet and sultry that we could do little or nothing here are abundance of graves of dead men and the portuguese tell us that two great french ships homeward bound from the south seas that watered in this same place about nine months before had buried nearly half their men the here but god be thanked ours are very healthy at this place the french south sea ships generally water both out and homewards this morning we had several canoes from the town with limes fowls idian corn etc to exchange for such things as we could spare we treated em all very civilly and offered a gratuity to such as would secure our men if any of em run away they all promised to give us good information and assist us in searching after em november twenty third this was a fair pleasant day but violent hot we healed the duchess both sides by us we had a great deal of wood cut caught excellent fish with our lines and had several canoes from the town which informed us of a brigantine at an anchor in the entrance where we came in i sent our pinnace manned and armed to know what she was and found her a portuguese laden with negroes for the gold mines our boat returned and brought a present being a roof of fine sugar and a pot of sweet meats from the master who spoke a little english and had formerly sailed with them the way that leads to these gold mines is not far from this place by water but the portuguese say they lie several days journey up in the country and some will tell you tis ten or fifteen days others a month's travel from the town of sinetas which is the seaport for they are cautious how they discover the truth but there is certainly abundance of gold found in this country they told us the french often surprised their boats and that at one time when the french stayed to water which could not exceed a month they took of gold above twelve hundred pounds weight in boats from the mines bound to rio janeiro because the way is not good by land november twenty fourth yesterday in the afternoon we cleaned one side by the duchess and this morning the other side gave the ships great lists and having men enough whilst our ship was cleaning we let the pinnace with captain dover mr van brew and others go to take their pleasure but to return by twelve o'clock when we should want our boat when they returned they brought with them a monstrous creature which they had killed having prickles or quills like a hedgehog with fur between them and the head and tail resembled those of a monkey it stunk intolerably which the portuguese told us was only the skin that the meat of it is very delicious and they often killed them for the table but our men being not yet at very short allowance none of them had stomach good enough to try the experiment so that we were forced to throw it overboard to make a sweet ship soon after came several canoes with portuguese in em whom we treated very civilly november twenty fifth this day was fair but very hot we had three or four canoes aboard one of which had three fathers belonging to the franciscan convent at angre de reyes we had got a great deal of water and wood aboard with new trussel trees fixed to the head of the foremast november twenty sixth yesterday afternoon we rigged the foremast again and got almost all our water on board last night one michael jones and james brown two irish landmen run into the woods thinking to get away from us though two such sparks run away the twenty-fifth from the duchess and in the night were so frightened with tigers as they thought but really by monkeys and baboons that they ran into the water hollowing to the ship till they were fetched aboard again about four this morning the watch on the quarter-deck spied a canoe and called her to come on board but they not answering and trying to get away made us suspect they had either got our men that run away last evening or were coming by agreement to fetch em off the island which was uninhabited 
we immediately sent the pinnace and yawl after em the pinnace coming up near the canoe fired to stay em but to no purpose at last they wounded one of the indians that rowed the canoe he that owned and steered her was a friar and had a quantity of gold which he got at the mines i suppose by his trade of confessing the ignorant the friar had just ran the canoe ashore on the little island full of wood as our boats landed and afterwards he told us he hid some gold there a portuguese that would not run away with the father because he had no gold to hide knew our people to be english and called the father back the man that was wounded could not move and was brought by our men with the father and several slaves that rowed the large canoe on board our ship where our surgeon dressed the wounded indian who died in two hours time i made the father as welcome as i could but he was very uneasy at the loss of his gold and the death of his slave and said he would seek for justice in portugal or england november twenty seventh yesterday in the afternoon the duchess weighed and towed out of the cove about a mile and came to anchor to wait for us their boats returning to the cove to fetch what was left they spied two men waiting under the side of a wood by the shore for a portuguese canoe to get em off but our boats landed on each side of the point where they were not seen found em to be the men that left us the evening before and brought em to us i ordered em both to be severely whipped and put in irons this morning captain courtney and i with most of our officers except those which we left to do what little remained unfinished on board the ships went in our boat to angre de reyes it being the day kept for the conception of the virgin mary and a high day of procession amongst these people the governor senor rafael de silva lagos a portuguese received us very handsomely he asked us if we would see the convent and procession we told him our religion differed very much from his he answered we were welcome to see it without partaking in the ceremony we waited on him in a body being ten of us with two trumpets and a hout boy which he desired might play us to church where our music did the office of an organ but separate from the singing which was by the fathers well performed our music played hey boys up go we and all manner of noisy poultry tunes and after service our musicians who were by that time more than half drunk marched at the head of the company next to them an old father and two friars carrying lamps of incense with the host next came the virgin mary on a bier carried on four men's shoulders and dressed with flowers and wax candles etc after her came the padre guardian of the convent and then about forty priests friars etc next was the governor of the town myself and captain courtney with each of us a long wax candle lighted next followed the rest of our officers the chief inhabitants and junior priests with every one a lighted wax candle the ceremony held about two hours after which we were splendidly entertained by the fathers of the convent and then by the governor at the guard house his habitation being three leagues off it's to be noted they kneeled at every crossway and turned walked round the convent and came in at another door kneeling and paying their devotion to the image of the virgin and her wax candles they unanimously told us they expected nothing from us but our company and they had no more but our music the town consists of about sixty low houses built of mud covered with palmetto leaves and meanly furnished they told us they had been plundered by the french or perhaps they hid their plate and other best movables because they were in doubt whether we were friends or enemies they have two churches and a franciscan monastery tolerably decent but not rich in ornaments they have also a guard-house where there are about twenty men commanded by the governor a lieutenant and ensign the monastery had some black cattle belonging to it but the fathers would sell us none the fish we saw on the road were sharks so well known that i need not describe them two pilot fishes so called because they commonly attend the sharks find out their prey for them and are never devoured by them three the sucking fish so called because of a sucker about two inches long on the top of their heads by the slime of which they stick so fast to sharks and other large fish that they are not easily pulled off four parrot fish so named because their mouths resemble the beak of a parrot five a rock fish which is very good and much like our cod six silver fish in great plenty tis a deep-bodied bright fish from twelve to eighteen inches long and very good meat but there are so many sorts of good fish here that we can't describe em all november twenty eighth yesterday in the afternoon we left angre de reyes when we got aboard we found the main mast rigged with everything ready this morning we got our ship out by our consort and the wind being out of the way and but little we went with our boat to the town to get liquors for the voyage and bring the gentlemen of the town aboard our ships where we treated them the best we could they were very merry and in their cups proposed the pope's health to us but we were quits with them by toasting that of the archbishop of canterbury 
To keep up the humor, we also proposed William Penn's to them, and they liked the liquor so well that they refused neither. We made the governor and the fathers of the convent a handsome present of butter and cheese from both ships, in consideration of the small presents and yesterday's favors from them, and as a farther obligation on them to be careful of our letters, which we took this opportunity to deliver into their own hands. I shall say no more of our letters, but that they contained everything material since my coming out, with two postscripts wrote by Captain Dover and Captain Courtney, to put it out of doubt amongst all those concerned, that we joined heartily in prosecuting our long undertaking, and that our officers behaved themselves to satisfaction, which may clear up some difficulty started amongst the gentlemen at home before we sailed, that were a great hindrance and discouragement to us in the beginning, because mismanagement and misunderstanding amongst the officers never fail of ill effects to the voyage, and of spoiling the men, which is an irrecoverable loss. November 29th. Yesterday in the afternoon, our yawl went to town to get necessaries for our next long voyage, because we were to run near 2,000 leagues before we could expect any recruit of liquors, unless by extraordinary good fortune. In the evening it came on blowing with thick showers of rain, which prevented the governor and the rest from going ashore that night. This morning the governor and company were carried ashore. At parting we saluted them with a huzzah from each ship, because we were not overstocked with powder after which all the officers of the committee met on board the duchess where we inquired into the true cause of the aforesaid indian's death and protested against mr van brew who was the occasion for commanding our ship's pinnace as he did in chase of the canoe unknown to me and without my order at the same time i desired to have the committee's hands if they approved what i transacted since my leaving the canary islands which they very readily signed and also the protest against mr van brew's unadvised management for I was sensible that good order and discipline in privateers was the only method to support myself and the other officers, and keep up our authority, which is so essential towards acting with success and vigor on all occasions. This made it highly necessary in the infancy of our undertaking to prevent innovations in command, which inevitably confound the most promising designs. Therefore I thought it a fit time now to resent ignorant and willful actions publicly, and to shew the vanity and mischief of them, rather than to delay or excuse such proceedings which would have made the distemper too prevalent, and brought all to remediless confusion, had we indulged conceited persons with a liberty of hazarding the fairest opportunities of success. The above-mentioned resolves of the committee follow. At a committee held on board the Duchess riding at the island Grande on the coast of Brazil, by request of Captain Thomas Dover, President, Captain Woods Rogers, and Captain Stephen Courtney, 29th of November, 1708. We have examined and do approve of all the proceedings and transactions since our being at the Canary Islands, both as to the punishing of offenders and acting in all cases for the best of our intended voyage, and that we found it actually necessary to sell part of the goods taken in the prize amongst the Canary Islands here, to purchase some liquor and other necessaries for our men as they go about Cape Horn, they being very meanly clothed and ill provided to endure the cold, and we have and do hereby desire the agent of each ship to take particular cognizance of what such goods are sold and disposed of for, and agree that all possible dispatch hath been made both here and at St. Vincent, an acknowledgment of which we have set our hands the day and year above written. Thomas Dover, President, Woods Rogers, Stephen Courtney, William Dampier, Edward Cook, Robert Fry, Carlton Van Brew, William Stratton, William Bath, Charles Pope, John Rogers, John Connolly, George Milburn, John Ballet. Memorandum that on the 26th day of November, 1708, a little before break of day, a canoe coming near the ship Duke, as she rode at anchor at the island of Grande on the coast of Brazil, they hailed her, she not answering, they fired at her, upon which she rode away, and the captain ordered the boat to get ready and pursue her, and Mr. Carlton Van Brew, agent of the said ship, putting off the boat without the order of his captain, or before any commanding officer was in pursuit of her, fired, or ordered to be fired, at her several muskets at a distance. But coming nearer, he ordered the men to fire into the boat, and the corporal firing, as we have reason to believe, killed an Indian, and took the canoe and sent her away with two of the duke's men, the corporal and a padre, and afterwards brought the rest of the people in the ship's pinnace since which time we are informed by the padre master of the dead indian that he lost a quantity of gold to the value of two hundred pounds 
which he says he carried ashore and hid in hopes to preserve he taking them for frenchmen by their firing and chasing which could not afterwards be found although he says he does verily believe it was not taken by any of the ship's people but alleges it was lost by means of their chasing and surprising him whatever damages may arise from the above mentioned action on account of killing the indian or loss of gold that the padre says he has lost we the commanders and officers of ship duke and duchess consorts do in behalf of ourselves and the rest of the ship's company protest against the unadvised actions of the aforesaid mr carleton van brew for proceeding without any order from the captain of same ship and acting contrary to what he was shipped for in witness whereof we have set our hands the twenty ninth day of november seventeen o eight thomas dover president woods rogers stephen courtney william dampier edward cook robert fry charles pope william stratton william bath john rogers thomas glendall john connolly george milburn john ballet november thirtieth the wind continuing out of the way last night we held a committee on board duchess and agreed to remove mr carleton van brew from the ship duke which agreement is as follows memorandum this thirtieth of november seventeen o eight we the underwritten officers belonging to the ships duke and duchess appointed as a committee by the owners of both ships do find it necessary for the good of our intended voyage to remove mr carleton van brew from being agent of the duke frigate to be agent of the duchess and to receive mr william bath agent of the duchess in his place this is our opinion and desire in acknowledgment of which we have hereunto set our hands in the port of the island of grande on the coast of brazil the day above written thomas dover president woods rogers stephen courtney william dampier edward cook robert fry charles pope thomas glendall john bridge november thirtieth about ten this morning we both weighed in order to go out on the other side of the grande which i think is the fairest outlet though they are both very large bold and good we went out east south east the wind at northeast and in two hours came to an anchor again it proving calm and a current against us december first yesterday at two in the afternoon we weighed again with a breeze at northeast but at five a gale came up at south southwest and blew very strong with rain insomuch that we were forced to bear away and come to an anchor close under the island of grande in fourteen fathom water it rained hard all night but towards morning little wind about ten this morning we weighed anchor and steered away southwest at twelve it was calm and we anchored again just before we anchored we spied a small vessel close under the shore near the west end of grande we sent our boat to examine her and found it to be the same brigantine our boats were aboard of six days before and from whence i had the present i gave the master an half hour glass and other small things of little value for which he was very thankful december second i wrote a long letter to my owners which captain dover and captain courtney also underwrote and gave it to the master of this brigantine who promised to forward it by the first conveyance for portugal so that now i had sent by four conveyances at ten this morning we sailed wind at west northwest rowed and towed till twelve and came to an anchor to the southward of grande our men continuing healthy december third yesterday in the afternoon we sailed with a brisk gale of wind at east by north at six o'clock in the evening the southwest point of grande bore west northwest distant five leagues the small three hummock island without grande which is seen as you go in both ways to it bore a northeast half north distant five leagues the westernmost point of the main bore west by south distant nine leagues from whence we departed for the island of juan fernandez the rest of these twenty-four hours a good gale from east by north to the east southeast this i observed when we came from cape frio to grande more than i have yet noted about thirteen leagues to the eastward of the isle of grande is a high round rock a good league without the island as it appeared to us within it is high mountainous land which we are informed is the entrance to rio janeiro and as we came to the westward we opened a sandy bay with low sandy land in the middle and high land on each side clear to the points it's about three leagues over and deep next to this bay as we came to the westward opened another low sandy bay not quite so deep but above twice as wide the westernmost point is indifferent high and full of trees which make the easternmost point as we entered grande from whence it runs in west and northerly about four leagues 
there is no such bay to the eastward as rio janeiro between that and cape frio this is a certain mark not to miss grande which might easily be done by a stranger the latitude being near the same for forty leagues within cape frio but grande lies out near two points farther southerly as you come to it from the eastward than any other land between that and cape frio we kept but an indifferent account of the ship's way from cape frio being nothing but fluttering weather but the portuguese master told me it is not less than thirty-four leagues we kept continual soundings and had always ground from one league to ten off the shore from twenty to fifty fathom water very even and gradual soundings with soft blue clayish sand till we got the length of grande then we had harder ground mixed with small stones and red sand the shore runs hither nearest west the island grande is remarkable high land with a small notch and a tip standing up on one side in the middle of the highest land easy to be seen if clear and there's a small island to the southward without it which rises in three little hummocks the nearest hummock to the island grande is the least as we came in and out we saw it and it appears alike on both sides there is also a remarkable round white rock that lies on the larboard side nearest to grande between it and the main at the entrance going in on the starboard side there are several islands and the main is much like islands till you get well in the best way when you open the coves that are inhabited on the starboard side going in is to get a pilot to carry you to the watering cove within grande otherwise send in a boat to the freshwater cove which lies round the inner westernmost point of the island and near a league in the passage is between small islands but room enough and bold it's the second cove under the first high mountain round behind the first point you see when you are in between the two islands this is the cove where we watered there are two other coves very good with some shoal banks between them but no shoal ground before we come to this cove we sounded all the passage in and seldom found less than ten fathom water but had not time to know or sound the rest of the coves the town bears northeast about three leagues distant from this cove the island of grande is near about nine leagues long high land and so is the main within it all you see near the water side is thick covered with wood the island abounds with monkeys and other wild beasts has plenty of good timber firewood and excellent water with oranges and lemons and guavas growing wild in the woods the necessaries we got from the town were rum sugar and tobacco which they sell very dear though not good to smoke it is so very strong we had also fowls and hogs but the latter are scarce beef and mutton are cheap but no great quantity to be had indian corn bananas plantains guavas lemons oranges and pineapples they abound with but have no bread except cassado the same sort as is eaten in our west indies which they call farana de pau i e bread of wood they have no kind of salating we had fine pleasant weather most of the time we were here but hot like an oven the sun being right over us the winds we did not much observe because they were little and veerable but commonly between north and the east we cleared an ordinary portuguese here called emmanuel de santo and shipped another whose name was emmanuel gonsalves end of section four section five of a cruising voyage around the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. Account of Brazil. I had Newhoff's account of Brazil on board, and by all the inquiry and observation I could make, found his description of the country, its product and animals, to be just, particularly of that monster called La Boya or the roebuck serpent which i inquired after thinking it incredible to the portuguese governor told me there are some of them thirty feet long as big as a barrel and devour a roebuck at once from whence they had their name i was also told that one of these serpents was killed near this place a little before our arrival tigers are very plenty here on the continent but not so ravenous as those in india the product of brazil is well known to be red wood sugars gold tobacco whale oil snuff and several sorts of drugs the portuguese build their best ships here the country is now become very populous and the people delight much in arms especially about the gold mines 
where those of all sorts resort but mostly negroes and mulattoes tis but four years since they would be under no government but now they have submitted some men of repute here told me the mines increase very fast and that the gold is got much easier at these mines than in any other country this is all i can affirm from my own observation concerning this country which was discovered first by the famous americus vespucius anno fifteen hundred when he called it santa cruz but the portuguese afterwards named it brazil from the red wood of that name which grows here it situate in the torrid zone and extends from the equinoctial to the latitude of twenty eight south the extent from east to west is uncertain therefore i can determine nothing concerning it the portuguese divide it into fourteen districts or captainships six of which being the northern part were subdued by the dutch about the year sixteen thirty seven and a peace concluded allowing it to be called dutch brazil which extended from north to south about one hundred eighty leagues and since it is not unusual for the dutch to lose their settlements abroad it mayn't be amiss to give a brief account how they were outed of this profitable country in sixteen forty three the face of the dutch affairs there began to alter for the worse the magazines of their west india company were exhausted by several expeditions against angola etc and receiving no supplies from holland as usual the great council at the recife their capital in brazil was forced to make use of what was due to the company for paying the garrisons and civil officers and by consequence to force their conquered debtors the portuguese to prompt payment this obliged the debtors to borrow money at three or four per cent per month which impoverished them so in a little time that they were neither able to pay principal nor interest the portuguese immersed themselves in debt to the company because of their hopes that the fleets coming from portugal would quickly subdue the dutch and pay off all scores besides there happened a great mortality among the portuguese negroes which they purchased from the dutch at three hundred pieces of eight per head this completed their ruin which together with their hatred to the dutch on account of religion made them resolve on a general revolt the dutch at the same time were engaged in a war with spain at home and count maurice who was governor of dutch brazil was recalled just in the height of the plot the dutch had several discoveries of it and an account of portuguese commissions importing that this revolt was undertaken for the honor of god the propagation of the roman faith the service of the king and common liberty they complained of this to the portuguese government in brazil who told them they would cultivate a good correspondence with them according to the orders of the king their master and wrote so to the dutch council yet still carried on the conspiracy till at last the rebellion broke out the dutch renewed their complaints but the portuguese government denied their having any hand in it till in sixteen forty five they openly invaded the dutch on pretence at first of appeasing the revolts of the portuguese in the dutch provinces according to the tenor of the peace but afterwards when they had got footing they alleged the dutch had murdered many of the portuguese in cool blood and then carried on the war till sixteen sixty when the dutch were forced to abandon brazil in the following conditions that the crown of portugal should pay the states eight hundred thousand pounds in money or goods and that the places taken on each side in the east indies should remain to the present possessors and that a free trade should be allowed the dutch in portugal and at their settlements in africa and brazil without paying any more custom than the portuguese but the other agreements have been since made between the two states and the portuguese remain in full possession of this fine country without allowing the dutch to trade to it this they fancy makes them sufficient amends for the loss of their large conquests in india taken from them by the dutch east india company the portuguese being now the least traders thither after enjoying the whole east india trade for above one hundred years newhoff who gave the best account of brazil at that time assigns the following causes for so easy a reconquest of it by the portuguese one the dutch took no care to have sufficient colonies of their own natives nor to keep strong garrisons in the country two they left the portuguese in possession of all their sugar mills and plantations which hindered the dutch from getting any considerable footing in the open country three the plantations and sugar mills that fell into their hands by forfeiture or otherwise they sold at such excessive rates and laid such taxes on the product that the dutch did not care to purchase them four 
the states of holland instead of reinforcing the garrisons of brazil according to prince maurice's advice reduced them lower notwithstanding all the remonstrances of the company to the contrary for they were so intent upon their conquests in the east indies that they seemed willing to be rid of brazil which is now a vast and populous country and employs a great number of large ships yearly from portugal who carry home an immense treasure of gold besides all other commodities of that country whilst prince maurice was in brazil the dutch fitted ships thence for chile which arrived there but wanted a sufficient force to withstand the spaniard while they could be recruited or gain an interest amongst the natives which they might have easily done could they have settled because at that time the spaniards had not conquered the indians of chile so the dutch being too weak were forced to return without effecting anything i shall conclude this head with a brief account of the natives of brazil from newhoff whose authority as i have said already i found upon inquiry to be very good they are divided into several nations and speak different languages they are generally of a middling size well limbed and their women not ill-featured they are not born black but become so by the heat of the sun they have black eyes black curled hair and have their noses made flat when young they come soon to maturity yet generally live to a great age without much sickness and many europeans live here to above a hundred years old which is ascribed to the goodness of the climate the portuguese cut off such multitudes of them that they perfectly hate that nation but were civil enough to the dutch because they treated them kindly such as live next the europeans wear shirts of linen or calico and the chief of them affect our apparel but those within land go for the most part naked covering their privities slightly with leaves or grass fastened about them with a string and the men exceed the women in modesty their huts are built of stakes and covered with palm tree leaves their dishes and cups are made of calabasses being the shells of a sort of pompions their chief furniture is hammocks of cotton made like network and these they fasten to sticks and use them for beds and when they travel tie them to trees the wives follow their husbands to war and elsewhere and carry their luggage in a basket with a child hung about them in a piece of calico a parrot or an ape in one hand and leading a dog by a string in the other while the idle lubber carries nothing but his arms which are bows and arrows darts or wooden clubs they know nothing of arithmetic but count their years by laying a chestnut in the season those who inhabit the inland parts know scarce anything of religion yet they have a sort of priests or rather conjurers who pretend to foretell what's to come they have a notion of a supreme being more excellent than the rest some reckon this to be thunder and others ursa minor or some constellation they fancy that after death their souls are transplanted into devils or enjoy all sorts of pleasures in the lovely fields beyond the mountains if they have killed and eat many of their enemies but those that never did anything of the moment they say are to be tormented by devils these people are much afraid of apparitions and spirits and make offerings to pacify them some of them are mightily addicted to sorcery to revenge themselves upon their enemies and they have others who pretend to cure those that are so bewitched the castilians converted some of them but the dutch ministers were more successful till they were hindered by the revolt of the portuguese the brazilian women are very fruitful have easy labor retire to the woods where they bring forth alone and return after washing themselves and their child the husbands lying abed the first twenty-four hours and being treated as if they had endured the pains the tapoyars who inhabit the inland country on the west are the most barbarous of the natives taller and stronger than the rest and indeed than most europeans they wear little sticks through their cheeks and under lips are man-eaters and use poisoned darts and arrows they change their habitations according to the season and live chiefly by hunting and fishing their kings and great men are distinguished by the manner of shaving their crowns and their long nails their priests are sorcerers make them believe that the devils appear to them in forms of insects and perform their diabolical worship in the night when the women make a dismal howling which is their chief devotion they allow polygamy yet punish adultery by death and when young women are marriageable but courted by nobody their mothers carry em to their princes who deflower em and this they reckon a great honor some of these people were much civilized by the dutch and very serviceable to them but kept under subjection to their own kings 
for the extraordinary animals plants etc of brazil i refer to newhoff being sensible that the descriptions of such things are not my province but i thought it convenient to give this hint for the diversion of such readers as may relish it better than a mariner's bear journal the river of the amazons being the northern boundary of brazil i shall describe it here according to most geographers it rises in the mountains of peru and is composed at first of two rivers one of which begins about latitude nine degrees south and the other about fifteen degrees the sansons call the latter huaca or maranbon which communicates its name to the other twas called amazons not because of any nation of virago's who as some fancy are governed by a queen and have no commerce with our sex but at certain times when they make an appointment with the males of neighboring nations and if they prove with child keep the daughters and send away the sons as the greeks fabled of their amazons but the true reason of the name is that the spaniards who first discovered it were told of such a terrible barbarous nation of women by some of the natives on purpose to frighten them that they did actually on several places of this river find their women as fierce and warlike as the men it being their custom to follow their husbands etc to war on purpose to animate them and to share in their fate as we find was anciently practised by the women of gaul germany and britain but to return to the course of the river the sansons give us a map of it from the discoveries of tejera who sailed up and down the same in sixteen thirty seven sixteen thirty eight and sixteen thirty nine the river he says begins at the foot of a chain of mountains named cordillera about nine or ten leagues east of quito in peru it runs first from west to east turns afterwards south and then after many windings and turnings holds its main course east till it falls into the atlantic sea its fountains and mouth are very near under the equator and the main of its streams is in the fourth and fifth degree of south latitude the rivers which fall into it on the north side rise about one or two degrees north at latitude and those on the south side some of them begin in ten some in fifteen and others in the twenty-first foot of south latitude its channel from junta de los reos about sixty degrees from its head till it is joined by the river maranbon is from one to two leagues in breadth from thence say the sansons tis from three to four but grows larger as it advances toward the atlantic into which it falls by a mouth from fifty to sixty leagues broad betwixt cape nort on the coast of guiana and cape zaparara on the coast of brazil its depth from junta de los reos to maranbon is from five to ten fathom from thence to rio negro from twelve to twenty and from thence to the sea from thirty to fifty and sometimes a great deal more tis always of a good depth near the shore and has no sand banks till it come towards the sea its running in a continued descent from west to east makes the sailing down it very easy and the east winds which last most part of the day are very commodious for those who sail up this river from the fountain to its mouth tis eight or nine hundred leagues in a direct line but the windings and turnings make it about twelve hundred some compute it at eighteen hundred and others twelve hundred seventy six but then they derive its source from the lake loricocha near guanaco in peru about latitude ten authors differ whether this river or la plata be the greatest which i shall not take upon me to determine the rivers which run into it on the right and left have their courses from one hundred to six hundred leagues in length and their banks are well inhabited by multitudes of people of different nations not so barbarous as those of brazil nor so polite as the natives of peru they live chiefly upon fish fruit corn and roots are all idolaters but pay no great respect to their idols nor perform any public worship to them except when they go upon expeditions Teixeira and his fellow discoverers say that most of those countries enjoy a temperate air, though in the middle of the torrid zone. This is probably owing to the multitude of rivers with which they are watered, the east winds which continue most of the day, the equal length of the days and nights, the great number of forests, and the annual inundations of the rivers, which fructify this country as that of the Nile does Egypt their trees fields and flowers are verdant all the year and the goodness of the air prevents their being infested so much with serpents and other dangerous insects as brazil and peru 
In the forest they have store of excellent honey, accounted very medicinal. They have balm good against all wounds. Their fruit, corn, and roots are not only in greater plenty, but much better than anywhere else in America. They have vast number of fish of all sorts in the rivers and lakes, and among others sea cows which feed on the banks, and tortoises of a large size and delicate taste. Their woods abound with venison and afford materials for building the largest ships. They have many trees of five or six fathom round in the trunk, and inexhaustible sores of ebony and Brazil wood, cocoa, tobacco, sugar canes, cotton, a scarlet dye called rocon, besides gold and silver in their mines and the sand of their rivers. The nations who inhabit about this and the other rivers that run into it are reckoned by Sanson and others 150, and their villages so thick in many places that most of them are within call of one another. Among those people, the Homagus, who live toward the head of this great river, are mostly noted for their manufactures of cotton, the Corispiares for their earthenware, the Serenes, who live betwixt latitude 5 and 10, and longitude 314 and 316, for their joiner's work, the Tapanambes, who live in a great island of this river at about latitude 4 and longitude 320, for their strength. Their arms in general are darts and javelins, bows and arrows, with targets of cane or fish skin. They make war upon one another to purchase slaves for their drudgery, but otherwise they treat them kindly enough. Among the rivers that fall into it on the north side, the Napo, Agaric, Putumaye, Genupape, Coropatube, and others have gold in their sands. Below Coropatube there are mines of several sorts in the mountains. In those of Yagnare there are mines of gold, in Picora there are mines of silver, on the river Paragoche there are precious stones of several sorts, and mines of sulphur, etc., near other rivers. Those of Putomaye and Caqueta are large rivers, the latter is divided into two branches, one falls into the Amazon's river by the name of Rio Negro, which is the largest on the north side, and the other, called Rio Grande, falls into the Orinoco. The chief rivers that fall into it on the south side are the Marabon, Amaramaye, Tape, Catua, Cusignate, Madere, or Cayenne, and many other large ones. The Sansones add that on this river, about two hundred leagues from the sea, there is a Bosphorus, or strait of one mile broad, that the tide comes up hither, so that it may serve as a key to all the trade of those countries. But the Portuguese, being already possessed of Para on the side of Brazil, Corupa and Estero on the side of Guiana, and Cojemina, an island at the mouth of it, they may, by fortifying the island of the sun or some other place in its chief outlet, be masters of all the trade. William Davis, a Londoner, who lived in this country some time, gives us this further account of it, and of the inhabitants about this river. They have store of excellent wild fowl in their woods, and among others, parrots, as many as we have pigeons in England, and as good meat. Their rivers and lakes abound with fish, but such as catch them must be upon their guard against crocodiles, alligators, and water serpents. The country is subject to frequent and violent storms of rain, thunder, and lightning, which commonly hold sixteen or eighteen hours. And the inhabitants are terribly pestered with mosquitoes. There are abundance of petty kings who live upon their particular rivers, on which they decide their quarrels with canoes, and the conqueror eats up the conquered, so that one king's belly proves another's sepulchre. The regalia by which they are distinguished is a crown of parrots' feathers, a chain of lion's teeth or claws about their necks or middles, and a wooden sword in their hands. Both sexes go quite naked and wear their hair long, but the men pluck theirs off on the crown. He says tis a question whether the women's hair or breasts be longest. The men thrust pieces of cane through the foreskin of their pundenda, their ears and under lips, and hang glass beads at the gristle of their noses, which bob to and fro when they speak. They are thievish and such good archers that they kill fish in the water with their arrows. They eat what they catch without bread or salt. They know not the use of money, but barter one thing for another, and will give twenty shillings worth of provisions, etc., for a glass bead or a Jew's harp. I come next to the discovery of this river, 
when gonzales pizarro brother to francis that conquered peru was governor of the north provinces of that country he came to a great river where he saw the natives bring gold in their canoes to exchange with the spaniards this put him upon a complete discovery of that river from its fountains to its mouth in order to this he sent out captain francisco de oriana in 1540 with a pinnace and men some say he went also himself and sailed down the river jacsha or maranbon forty-three days but wanting provisions commanded oriana to go in quest of some down the river and to return as soon as he could but oriana being carried down two hundred leagues through a desert country the stream was so rapid that he found it impracticable to return and therefore sailed on till he came to that which is properly called the river of the amazons he had spent all his provisions and eat the very leather on board so that seven of his men died of want in january that year after sailing two hundred leagues further he came to a town on the bank of the river where the people were afraid of him but at last furnished him with provisions and here he built a large brigantine he set out again on the second of february and thirty leagues further was almost cast away by the violent stream of a river which run into that of the amazons on the right side he sailed above twenty leagues further and was invited ashore in the province of aparia where he discoursed several of their cayaques who forewarned him of his danger by the amazons he stayed here thirty-five days built a new brigantine and repaired the other he sailed again in april through a desert country where he lived upon herbs and toasted indian wheat on the twelfth day of may he arrived at the populous country of macaparo where he was attacked by many canoes full of natives armed with long shields bows and arrows but fought his way through them till he came to a town where he took provisions by force after two hours fight with some thousands of the natives whom he put to flight and had eighteen of his men wounded but all recovered he put off again and was pursued two days by eight thousand indians in one hundred thirty canoes till he was past the frontiers of that country then he landed at another town three hundred forty leagues from aparia which being abandoned by the natives he rested there three days and took in provisions two leagues from hence he came to the mouth of a great river with three islands for which he called it trinity river the adjacent country seemed very fruitful but so many canoes came out to attack him that he was forced to keep the middle of the stream next day he came to a little town where he took provisions again by force and found abundance of curious earthenware finely painted and several idols of monstrous shapes and sizes he also saw some gold and silver and was told by the inhabitants that there was abundance of both in the country he sailed on one hundred leagues further till he came to the land of panganana where the people were civil and readily furnished him with what he wanted on whitsunday he passed by a great town divided into many quarters with a canal from each to the river here he was attacked by canoes but soon repulsed them with his firearms he afterwards landed and took provisions at several towns he met with the mouth of a river the water as black as ink and the stream so rapid that for twenty leagues it did not mix with that of the amazons he saw several small towns in his passage entered one by force which had a wall of timber and took abundance of fish there he pursued his voyage by many great towns and well inhabited provinces by which time the river was grown so wide that they could not see the one side from the other here he took an indian by whose information he supposed this to be the proper country of the amazons he sailed on by many other towns and landed at one where he found none but women he took abundance of fish there and resolved to have stayed for some time but the men coming home in the evening they attacked him so that he shipped off and continued his voyage he saw several great towns with paved roads between rows of fruit trees into the country and landed for provisions the inhabitants opposed him but their leader being killed they fled and left him at liberty to carry off provisions from hence he sailed to an island for rest and was informed by a female he had taken prisoner that there were men like themselves in that country and some white women whom he conceived to be spaniards she told them they were entertained by a cayaque after several days sail he came to another great town near which the indian told him those whites did live he kept on his course and after four days came to another town where the natives were civil furnished him with provisions and here he saw abundance of cotton cloth and a place of worship hung with weapons and two mitres resembling those of a bishop he went to a wood on the other side in order to rest but was soon dislodged by the natives 
he saw several large towns on both sides of the river but did not touch at them some days after they came to a town where he got provisions after doubling a point he saw other large towns where the people stood ready on the banks to oppose him he offered him toys in order to please them but in vain he continued his voyage and on the banks he saw several bodies of people he stood into them and landing his men the natives fought with great resolution ten or twelve being white women of an extraordinary size with long hair and all naked but their pudenda who seemed to be their commanders they were armed with bows and arrows and seven of them being killed the rest fled oriana had several men wounded and finding that multitudes of the natives were marching against him he sailed off reckoning that he had now made fourteen hundred leagues during his voyage but still did not know how far he was from the sea he afterwards came to another town where he met with like opposition several of his men were wounded and his chaplain lost an eye here he observed several woods of oak and cork trees he called this province by the name of st john's because he came to it on that saint's day he sailed on till he met with some islands where he was attacked by two hundred canoes with thirty or forty men in each abundance of drums trumpets and pipes etc but he kept them off with his firearms these islands appeared to be high fruitful and pleasant and the largest of them about fifty leagues long but he could take in no provisions because the canoes continually pursued him when he came to the next province he perceived many large towns on the larboard side of the river multitudes of natives came in their canoes to gaze on him and his indian prisoner informed him that these countries abounded with gold and silver oriana was here obliged to barricado his boats to cover his men because one of them was killed by a poison arrow as he sailed on he came to inhabited islands and perfectly discerned the tide here he was attacked by multitudes of canoes and lost some more men by poisoned arrows there were many towns on the starboard side of the river and he found other inhabited islands where he got provisions but was attacked and beat off when he landed on the continent till he came near the mouth of the river where the people readily furnished him he sailed two hundred leagues among the islands where he found the tide strong and at last in august that year found a passage to the sea of about fifty leagues wide where the tide rises five or six fathom and the fresh water runs twenty leagues into the sea esquire harcourt in his voyage to guiana says thirty leagues and that the fresh water there is very good he was mightily distressed for want of rigging and provisions till he came to the island of cubagua from whence he went to spain to give the king an account of his discovery the manuscripts taken by captain witherington say that oriana was about a year and a half upon this river when he reported his discoveries the king of spain sent him back with a fleet and six hundred men to take possession of this river in fifteen forty four some say fifteen forty nine but the project came to nothing for the captain himself after he had sailed up one hundred leagues died with fifty-seven of his men by the unhealthiness of the air and some of them sailed sixty leagues higher where they were friendly entertained by the natives but being too few to pursue the discovery they returned to the island margarita where they found oriana's lady says herrera who told them that her husband died of grief for the loss of so many of his men by sickness and the attacks of the indians and thus they returned re infecta so that oriana received no other advantage for his danger and expense but the honor of the first discovery and having the river called by his name in some authors Ovalle says that he lost half his men at the Canaries and Cape Verde, and his fleet was reduced to two large boats before he came back to the river, so that he was too weak to attempt a further discovery. The manuscripts taken by Captain Withrington say the second person who attempted it was Luz de Mello, a Portuguese, by order of his sovereign King John the Third, to whom the country from the mouth of this river to that of La Plata belonged according to the partition agreed on betwixt the portuguese and the spaniards he had ten ships and eight hundred men but lost eight of his ships at the mouth of the river so that he went to the island margarita from whence his men were dispersed all over the indies two or three captains from the kingdom of new granada attempted it afterwards by land but without success in fifteen sixty those of peru tried it another way 
the viceroy sent pedro de orsua a native of navarre with seven hundred men to the head of this river where he built pinnaces and canoes and having furnished himself with provisions and taken two thousand indians with many horses on board he embarked on the river jauxa or marinbon he sailed till he came to a plain country where he began to build a town but his men not being used to such labor and fatigued by the hot and rainy seasons they murmured though they had provisions enough and a great prospect of finding store of gold the mutineers were headed by lopez de aguira a biscainer who had been an old mutineer in peru and being joined by ferdinand de guzman a spanish soldier and one saldueno who was enamored on orusa's beautiful lady they murdered him when asleep with all his friends and chief officers then they proclaimed guzman their king but twenty days after he was also murdered by lopez who assumed the title to himself being a fellow of mean birth he murdered all the gentlemen in company lest any of them should rival him and having formed a guard of ruffians about him he became so jealous of his new dignity and was so conscious of what he deserved that when any of the men talked together he concluded they were plotting against him and sent his ruffians to murder them abundance of the rest and the women falling sick he barbarously left them to the mercy of the natives and sailed to the island margarita with two hundred thirty men he was well entertained by the governor who took him to be one of the king's officers but this ungrateful villain did speedily murder him and his friends ravaged the island forced some soldiers to go along with him and pretended to conquer the indies but was defeated taken and hanged by the governor of new granada the wretch murdered his own daughter that she might not be insulted by his enemies and then attempted to murder himself but was prevented thus concluded that fatal expedition the sansons say the next attempt was by those of cusco in fifteen sixty six but it came to nothing for their leaders fell out and fought with one another which made the rest a prey to the natives or that only maldonado one of their captains and two priests escaped to carry home the news two of the generals of para and the governors of marinbon were the next that renewed the attempt by the king's command but met with so many cross accidents that they could not effect it in sixteen o six two jesuits set out from quito thinking to reduce the country on this river by their preaching but one of them was killed by the natives and the other narrowly escaped says ovalle the next discovery was by captain john de palacios authors differ as to the time but most agree twas in sixteen thirty five he set out from quito with a few armed men and franciscan friars sailed down the river till he came to a knell where he was killed in sixteen thirty six and most of his companions returned except two monks and five or six soldiers who sailed down in a little vessel as far as para the capital of brazil where they acquainted to Xera, the portuguese governor with their discovery who upon their information sent forty-seven canoes with seventy spaniards and twelve hundred indians to sail up the river under to share the sailor he set out in october sixteen thirty seven and met with several difficulties which occasioned many of the indians to forsake him but he went on and set a captain with eight canoes to make discoveries before him this captain arrived june twenty fourth sixteen thirty eight at a spanish town built at the conflux of the rivers harari and amazons and dispatched a canoe to acquaint teixeira with it this encouraged him to proceed till he came to the mouth of the river chevalas where it falls into the amazons and there he left part of his men under a captain and the rest at junta de los rios under another while himself with a few went forward to quito the other captain arrived there some time before and both were well received by the spaniards to whom they reported their discovery in september sixteen thirty eight the men he left behind were well entertained by the natives at first but quarrelling with them afterwards suffered much for want of provisions and had little but what they took by force upon the news of this discovery the count de chinchon viceroy of peru sent orders from lima to furnish to Xera with all necessaries for his return down the river and appointed father de cugna rector of the college of cuenca and another jesuit to attend him and carry the news to spain they set out in february sixteen thirty nine and arrived at para in december following from whence de cugna went to spain and published his account of this river in sixteen forty the sum of his discovery besides what has been mentioned already is as follows 
there's a tree on the banks of this river called andorova from whence they draw an oil that is a specific for curing wounds there's plenty of ironwood so named because of its hardness redwood logwood brazil and cedars so large that acugna says he measured some that were thirty span around the trunk they have timber enough to build ships make cordage of the barks of trees and sails of cotton but want iron they make hatchets of tortoise shells or hard stones ground to an edge and chisels planes and wimbles of the teeth and horns of wild beasts their chief directors are sorcerers who are the managers of their hellish worship and teach them how to revenge themselves on their enemies by poison and other barbarous methods some of them keep the bones of their deceased relations in their houses and others burn them with all their movables and solemnize their funerals first by mourning then by excessive drinking yet the father says they are in general good-natured and courteous and many times left their own huts to accommodate him and his company some of these nations particularly the omaguas whose country is two hundred sixty leagues long and the most populous on the river are decently clad in raiment of cotton and trade in it with their neighbors some of the other nations wear plates of gold at their ears and nostrils and their joiners are so expert that they make chairs and other household furniture in the shapes of several animals with great art the jesuits of quito in peru have engraved a map of this river in which they give the following account viz that tis the greatest known in the world that though it be called by the name of amazons or oriana its true name is marinbon that it rises from the lake lorecoca as we have mentioned already runs eighteen hundred leagues and falls into the north sea by eighty-four mouths that near the city borja it is pent up by a strait called el pongo not above thirteen fathom wide and three leagues long where the stream is so rapid that boats run it in a quarter of an hour the truth of this must be submitted to the judgment of the reader but it seems very improbable since none of those who sailed up and down this river describe it thus besides twere impossible to sail up against so rapid a stream without a tide which the sansons say comes up to this strait but they make it a mile broad and by consequence not so rapid the jesuits add that both banks from the city yayen in the province of bracamoros where it begins to be navigable down to the sea are covered with woods of very tall trees among which there's timber of all colors abundance of sarsaparilla and the bark they call cloves which is used by dyers and cooks in the neighboring woods there are many tigers wild boars and buffaloes etc the jesuits began their mission upon this river in sixteen thirty eight have their capital at the city of st francis of borgia in the province of manos three hundred leagues from quito and their mission extends along three other rivers as far as the province of omaguas whether they make sometimes long and dangerous voyages in canoes they give an account of eight of their number that have been murdered by the barbarians the last of them in seventeen o seven besides borgia and its dependencies they have thirty-nine towns founded mostly by their own labor and charge but we shan't insist on their names their converts they reckon at twenty-six thousand and the missionaries about eighteen they add that they have contracted amity with several numerous nations whose conversion they hope for the portuguese have some towns at the mouth of this river and a fort on rio negro so that of late years they have traded much upon it and as several spaniards informed me during the last peace they extended their commerce as far as quito and many other places in peru i have insisted the longer on this river because it is of so great fame and may be of mighty advantage for trade end of section five Section 6 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. Account of the River of La Plata. The river of La Plata being the south boundary of Brazil, within the limits of the South Sea Company, and lying conveniently for opening a great trade from the North Sea with Peru, Chile, and other vast countries, 
I shall give a description of it here from the best authors. The first European who discovered it seems to have been Juan Díaz de Solis, who, sailing from Spain in 1512, some say 1515, ran along the coast of Brazil till he came to this river, says Ovalle. With him agree the manuscripts taken on some Spanish priests in this river by Captain Witherington, published in Harrison's Collections, where we are told de Solis obtained the government of this river, but was murdered by the natives with most of his men in 1515. The next who came hither was Sebastian Cabot in 1526, but his men, being mutinous, he had not the desired success, though he sailed 150, some say 200 leagues, up this river, and purchasing many pieces of gold and silver plate from the natives, who called this river Parama, he called it the River of Plate, because he thought it to be the product of the country which was afterwards found to be a mistake. Yet upon his report in 1530, when he returned, the Emperor Charles V sent Don Peter Mendoza, one of his chief grandees, with 2,200 men besides mariners, to plant a colony here in 1535, and they had so great hopes of finding mines of gold and silver that above 30 heirs of noble families went on the expedition, and sailing 50 leagues up the river where the air was good, he founded a town, which from thence was called Buenos Aires. They built a fort and enlarged the town, but as they were carrying on their work, the natives attacked them, and overpowering them with numbers, killed 250, among whom were several of the chief men. This obliged the Spaniards to keep within their fort, where they suffered much by famine. Mendoza returned towards Spain, but died miserably, with many of his companions, for want of provisions by the way. His deputy general, Oyola, sailed up into Paraguay in quest of a country said to abound with gold and silver, but was treacherously slain by the natives with all his followers. Irala, who was his deputy, and left at Buenos Aires, contracted a friendship with some of the natives called Guaranians. In 1538, he built Asuncion in their country, which is now the metropolis of Paraguay, and left Buenos Aires for a time. Asuncion lies on the banks of the river Paraguay, in southern latitude 25, 240 leagues from the sea, and 40 from the mouth of the river Paraguay, where it falls into La Plata. These rivers, after they join, continue their natural color for several miles, La Plata being clear, and Paraguay muddy. The latter is by much the most considerable river, and the adjacent country abounds with mines of gold and silver and is navigable above 200 leagues. The river of Uruguay falls into Paraguay on the right side and runs a course of 300 leagues, according to Sepp the Jesuit, who in his voyage says tis as big as the Danube at Vienna. In short, as to this river La Plata, authors are not agreed. Some of the Jesuits who are missionaries in those countries think it to be the same with that called Paraguay, higher up in the country, and that it has a communication with the northeast coast of Brazil by the river St. Mary, which rises out of the same lake and runs northeast as Paraguay or Plata runs south and afterwards to the southeast, when it falls into the sea. Be that how it will, here are many rivers which fall into the same channel on both sides. But that which is commonly called La Plata begins near the town of that name about south latitude 19, and after running north a little way, takes its course southeast till it join the river Paraguay, so that I choose rather to trust the account given us by Mr. White, our linguist, who, having dwelt long in that country, told me this river derives its name from the town of La Plata, 
a sort of metropolis to which there lies an appeal from other jurisdictions. He adds that tis a pretty town, has fourteen churches with a cathedral and four nunneries, and lies northwest from Buenos Aires about five hundred leagues, which requires commonly two months and a half's travel. All are agreed that La Plata is very large at the mouth, where some account it fifty and others thirty leagues broad. The mouth of it is dangerous because of the sands, and therefore requires pilots. Knivet, in his description of the West Indies, says the best way to avoid those sands is to keep near the north shore till you have come to a high mountain white at top, and then to sail four leagues south to another small hill on the north side, near which you must sail. This brings you into a fair bay, where you must still keep along shore, and after passing the west point of this bay, you come to the river Maror, and then there are no more shoals between that and Buenos Aires. La Plata runs into the sea about south latitude 35, and sometimes overflows the country for several miles, when the natives put their goods into canoes and float about till the inundation assuages, and then they return to their habitations. Ovalle gives the following account of this river, namely, that it runs with such a mighty stream into the sea as makes it fresh for a great way, that the water of this river is very sweet, clears the voice and lungs, and is good against all rooms and defluxions, that the people who dwell about it have excellent voices and are all inclined to music, that it petrifies the branches of trees and other things which fall into it, and that vessels are naturally formed of its sand, which are of various figures, look as if they were polished by art, and keep water very cool. It breeds great store of excellent fish of diverse sorts, and most beautiful birds of all kinds are seen on its banks. Sep informs us that this river and Uruguay abound so with fish that the natives catch great numbers of them without any other instrument than their hands. One of the choicest, called the king's fish, is small without bones and taken only in winter. Our author says he never saw any European fish in this latter except one that the Spaniards called bocado, and that the fish are larger here than ours, of a dark or yellow color and well tasted, which he ascribes to the nature of the water, that though drunk in great quantities, even after raw fruit, helps digestion and never does any hurt. The plains about this river are so large and even, without any obstruction to the sight, that the sun seems to rise and set in them. Their way of traveling in those plains is by high carts covered with hoops and cowhides like our wagons, with conveniency for travelers to sleep in the bottom, which is so much the better because they travel most by night to avoid the heat. They are drawn by oxen, which are frequently so pinched by drought that when they come toward any water which they smell at a great distance, they run furiously to it and drink up the very mud which they raise with their feet. This obliges travelers to furnish themselves with water and other provisions for their journey, there being no water to be had except by rain, so that travelers are frequently as much distressed for want of water as the oxen, and can scarce get any that's clear at the watering places, though they send beforehand, because the oxen run with so much haste to it that they make it all in a puddle. Ovale says, that in this case travellers are forced to stop their noses and shut their eyes when they drink it. The journey through these plains is at least fourteen or twenty days, without any place of shelter or any firing to dress their victuals but the dry dung of cattle. Yet there are several lakes and ponds where inns might be fixed, but tis neglected because there's no settled trade that way. It remains to give some account of the towns upon the river Plata and on the road to Potosi. Number 1. 
Buenos Aires lies upon the river, fifty leagues from the sea, about latitude thirty-six. Our linguist informed me that tis the residence of a Spanish governor, is defended by a stone fort mounted with forty guns, and is generally garrisoned by four or five hundred men. The harbor is pretty good, but troublesome in a northwest and west wind. The river is seven leagues broad there, and navigable by ships sixty leagues above the town, but no further, because of a great cataract. The town has one cathedral and five other churches. The Portuguese had a settlement over against this town, but were dislodged by the Spaniards at the beginning of this war, since which time the French drive a guinea trade hither for Negroes who are sent overland to Peru and Chile and yield them vast profit. The trade from hence to Spain is in hides and tallow, silver from Peru, and gold and silver from Chile. All European goods yield a good price here. They have plenty of fruit trees about the town of all kinds, both of the hot and cold climates, and have store of wheat and other European grain besides Indian corn. Thousands of cattle of all sorts run wild in the neighborhood, and they furnish Peru with 50,000 mules per annum. In short, this place lies very convenient for commerce in silver and gold and the other commodities of Peru and Chile, which the French have now begun to engross. They send three ships to those parts, and the South Sea, under M. de beauchene Gouin of saint malo in 1698, of whose progress I shall give a further account from a copy of his journal as I go on with my description of the coasts. Footnote. Gouin de Bouchen, a captain in the French merchant service, his celebrated voyage occupied nearly three years. End footnote. Their winter here is in May, June, and July, when tis cold by night, but warm enough by day, the frost never being violent, nor the snow considerable in those parts. Father Sepp, who is here in 1691, tells us in his voyage from Spain to Paraguaya, or Paraguay, that Buenos Aires has only two streets built crosswise, that there are four convents, one of which belongs to the Jesuits, that their houses and churches are built of clay and not above one story high, that the Jesuits have taught them of late to burn lime and make tiles and bricks, with which they now begin to build. The castle is likewise of clay encompassed with an earthen wall and a deep trench, and defended by nine hundred Spaniards, though in case of necessity above 30,000 Indian horse might be armed out of the several cantons where they have been trained by the Jesuits. But this boasting account I can't believe. They have in the neighborhood whole woods of peach, almond, and fig trees, which they propagate by putting the kernels in the ground. They grow so fast as to produce fruit the first year, and their timber is used for fuel. The adjacent pastures are so fat and large that many thousands of beeves feed together, so that any one, when he pleases, goes into the field, throws a rope about their horns, and brings them home and kills them. They are very large, generally white, and being so numerous, are valued only for their hides, tallow, and tongues, the rest being exposed to the birds and beasts of prey which are very numerous and frequently destroy the calves. The natives feed most on beef half raw, without bread or salt, and in such quantities that they throw themselves naked into cold water, that they may retain the natural heat within their entrails to help digestion, and sometimes they lie down with their stomachs in hot sand, but their gluttony in devouring so much raw flesh fills them so with worms that they seldom live till fifty years old. There are such numbers of partridges here and so tame that they knock them down with sticks as they walk in the fields. The missionaries, who are absolute masters of the natives in the neighboring cantons of Paraguay and etc., suffer none of them to come nearer Buenos Aires than two or three leagues 
on pretense that they would be corrupted by the ill example of the Spaniards, and under that same pretense they won't suffer the Spaniards to settle in their missions, which extend above two hundred leagues up the river, nor do they allow merchants who trade thither to stay above a few days, the true cause of which is that they are not willing that the laity should be privy to the wealth they heap up there in a country which abounds with gold, nor be witness to their splendid or rather luxurious ways of living. Sometimes complaints of this procedure of the Jesuits have been made to the Spanish governors, but they find a way to bribe them to silence. This I was informed of by those who have been among them, and am confirmed in it by Father Sepp. He does not dissemble that the missionaries have a despotical power over the natives, though he gives it another turn and pretends that tis necessary in order to convert and force them to work. He says the Jesuits are captains, teach them the use of arms and how to drop into squadrons and battalions, which he boasts they do as well as the Europeans. The Jesuits obtained this power on the specious pretense of reducing those Indians to the obedience of the Spaniards, which they would not submit to till within these few years. This management is so much the more easily carried on because the ecclesiastical government there is lodged in the hands of one bishop only and three canons, and the missionaries being composed of all nations, few of them have any natural affection to the Spanish government. This is the more to be observed because the Jesuits, being an intriguing society, and generally in the French interest, it would seem to be the concern of the Allies to recover the trade of those countries from the house of Bourbon with all possible speed. Left by making themselves masters of the vast treasures of Peru and Chile, they be enabled at last to complete their design of an universal monarchy. Father Sepp says that silver in 1691 was cheaper here than iron, that for a twopenny knife one may have a crown, for a hat of two shillings ten or twelve crowns, and for a gun of ten or twelve shillings thirty crowns, that provisions are so plenty here that a fat cow may be bought for the value of ten pence or twelve pence, a good ox for a few needles, a stout horse for about two shillings, that he has seen two given for a knife not worth six pence, and that he and his company had twenty horses for a few trifles that did not cost them a crown, being only a few needles, fish hooks, sorry knives, tobacco, and a little bread. He mentions a cataract in the river Uruguay, which he says Providence has placed here for the advantage of the poor Indians against the avarice of the Spaniards, who not being able to go further with their vessels had been hitherto confined to Buenos Aires and could not settle in those cantons, though very inviting, because of the vast profit they might draw from them. This he reckons a great happiness to the natives, who being a simple people, would not only be infected with the vices of the Spaniards, but enslaved by them, for, says he, they make no difference betwixt pagan and Christian natives, but treat them promiscuously like dogs. He adds that this province of Paraguay or Paraguay exceeds in bigness Germany, France, Italy, and the Netherlands put together, wherein I doubt he exceeds, that they have no cities are governed by eighty colleges of Jesuits in which there are no more than a hundred and sixty persons, and that these colleges are from one hundred to six hundred miles distant from one another. There's one plain of two hundred leagues long betwixt Buenos Aires and Cordoba in Tucuman, without so much as a tree or cottage, and yet it contains the best pastures in the world, filled with cattle of all sorts which have no owners. He describes the natives thus. The men are not quite so tall as Europeans, but have thick legs and large joints. Their faces are round, flattish, and of an olive color, and their arms 
are bows and arrows. Some of the strongest have many scars on their bodies, occasioned by wounds which they gave themselves when young, that these scars may be remaining proofs of their courage. Their hair is black, long, and as strong as that of a horse. The women look more like devils than rational creatures, with their hair loose over their foreheads, and the rest twisted in locks behind, which hang as low as their hips. Their faces are wrinkled, their arms, shoulders, and breasts naked, and their ornaments are of fish bones, made like scales of mother-of-pearl about their necks, arms, and hands. The wives of their caciques, or petty princes, wear a sort of triple crowns of straw. The caciques wear doe-skins hanging over their shoulders, the rest only a piece of skin wrapped around their middle and hanging down before to their knees. The boys and girls are quite naked, they have holes in their ears and shins in which they put fish bones or a colored feather tied by a thread, and feathers of several colors fastened to a string round their necks. They wrap their infants as soon as born in a tiger skin, give them the breast for a little while, and then half raw meat to suck. He says the men at the death of their nearest relations cut off a finger of their own left hand, and if it be a handsome daughter, they make a feast and drink out of her skull. They live in straw huts without roofs, and their utensils are a few sticks for spits and pumpkins hollowed out in which they eat their meats. Their beds are the hides of oxen or tigers spread on the ground, but the caciques and those of note lie in a net fastened to two poles for hammocks at some distance from the ground, being a security against wild beasts and serpents. Our author says that he sent well-boiled meat to several of them when sick, which they received thankfully, but afterwards gave it to their dogs, because they liked their own cookery better. It is now time to see how the missionaries live among those flocks over whom they assume the pastoral care. Father Sepp tells us that he and other new missionaries were welcomed by some of them with twenty musicians in a train. Abundance of boats equipped like galleys lined with firelocks and having drums, trumpets, and oat boy on board. The missionaries brought them sweetmeats and all sort of fruit, and the Indians diverted them by wrestling in the water and salvos of their firearms, etc. They conducted them through a green triumphal arch to the church, where the women were so earnest at their devotion that not one of them cast an eye upon our father and his companions, so that here were a militant and a triumphant church both together. When the devotion was over, the chief of the Indians welcomed the father and the rest of the missionaries by a short but very pathetic speech, and one of the Indian women did the like with wonderful elegancy, says the Jesuit, who it seems is not against women speaking in the church. That and the next day they spent in mirth and jollity, and in the evening were diverted by four dances, one by boys who danced with pikes and lances, two, by a couple of fencing masters, three, by six seamen, four, by six boys on horseback, who afterwards gave them a kind of tournament, the place being illuminated by ox horns filled with suet, for they have no oil nor wax. On Whit Sunday, which happened soon after, the missionaries went to church and returned thanks for so many converts as certainly they had reason, since they were such merry ones. These cantons, he says, are twenty-six, and have but one or two missionaries apiece, though they contained from three thousand to six thousand people each, and sometimes more, so that they must either have too much work, or perform it very slightly, especially if they be so ignorant, as our father says, that if they be neglected one day, they scarce know how to make the sign of the cross the next. And besides all the pastoral work, the missionaries must act the part of clerks and clean the church ornaments and plate, for these poor wretches are incapable of doing it. To be short, says he, the missionary must be cook, nurse, doctor, architect, 
gardener, weaver, smith, painter, baker, potter, tile-maker, and everything else that is necessary in a commonwealth. This, he supposes, will appear incredible, and he's certainly in the right, but he says tis the naked truth, the natives being so stupid that unless he plainly show his Indian cook how much salt he must put in each pot, he would put all into one, though ever so much, and he must see them wash the vessels unless he would be poisoned. Yet this father, for all his other hard work, must look after his garden, orchard, and vineyard, where he has all sorts of flowers, herbs, roots, and fruits, and so many vines as produce five hundred large casks of wine in a year, if not prevented by multitudes of pissmires, wasps, birds, or by the north winds, which sometimes make wine so dear that a cask yields twenty or thirty crowns, and after all tis not to be preserved from turning sour without a great mixture of lime. The chief distemper of the natives is the worms before mentioned, the bloody flux, dysentery, and spotted fever which frequently carry off great numbers. The medicines which the missionaries give against worms is a vomit of tobacco leaves, and after that sour lemon juice with those of mint and rue put into milk. These cantons or towns, he says, are generally upon an ascent near the rivers Uruguay and Paraguay, and contain young and old from 6,000 to 8,000 souls. Each canton has a church and a square marketplace near it, the rest being divided into streets of clay huts covered with straw, only of late they begin to use tiles. They have no windows, chimneys, or different apartments, and over the fireplace they hang their beds at night. Their doors are ox hides, and since all lie together in one room with their dogs, cats, etc., the missionaries are entertained with very ungrateful scents besides smoke when they go to visit them. He says in the main they are very patient under distempers and the death of relations, that they seek after no riches but a present maintenance, that their young women are marriageable at fourteen and the men at sixteen, when the missionaries take care to match them, otherwise they will pair themselves. There are no disputes here about dowries, jointures, or marriage settlements. The agreement consists only in two articles, namely, the woman promises to fetch what water the husband wants from the river, and he engages to provide the kitchen with fuel. The missionaries furnish them with huts, the wedding clothes, and dinner. The wedding suit is five yards of coarse woolen stuff for each, the dinner is a fat cow, and the bed some ox hides. He presents them also with a little salt and a few loaves, and then they treat their parents. The women court here come to the missionary and tell them they have a mind to such a man if he will give his consent, which if he do, the match is made, and the missionary is both priest and father. How mean soever the natives live, the priests have enough of splendor and plenty. Their churches and steeples are lofty, have four or five bells of peace, most of them a couple of organs, altars, and pulpits richly gilt, images well painted, plenty of silver candlesticks, chalices, and other church plate, and the ornaments of the priests and altars are as rich as in Europe. They teach the natives to sing and play on all musical instruments, both for devotion and war, so that according to the Jesuits they go now more merrily to heaven than formerly they did to hell, and the good fathers divert themselves with sets of musicians on the banks of the rivers and in charming islands. Nor can we wonder that they live so merrily, since they fare so well, for besides all sorts of delicious fruits and preserves, they have plenty of fowl, fish, and venison of all sorts, as well as ordinary butcher's meat. Only the tigers, which are very numerous, frequently put in for a share with them, invade their flocks and their followers, but if you'll believe our father, they never attack the clergy. They have such a respect for the cloth, and are so civil to Europeans, that they'll charge the Indians in their company, and let them go scot-free, and the serpents, which likewise abound here, are charmed by Ave Marys, into the like good manners. 
The priests use honey for their salads, for they have no oil, so that they are very hard put to it. They had silver in such plenty, says the father, that old shoes and hats were much more valuable. And as if the missionaries had not work enough otherwise, Father Sepp tells us the natives, when they kill their cows, bring them to the good Jesuits to allow each their share and to be sure the hides fall to the missionaries, for he says the three ships which brought him and his company from Spain carried back three hundred thousand ox hides, which they had for nothing, and each hide, he says, would yield them six crowns at home. A good horseshoe, he says, is here worth six horses, and the bit of a bridle worth three. An ell of linen is worth four or five crowns, for they have no hemp or flax, but store of cotton, and one sheep, lamb, or kid is, for the sake of the wool, worth three oxen or cows. Though the natives, he says, are so dull that they can't do the most frivolous thing without direction, yet they are so good at imitation that if you give them models, they will make anything very well. Thus, he says, the Indian women, after ripping a piece of bone lace with a needle, will make one by the same pattern very exactly. And so the men do trumpets, oat boys, organs, or watches, and copy pictures, printing, and writing to admiration. But they are so lazy that they must be forced to their work by blows at the direction of the missionaries, who, though they convert them themselves, make them cudgel one another. This they take very patiently, give no ill language, but cry, Jesu Maria, and thank the good fathers into the bargain for taking such care of them, so that they have learnt passive obedience to perfection. But to make them amends, our author says the missionaries teach their young ones to dance as well as to sing in the church, when they are habited in rich apparel, so that they are extremely taken with the ornaments of our religion, says he, which raises in them a high esteem and affection, and indeed t'would be a wonder if it should not. The missionaries do now take care to instruct both sexes in all necessary employments, reading, writing, etc. They have also taught them to make images, especially of Our Lady of Ottigan, and very good reason, for if we believe Sep, she has done abundance of miracles there. The fathers wear caps like a bishop's and black linen cassocks when they go abroad, and instead of canes use crosses, which have a peculiar virtue to knock serpents on the head. The soil is so fruitful that it produces a hundredfold, though sorely manured. The natives sow nothing but turkey wheat, and scarce enough of that they are so lazy, and are likewise such bad husbands that they would eat all at once did not the missionary force them to lay it up in his barn, where he distributes it to them as they want, and so he does their flesh. They have no mills but pround their wheat in a mortar and make it into cakes which they bake on coals or boil with their meat. The fathers have white bread for themselves which the natives value so much that they will give two or three horses for a loaf, and of these the missionaries have good store, for they have always forty or fifty acres sowed with wheat for themselves. Land, corn, cattle, and everything is theirs, so that they call all the people their sons and daughters, and perhaps there is just cause enough to give many of them that title. These lords, proprietors, assign every family their number of cows and oxen to till their ground and to eat, though one would think they might have enough for the taking, without asking anybody's leave. And yet our father says he has been forced to chide his parishioners for killing and eating their oxen and roasting them with their wooden ploughs in the very field while they were tilling the ground, for which they pleaded in excuse that they and their wives were hungry and weary, and yet there was no great reason for the latter, since their ploughs, says our author, don't enter above three inches into the ground. They need no hay for their cattle since they go up to the knees in grass all the year. This is the way of living in those cantons, which the missionaries call reductions, because, if you'll believe me, they have reduced them to Christianity by their preaching, 
though the Spaniards could never do it by their arms. Our linguist told me that the road from Buenos Aires to Chile is only passable in the summer months when commodities are purchased at that town and transported by land to Chile. On that road, about a hundred leagues northwest from Buenos Aires, lies the city of Cordova, which is the see of a bishop, has ten churches and a university. "'Twas founded in 1573, says Father Techo, by a native of Cordova in Old Spain, when there were sixty thousand archers reckoned in its territory, about eight thousand of whom continued in subjection, but the others revolted. "'Tis now the metropolis of the province, and the Jesuits have a chapel in their college there, which for riches and beauty may vie with the best in Europe. The natives of this country were very barbarous, made use of sorcery to satisfy their revenge, and of filters of their own blood to gratify their lust. Both sexes daubed their faces with strange colors, and each village was governed by a sorcerer who pretended to be their physician. To show their courage, they would draw arrows through the skins of their bellies, and they fought duels with sharp stones standing foot to foot and holding down their heads to receive the blows from one another by turns. He that struck first was reckoned the most fearful. It was accounted disgraceful to dress their wounds, and the conqueror was applauded by hideous shouts from the spectators, "'Twas a long time before the missionaries could reform those barbarous customs. "'Another town on this road is Mendoza, "'where they make large quantities of wine, brandy, and oil. "'So much for that part of this vast country "'which lies toward Chile and Brazil. "'I shall next come to that part which lies toward Peru, "'and particularly the road to Potosí and the mines.' Santa Fe is the next Spanish settlement of note to Buenos Aires, from which it lies eighty leagues northwest at the mouth of a river which falls into La Plata. The country betwixt this town and Buenos Aires is fruitful, well inhabited by Spaniards and Indians, and produces wheat from forty to an hundredfold and abounds with cattle. The town is encompassed with a river and built of brick. Our prisoners and linguists told us that there are mines of gold and silver in the neighborhood, but the Spaniards don't care to open them, because the conveniency of sailing up the river might encourage enemies to invade and take them from them. This town was built by the Spaniards when they first settled for the defense of this river. St. Juago de Listero, 200 leagues northwest from Santa Fe, is a pretty town governed by a corregidor, has three churches and lies on the river that runs down to Santa Fe. Hither the plate is brought from Potosí on mules, because the roads are bad, and from hence it is carried to Buenos Aires by wagons. Next to this town lies San Miguel de Toloman, 200 leagues northwest, then Salta, 150 leagues. This town contains six churches, then Ahui, fifty leagues further, which has five churches. Potosí is next, lies north of the Tropic of Capricorn, about south latitude 21, longitude 73. Our linguist tells us the city is large, has ten churches governed by an archpriest. The town stands at the bottom of that called the Silver Hill, which is round like a sugar loaf. There are 1,500 or 2,000 Indians constantly at work in the mines there. They have two reals a day and are paid every Sunday. The mines are a hundred fathom deep, and the silver is grown much scarcer of late. Provisions are scarce at this town, and they have no firing but charcoal, which is brought from 30 to 50 leagues distance. They have great frosts and snows here in May, June, and July. Knivet, in his remarks, says in his time they were well supplied here with all things from the South Sea, and that the natives in the adjoining country trafficked in gold and precious stones, and hundreds of them plied upon the road to carry passengers from town to town in nets fastened to canes, 
and supported by two or more men, which was the easiest way of traveling, and they desired no other reward but a fish hook and a few glass beads. They have also sheep of an extraordinary size with large tails, upon which they carry jars of oil and wine. He says the rich ore, when taken out of these mines, looks like black lead. Then they grind it by certain engines and wash it through fine sieves into paved cisterns. They make the Indians and other slaves work quite naked in the mines that they mayn't hide anything. The curious who would know more of the manners of the natives or the history and particular product of this large country may find it in Gemelli, Father Sepp, and Father Techo, but this is enough for my purpose to show what a vast field of trade may be opened here and how dangerous it may prove to all Europe if the house of Bourbon continue possessed of that trade. Some being of opinion that our South Sea Company may possess themselves by virtue of the late act of the river de la Plata as far up that river and country as they please, either in the provinces of Paraguay or Tucuman, I shall give a further description of those large provinces after taking notice that according to several of our drafts, Paraguay lies both on the east and west side of the river La Plata, according to others entirely on the east side, and Tucuman on the west side. The Sansons make Paraguay 720 miles from south to north, and 480 where broadest from east to west, and place it betwixt south latitude 14 and 24, longitude 315 and 325, but the breadth is not equal. Father Techo says that the river Paraguay, which gives name to the country, is one of the greatest in America, receives several other large rivers, runs 300 leagues before it falls into the Paraná, about 200 from the sea, is navigable, and together with the Paraná forms the river La Plata. The word Paraguay, in the language of the country, signifies the crowned river, because the inhabitants wear crowns of feathers of several beautiful colors, which they have from the birds that abound in that country. I shall not insist upon the several nations that inhabit it, among whom the Garanians are the chief, and submitted first to the Spaniards, but growing weary of the slavery they subjected them to, revolted, and were with much difficulty subdued after their leaders were cut off, about 1539. The chief discovery of this country is owing to Dominic Irala, who in the reign of the Emperor Charles V was sent by the governor Alvaro Nunez Cabega y Baca with 300 chosen men and went 250 leagues up this river to endeavor a communication with Peru, but was opposed by some of the natives, of whom 4,000 were killed and 3,000 taken in battle. The governor went afterwards on the discovery himself, and sailing up the river came to a delicious island, which his men called Paradise, and would have settled there, but he dissuaded them, and advancing to the borders of Peru found a large town of 8,000 houses deserted by the inhabitants, who were affrighted with the noise of the Spanish firearms. Tis said they found in this town a great market-place with a wooden tower in the form of a pyramid built in the middle, and a monstrous serpent kept in it, by which the devil pronounced oracles. This serpent they killed with their firearms. But a difference happening betwixt the officers and soldiers about dividing the booty, they returned to Assumption without pursuing the discovery any further. This province, till that of Tucuman was taken from it, contained all the country betwixt Brazil and Peru. Our author adds that besides the towns above mentioned, the Spaniards built here Corrientes on the conflux of the Paraguay and Paraná, which is but a small town, no way suited to the dignity of these two rivers. That one hundred leagues up the Paraná, in the province of Huirana, the Spaniards built two little towns called Villarica and Guarica. That on the upper part of the Paraguay they built 
Zires, and another, Villarica, to join Paraguay on that side to the further provinces, and lastly the city of Concepcion on the marshes of the Red River, which falls into Paraná, and was of great use to curb the fierce nations in the neighborhood. He adds that all these towns were first planted by a race of the noblest families in Spain. He mentions an extraordinary herb here called Paraguay by the name of the country. It grows in marshy grounds, and the leaves being dried and powdered, and mixed with warm water, the Spaniards and natives drink it several times a day, which makes them vomit and strengthens their appetite. They look upon it as a sort of catolican, use it so much that they can't live without it, and this custom has so much overspread the neighboring provinces that the inhabitants will sell anything to purchase it, though the excessive use of it occasions the same distempers as the immoderate use of wine. They did so fatigue the natives to gather and powder this herb that multitudes of them died, in this with other slavish employments did much dispeople the country. The natives live mostly by fishing, hunting, and shooting. Tucuman is three hundred leagues long, but varies much in breadth. Tis inhabited by four nations. The furthest south have no fixed dwellings, live by fishing and hunting, and carry about mats to serve them for tents. The north people live in marshes and feed most on fish. The southern people are the tallest, but the northern the fiercest, and many of them live in caves, but those nearest Peru in villages. They are all very slothful and have store of brass and silver, but make little use of them. They have large sheep which carry their burdens, and their wool is almost as fine as silk. They have many lions, not so large and fierce as those of Africa, but their tigers are fiercer than those of other countries. Their two chief rivers are Dulce and Salado, so called from the sweet and salt taste of their waters. They have multitudes of springs and lakes, some of which have a petrifying quality. The country was formerly very populous, but their numbers are much decreased since the Spaniards planted among them. They easily subdue this country, which was governed by abundance of petty princes continually at war with one another. This province was first discovered in 1530 by one Cesar, a soldier belonging to Sebastian Cabot, and three more at the time when Pizarro took Atabilipa, the great Inga of Peru. In 1540, the viceroy of Peru, Vaca de Castro, assigned this country to John Rojas as a reward for his services. He went thither with 200 Spaniards, but was killed on the frontiers by a poisoned arrow, and his men, under Francis Mendoza, marched through to the River of Plate. Mendoza being killed as going up that river by mutineers, John Nunez Prada was sent hither by the viceroy Peter Gasca, subdued the Indians, built the town of San Michel on the banks of River Escava, and settled friars there. This province was afterwards subjected to Chile, and Francis d'Aquire, being sent thither with two hundred Spaniards, destroyed St. Michel, and built St. Hago, now the metropolis of Tucuman, on the river Dulce, in southern latitude 28, says Techo, but others place it on the river Salado. Tis the same town I have already described. In 1558, Tarita, being made governor of this province, built the city of London, near the borders of Chile, about latitude 29, calling it so out of compliment to Queen Mary of England, at that time married to Philip II of Spain. This town served to curb the natives. Tarita did likewise rebuild San Michel and reduced the country so much that 80,000 Indians who submitted to Spain were mustered in the territory of San Hago. The Spaniards, as was usual in those days, fighting with one another about the command of the provinces, Tarita was drove out in 1561 by Castaneda so that most of the natives revolted till 1563 that Francis d'Aquire reduced them again and built Esteco 
above mentioned. But the Spaniards contending afterwards with one another about the government, many of their settlements were destroyed, so that in Techo's time the chief places remaining in this country were San Hago, Cordoa, San Michel, Salta, or Lerma, Zuzui, or San Salvador, Rioja, Esteco, or Nuestro Señor de Talavera, London, and a few other small garrisons. He says that in this country it does not rain in winter, but in summer they have thick mists and rains enough. The Jesuits are the chief missionaries here and settled in the principal towns. He adds that near the city Concepcion, which is ninety leagues from San Hago, the natives were called frontones because they made the fore part of their heads bald. Their arms were a club at their girdle, bows and arrows and staves set with jawbones of fishes. They went naked and painted their bodies to make them look terrible. They were continually at war among themselves about the limits of their land, and they fixed the bodies of their slain enemies in rows to the trunks of trees that others might be afraid of invading their borders. He adds that the country about St. Michel is well peopled, abounds with woods and all sorts of European and other fruits, so that it was called the land of promise, but they are much infested with tigers which the natives kill with great dexterity. Guaira, a province of Paraguay, is very hot, because for the most part under the Tropic of Capricorn, is very fruitful, but subject to fevers and other diseases. Yet when the Spaniards came hither in 1550, they are said to have found 300,000 people in this country, but they say there's scarce a fifth part of that number now, and the natives are very miserable, having no meat but the flesh of wild beasts, nor bread but what they make of the root mandiosa. There are stones here which breed in an oval stone case about the bigness of a man's head. Our author says they lie underground, and when they come to maturity, break with a noise like bombs and scatter abundance of beautiful stones of all colors, which at first the Spaniards took to be of great value, but did not find them so. The other remarkable product of this country is a flower called granadillo, which the Jesuit says represents the instrument of our Savior's passion and produces a fruit as big as a common egg, the inside of which is very delicious. Number two, a fruit called huembe, which is very sweet, but has yellow kernels, which if chewed occasions a sharp pain in the jaws. Number three, dates of which they make wine and pottage. Number four, wild swine which have their navel on their backs, and if not cut off immediately when the beast is killed, corrupts the whole carcass. Number five, abundance of wild bees, several sorts of which yield store of honey and wax. Number six, snakes which dart from the trees and twist themselves about men and beasts and soon kill them if they are not immediately cut in pieces. Number seven, Macaqua birds, so-called because of an herb which they eat as an antidote when hurt by snakes, which lie and watch for them in the marshes. They frequently fight those snakes for which nature has provided them with sharp beaks for a weapon and strong wings to serve them as a buckler. Our author mentions the river Paranapan, which runs through this country, is almost as large as the Paraguay and falls into the Paraná. Its banks on both sides are covered with tall trees, especially cedars, of so vast a bulk that they make canoes out of a single trunk, which row with twenty oars. The Jesuits built the town of Loreto and Santa Ignatius, and two more near the conflux of this river and the Pirapus, about 1610, and eleven more have since been built in that province, where they have brought over many of the inhabitants to their religion. They killed many of the Spaniards at first, and then at them. These towns are placed by the Sansons about latitude 22, and betwixt longitude 325 and 330. Our author, not being distinct in describing the provinces of Paraguay and Tucuman, but sometimes confounding one with the other, I shall only add a few things more relating to those countries in general. He mentions a people called Waikurians, 
who live on the banks of Paraguay near the city Asuncion, maintain themselves by fishing and hunting, and eat all manner of serpents and wild beasts without hurt. They have tents of mats which they remove at pleasure. They daub one side of their bodies with stinking colors, scarify their faces to make them look terrible, suffer no hair to grow on their bodies, and instead of a beard, fasten a stone of a finger's length to their chin, and make their deformity the standard of their valor. Their chief delight is in drunkenness and war, and to acquire the title and dignity of soldiers, they must endure to have their legs, thighs, tongues, etc., bored with an arrow, and if they flinch in the least, are not allowed that quality, and therefore they inure their children from their youth to all sorts of hardship, and to run thorns and briars into their flesh by way of pastime. They honor their commander so much that when they spit, they receive it into their hands and stand about them when they eat and observe all their motions. They chose to fight by night because they knew nothing of order, but made their onsets like beasts. They either killed or sold their prisoners, if at man's estate, and the young ones they bred to their own way. They lurked in marshes and woods by day, keeping spies abroad, and thus they plagued the Spaniards for above a hundred years, till they were civilized by some missionaries. They would not allow their women to paint with a clay color till they had tasted human flesh, and therefore when they killed enemies would divide them among the young women, or give them the corpse of their own dead. They planted trees over their graves, adorned them with ostrich feathers, and met there at certain times howling in a most barbarous manner, and performing many lewd and hellish ceremonies. They worship parrots as gods and have a sort of bears called ant bears. They have long heads, snouts much longer than those of swine, and tongues like spears, which they thrust into the ant hills and lick up those insects which are as big as the top of one's finger, and being toasted over the fire are et by the natives and Spaniards too as a dainty. Father Techo mentions another people called Kalkaquins in this country, whom he supposes to have been of Jewish descent, because when the Spaniards came first here, they found that many of them had Jewish names and something of their habit and customs. Our author draws a parallel in several instances, but this as well as his arguments to prove that St. Thomas the Apostle planted Christianity in this country will scarce obtain credit among the learned. I refer the curious who would know more of these things to our author, who brings down what he calls the history of this country as low as 1645, which is the latest account we have yet printed, except Father Sepp's above mentioned, which brings it to 1691, of which I have given the substance already. Before I go further, I should give some account of the river Orinoco, or Orinoco, which is the northern boundary of our South Sea Company's limits. The head of it, according to our maps, is about north latitude 3 and in longitude 77. It runs eastward about 840 miles, about 60 miles north of the equator, then runs north about 420, and turning northeast about 120, falls into the sea about north latitude 9 so that its whole course is about 1,370 miles, including turnings and windings, for it runs almost the whole breadth of that part of America, since it rises within 160 miles of the South Sea. Mr. Sparry, who was left in the adjoining country by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1595, footnote, Francis Sparry, servant to one of Raleigh's captains, was left in Guiana in 1595. Eventually captured by the Spaniards, he escaped to England in 1602. Raleigh spoke of him as a man who could describe a country with a pen, and his description of Guiana is included in Volume 4 of Purchase Pilgrims, 1625. End footnote. He said it is also called Betacuan, is a great river, and others call it Parie. It falls into the sea by sixteen mouths, but according to Sanson's map, what Spari calls mouths are a number of islands which lie near the shore at the entrance of the river, and the chief of those mouths, named Kapuri, lies furthest south. 
They say it has nine foot water at full sea, but five at ebb. It flows but a small time when it rises apace, and the ebb continues eight hours. There are several other ways of entering this river, for which I refer to Spari, as also for the other rivers which fall into it on both sides. He attempted a passage to Peru this way, but in vain. He says that in his search he entered the great river Papemena, which is six leagues broad, and came to a pleasant island called Atul, where the climate is temperate. The island is well watered and abounds with fish, fowls, and other animals for food. It has many woods that abound with delicate fruit all the year. There is store of cotton, balsam, Brazil wood, lignum vitae, cypress trees, several minerals, and fine stones, but for want of skill he could not judge of the value of them. This island was not then inhabited because of the cannibals named Caribes in the neighborhood. He is of opinion that westward from Orinoco gold might be found, but it was dangerous to go far into the country because the natives were continually in arms. He adds that in the country of Curay, part of the province of Guiana, which lies on the south and east of Orinoco, there was plenty of gold, but it was dangerous seeking for it in the sands of the rivers because of crocodiles. He talks also of pearl or topazes found here, but dubiously. At Kamalaha, south of Orinoco, he says there was then a fair for women slaves, where he bought eight for a coarse red-hafted knife, the eldest of whom was not above eighteen years old. The inhabitants, he says, are generally swarthy. We have few modern accounts of this river because it is not much frequented for trade, and therefore I shall say no more of it, but return to my journal. End of section 6《Section 7 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand — A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers — From Grande to Juan Fernandez — Nothing remarkable happened till December 6th, when we had close cloudy weather with showers wind at east by north. We saw a large bird called Alcatross, who spread their wings from eight to ten foot wide and are much like a gannet. December 7th, rainy weather with thunder and lightning, a brisk gale from east by north to northeast. This day I removed one of the boatswain's mates and put Robert Hollenby, one of our best sailors, in his place. December 10th, yesterday I exchanged Benjamin Long, one of the boatswain's mates, with Thomas Hughes, boatswain's mate on board the Duchess. He being mutinous there, they were willing to be rid of him. December 13th. We had a strong gale of wind at southwest. Yesterday in the afternoon we reefed our main sail, which was the first time since we left England. December 15th. The color of the water being changed very much, we founded but had no ground, so that this change is probably occasioned by the nature of the ground at bottom. We find it much colder in this latitude, which is 43 degrees 30 minutes south, than in the like degree north, though the sun was in its furthest extent to the southward, which may be ascribed partly to our coming newly out of warmer climates, which made us more sensible of the cold, or it is probable the winds blow over larger tracts of ice than in the same degrees of north latitude. December 18th, cold, hazy, rainy weather. Yesterday in the afternoon, one of the Duchess's men fell out of his mizzen top down on the quarter deck and broke his skull. They desired the advice of our surgeon, and I went on board with our two, where they examined the wound but found the man irrecoverable, so that he died and was buried next day. Brisk gales from the west northwest to the west by south. December 19th. Cold, airy weather. We saw several grampuses and a great number of uncommon sort of porpoises, black on their back and fins, and white underneath with sharp white noses. They often leaped a good height out of the water, turning their white bellies uppermost. They were much of the shape and bigness of our porpoises. 
we also saw many seals december twentieth this day according to what our committee agreed at grande we exchanged mr van brew for mr bath agent of the duchess easy gales of wind but very veerable this morning at four we had a very thick fog when we were caught in the stays and lost sight of the duchess though we made all the noise agreed on between us at nine o'clock it cleared up being very little wind and we were within a league of them december twenty first easy gales of wind but very veerable we have seen a great deal of rock weed for some days past of a great length and generally round in large branches latitude forty eight degrees fifty minutes south december twenty second fair weather with rain wind very veerable the water is generally discolored we had a good observation latitude forty nine degrees thirty two minutes south december twenty second at ten this morning we saw land bearing south southeast distant nine leagues it appeared first in three afterwards in several more islands at twelve it bore south one half west the west end distant six leagues a long tract of land we saw most of that which appeared at first to be islands join with the lowlands the wind being westerly and blowing fresh we could not weather it but was forced to bear away and run along shore from three to four leagues distant it lay as near as we could guess east northeast and west southwest this is falkland's land described in few draughts and none lay it down right though the latitude agrees pretty well the middle of it lies in latitude fifty one degrees zero minutes south and i make the longitude of it to be about sixty one degrees fifty four minutes west from london the two islands extend about two degrees in length as near as i could judge by what i saw december twenty fourth last night we reefed both courses it blowing strong lay by from eight till three in the morning with our heads to northward wind at west by south because we could not tell how far falkland islands ran to eastward between two and three o'clock yesterday in the afternoon we ran by a high round large white remarkable rock which appeared by itself near three leagues without the land which is not unlike portland but not so high and the rock like that called the fast nest to the westward of cape clear in ireland at four yesterday in the afternoon the northeast end bore southeast by south seven leagues the white rock bore south three leagues at six the eastermost land in sight bore southeast seven leagues all this land appeared with gentle descents from hill to hill and seemed to be good ground with woods and harbors at three o'clock we made sail steering southeast latitude fifty two degrees south december twenty fifth yesterday noon we saw the land again and find it to trim away southerly from the white rock a strong gale of wind at southwest at six o'clock in the evening we lost sight of the land but could not come near enough to see if it was inhabited and spied a sail under our lee bow bearing southeast from us distant about four leagues we immediately let our reefs out chased and got ground of her apace we kept sight till ten at night when we lost her we spoke with our consort and were both of the opinion that the chase would as soon as she lost sight of us if homeward bound bear away to the northward so we ran north till dawning then we stood to the westward till it was light and our consort kept on with an easy sail when it was full light we saw nothing being thick hazy weather we bore away and were with our consort again by five o'clock between six and seven it cleared up we saw the chase bearing about south by east between three and four leagues from us it falling calm we both got out our oars rowed and towed with our boats ahead and made pretty good way had a small breeze at north so we set all the sail we could and by twelve o'clock had gained very much ground of the chase we had an observed latitude fifty two degrees forty minutes december twenty sixth we kept on rowing and towing till about six in the evening and perceiving we approached her i went in the boat to speak with captain courtney and agree how to engage her if a great ship as she appeared to be and also adjusted signals if either of us should find it proper to board her in the night I returned aboard as soon as possible when we had a fine breeze we got in our boats and oars and made all possible sail after the chase kept in sight of her till past ten o'clock bearing south southwest of us when it came on thick again we kept her open on the larboard and the duchess on the starboard bow and being short nights we thought it impossible to lose one another 
at one o'clock this morning my officers persuaded me to shorten sail telling me we should lose our consort if we kept on i was prevailed with to do so and in the morning had a very thick fog so that i could see neither our consort nor chase till an hour after twas full light but when it cleared up we saw our consort on our larboard bow we fired a gun for her to bear down but immediately we saw the chase ahead of her about four miles which gave us new life we forthwith hailed up for them but the wind soon veering ahead had a great disadvantage in the chase we ran at a great rate being smooth water but it coming on to blow more and more the chase outbore our consort so she gave off and being to windward came down very melancholy to us supposing the chase to have been a french homeward bound ship from the south seas thus this ship escaped which considering that we always outwent her before is as strange as our first seeing of her in this place because all ships that we have heard of bound out or home this way kept within falklands island at twelve o'clock we saw a little plain low island which bore west northwest distant four leagues not marked in any of our charts the wind has been very veerable since six o'clock last night from the north northeast to the south where it now is latitude fifty three degrees eleven minutes south december twenty second strong gales with squalls from the south to the west the duchess put her guns into the hold again that she took up in the chase yesterday at two in the afternoon we put about and stood off to the eastward from the little low island because we could but just weather it we were not willing to come too near it latitude fifty four degrees fifteen minutes south december thirtieth fresh gales of wind at west hazy weather mixed with small rain we had an observed latitude fifty eight degrees twenty minutes january one fresh gales of wind from the west northwest to the west southwest with fogs but indifferent smooth water this being new year's day every officer was wished a merry new year by our music and i had a large tub of punch hot upon the quarter-deck where every man in the ship had above a pint to his share and drank our owners and friends healths in great britain to a happy new year a good voyage and a safe return we bore down to our consort and gave them three huzzas wishing them the like january second fresh gales from the west southwest to the northwest with fogs clothes and liquor were now an excellent commodity amongst our ship's company who are but meanly stored we had six tailors at work for several weeks to make them clothing and pretty well supplied their wants by the spare blankets and red clothes belonging to the owners and what every officer could spare was altered for the men's use the like was done on board the duchess january fifth just past twelve yesterday it came on to blow strong we got down our foreyard and reefed our foresail and mainsail but there came a violent gale of wind and a great sea a little before six we saw the duchess lowering her main yard the tack flew up and the lift unreeved so that the sail to the leeward was in the water and all aback their ship took in a great deal of water to leeward immediately they loosed their spirit sail and wore her before the wind I wore after her and came as near as I could to them, expecting when they had gotten their main sail stowed, they would take another reef in, and bring to again under a two-reefed mainsail, and reefed and balanced mizzen, if the ship would not keep to without it. But to my surprise, they kept scudding to the southward. I dreaded running amongst ice, because it was excessive cold, so I fired a gun as a signal for them to bring to, and brought to ourselves again under the same reefed main sail they kept on and our men on the lookout told me they had an ensign in their main top mast shrouds as a signal of distress which made me doubt they had sprung their main mast so i wore again our ship working exceeding well in this great sea just before night i was up with them again and set our foresail twice reefed to keep em company which i did all night about three this morning it grew more moderate we soon after made a signal to speak with them and at five they brought two when i came within hail i inquired how they all did aboard they answered they had shipped a great deal of water in lying by and were forced to put before the wind and the sea had broke in the cabin windows and over their stern filling their steerage and waist and had like to have spoiled several men but god be thanked all was otherwise indifferent well with them only they were intolerably cold and everything wet at ten we made sail wind at west northwest and moderate latitude sixty degrees fifty eight minutes january sixth 
raw cold weather with some rain a great sea from the northwest little wind from the north northwest to the west i and captain dampier went in the yawl on board the duchess to visit em after this storm where we found em in a very orderly pickle with all their clothes drying the ship and rigging covered with them from the deck to the main top they got six more guns into the hold to make the ship lively january seventh fresh gales of wind with hazy weather and some small rain yesterday about three in the afternoon john vale a landman died having lain ill a fortnight and had a swelling in his legs ever since he left grande at nine last night we buried him this is the first that died by sickness out of both ships since we left england several of the duchess's men had contracted illnesses by the wet and cold wind from the north northwest to the west northwest january tenth strong gales of wind with squalls of rain and hail and a great sea from the west we lay by with our head to the southward till twelve last night then came to sail under three reefed courses and sometimes the main top sail low set wind from the west to the north and thence to the northwest we have no night here latitude sixty one degrees fifty three minutes longitude west from london seventy nine degrees fifty eight minutes being the furthest we run this way and for aught we know the furthest that any one has yet been to the southward january fourteenth moderate gales with cloudy weather wind veerable this day the duchess buried a man that died of the scurvy january fifteenth cloudy weather with squalls of rain fresh gales at southwest we had an observed latitude fifty six degrees south we now account ourselves in the south sea being got round cape horn the french ships that came first to trade in these seas came through the straits of magellan but experience has taught them since that it is best passage to go around cape horn where they have sea room enough the straits being in many places very narrow with strong tides and no anchor ground here i think it proper to give an account of the first discovery of the south sea of the passage to it by the straits of magellan of the chief of those who have passed those straits and a short description of the country on both sides of them an account of the discovery of the south sea and of the straits of magellan etc from ovale and other authors the first european who discovered the south sea was bosco or vasco nunez de balboa a spaniard in fifteen thirteen he was the first who landed on the isthmus of darien and made war with the caiques or princes who not being able to resist his firearms and perceiving that the chief design of the spaniards was to find gold one of the caiques told vasco that since they were so fond of that which he and his countryman valued so little would he conduct them over the mountains to another sea upon which they might find a country where the people had all their utensils of gold this was the first notice the spaniards had of the south sea vasco marched on till he came near the top of the highest mountain where he ordered his men to halt because he would have the honor of first discovering that sea himself which having done he fell down on his knees and thanked god for his success and called it the south sea in opposition to that on the other side of the continent having passed these mountains he marched down till he came to the coast and took possession of it in the name of the king of spain when he returned back he found a new spanish governor in darien called pedrerias who being his enemy because he envied the king's making him governor and admiral of the south sea he falsely accused him of treason and cut off his head and sent gaspar morales and francis pizarro to complete the discovery with a good number of men and large dogs that were as terrible to the indians as the spaniards firearms here they discovered the isle of pearls and forced the natives to fish for them then discovered the rest of the coast the first who found a passage from the north sea was ferdinand magellans who in fifteen nineteen sailed on purpose by commission from the emperor charles v to discover it in latitude fifty two degrees south he found the passage which from him has been since called the straits of magellan pegafetta an italian who made the voyage with him says that in south latitude forty nine and a half degrees at port st julian they found giants whose waist a middle-sized man could scarce reach with his head they were clad with the skins of beasts as monstrous as themselves armed with huge bows and arrows and of a strength proportional to their bulk yet good-natured one of them seeing himself in a looking-glass on board the ship was so frightened that he runned backwards and tumbled down several men that stood behind him 
the crew gave toys to some of them at which being mightily pleased they suffered them to put shackles about their arms and legs which they took for ornaments but when they found themselves fast bellowed like bulls one of them he says made his escape from nine men after they had got him down and tied his hands other voyagers say they have seen such giants in these parts particularly mr candish sebald de vert in fifteen ninety nine and spielberg in sixteen fourteen but the reader may believe of this story what he pleases pigafetta says the straits were one hundred ten leagues long in some places very wide and in others not above a half league over magellan's passed them in november fifteen twenty and being overjoyed he called the cape from whence he first saw the south sea the cape of desire after rambling almost four months in the south sea where he suffered extreme want and lost many of his men he sailed to the ladrones islands and foolishly engaging seven thousand natives in mathen which is one of them he was killed one of his ships forsook him as he passed the straits and returned to spain of the other four only the ship victoria returned to st lucar near seville under the command of john sebastian cabot who was nobly rewarded by the emperor in fifteen thirty nine alonso de camargo a spaniard passed the same straits and arrived at the port of arequipa in peru but much shattered having lost one of his ships and another leaving him returned to spain after him several other spaniards passed the same way and they planted a colony and garrison at the north end to block up the passage to other nations but without success the garrison being all starved or destroyed by the indians on the fifteenth of november fifteen seventy seven the famous sir francis drake set out from plymouth with five sail and having touched at several places by the way entered the straits the twenty first of august following he found them very dangerous because of the many turnings contrary winds and sudden blasts from high mountains covered with snow on both sides and their tops reaching above the clouds and no anchoring but in some narrow river or creek the twenty fourth he came to an island in the straits where there were so many fowls called penguins that his men killed three thousand in a day which served them for provisions the sixth of september he entered the south sea where he met with dreadful storms and one of his ships was drove back into the straits through which she returned to england as sir francis drake did july twenty fourth fifteen eighty being the first sea captain that ever sailed round the world and brought his ship home which was accounted a great honor to the english nation july first fifteen eighty six mr thomas candish afterwards sir thomas sailed from plymouth with three ships and the sixth of january after entered the straits having met with a severe storm near the mouth of them he took the remainders of a spanish garrison there who from four hundred were reduced to twenty-three by famine and those of king philip's city which had been built in the straits were in the same miserable condition so that they abandoned the place they found cannibals in some part of the straits who had eat many of the spaniards and designed the like to the english had they not been kept off by their guns mr candish was stopped here a considerable while by a furious storm and bad weather which reduced him to want of provisions till the twenty fourth of february that he got into the south sea and bought provisions of the indians mr candish returned to england after having sailed round the world the ninth of september next year he again attempted the passage of the same straits in fifteen ninety one but without success as mr fenton did in fifteen eighty two as floris did at the same time the earl of cumberland in fifteen eighty six mr chidley in fifteen eighty nine and mr wood in fifteen ninety six sir richard hawkins passed them in fifteen ninety three but was taken by the spaniards and mr davis the discoverer to the northwest passed and repassed those straits but was forced back by contrary winds so that our countrymen though they did not all succeed in the attempt yet have been the most fortunate in passing them of any other nation for the dutch passed them in fifteen ninety seven with five ships of which only one returned five other dutch ships passed them in sixteen fourteen when they lost one of them in sixteen twenty three the dutch nassau fleet so called because the prince of orange was the greatest adventurer attempted it with fifteen brave ships and two or three thousand men but were repulsed wherever they came to land by the spaniards so that they could not settle there other nations attempted it likewise and particularly don garcia de loaisa a knight of malta and a spaniard with seven ships and four hundred fifty men and though he passed the straits he died himself and all his ships were afterwards taken by the portuguese or others 
Vargas, bishop of Placentia, sent seven ships to attempt it, one of which only succeeded, and went to Arequipa, a port on the South Sea, and discovered the situation of the coast of Peru, but went no further. Ferdinand Cortes, the conqueror of New Spain, sent two ships and four hundred men in 1528 to discover the way to the Malugas, through the straits, but without success. Two Genoese ships were the first that attempted it in 1526, after Magellan, but could not effect it. Sebastian Cabot tried it also by commission from Don Emmanuel, king of Portugal, but could not do it. Americus Vespusius was sent by the same prince, but could neither find the straits nor the river of La Plata. Simon Alcazara, a Spaniard, attempted it likewise with several ships and 440 men, but came back without performing it, his men having mutinied. All these attempts by the Spaniards, etc., happened before Sir Francis Drake performed it. In the reports made of those straits upon oath to the Emperor Charles V, those who attempted this passage give the following account, viz., that from the Cape of Eleven Thousand Virgins at the entrance of the North Sea to the Cape of Desire at the entrance of the South Sea, it is one hundred Spanish leagues, that they found in this strait three great bays of about seven leagues wide from land to land, but the entrance is not above half a league, and encompassed with such high mountains that the sun never shines in them, so that they are intolerably cold, there being a continual snow, and the nights very long that they found good water with cinnamon trees and several others, which, though they look green, burnt in the fire like dry wood, that they found many good sorts of fish, good harbors with fifteen fathom water, and several pleasant rivers and streams, that the tides of both seas meet about the middle of the straits with a prodigious noise and shock. But some of the Portuguese who had passed the straits say they are only high floods which last about a month, rise to a great height, and sometimes fall so low and ebb so fast that they leave ships on dry ground. The reader may find more of this in Herrera's history, but others differ in their accounts, and particularly Spielberg, a Dutchman, who mentions a port here that he called famous, by way of eminency, the adjacent soil producing fruit of various colors and excellent taste, and affording brooks of very good water. He mentions twenty-four other ports besides those that he did not see, and particularly the Pimento or Pepper Harbor, so called because of the trees which grow there of an aromatic smell, whose bark tastes like pepper, and is more hot and quick than that of the East Indies. The Spaniards having brought some of it to Seville, it was sold there for two crowns a pound. The last of our countrymen who passed them was Sir John Narborough, who set out from the Thames, May fifteenth, 1669, with two ships. He had King Charles the Second's commission, was furnished out at His Majesty's charge, and entered the Straits October twenty-second, following. He says that from the entrance of this strait to the Narrow there is good anchorage, and not much tide, but in the Narrow the tide runs very strong. The flood sets into the straits and the ebb out, keeping its course as on other coasts. It rises and falls near four fathom perpendicular, and it is high water here on the change of the moon at eleven o'clock. When he came to the narrow, he found the tide very strong, which endangered the running of his ships upon the steep rocks on the north side. From the first narrow to the second is above eight leagues, and the reach betwixt them seven leagues broad. He found a bay on the north side at the point of the second narrow, where one may ride in eight fathom water in clear sandy ground half a mile from the shore. In the channel of the second narrow he found thirty-eight fathom water and several bays and cliffs with little islands. He exchanged several trifles with the natives for bows and arrows and their skin coats. They were of a middle stature, well-limbed, with round faces, low foreheads, little noses, small black eyes and ears, black flaggy hair of an indifferent length, their teeth white, their faces of an olive color, daubed with spots of white clay and streaks of soot, their bodies painted with red earth and grease, their clothing of the skins of seals, guianacos, and otters, wrapped about them like the Scotch Highlanders' plaids. They had caps of the skins of fowls with the feathers on, and pieces of skins on their feet to keep them from the ground. They are very active and nimble, and when about business go quite naked. Only the women have a piece of skin before them, and differ from the men in habit only by want of caps, and having bracelets of shells about their necks. 
they seem to have no manner of government nor religion live by hunting and fishing and are armed with bows and arrows the latter eighteen inches long and headed with flint stones these people sir john found in elizabeth isle which lies near the second narrow in port famine bay south latitude fifty three degrees thirty five minutes he found good wood and water and abundance of pimento trees their language is guttural and slow sir john is of opinion that the mountains contain gold or copper he computes the whole length of the straits at one hundred sixteen leagues for the rest we refer to him i have insisted the longer on these straits partly because they are so much talked of and partly to justify our going to the south seas by the way of cape horn which is far more safe so that in all probability the straits of magellan will be little frequented by europeans in time to come the land on the north side of the straits is called patagonia and that on the south terra del fuego because of the numerous fires and the great smoke which the first discoverers saw upon it it extends the whole length of the straits and lies from east to west about one hundred thirty leagues according to avail and before the discovery of the straits of st vincent otherwise called le maire's straits was supposed to join to some part of the terra australis Ovell says that on the continent of Chile, near the Straits of Magellan, there is a people called Cesares, who are supposed to be descended from a part of the Spaniards that were forced ashore in the Straits when the Bishop of Placentia sent the ships above mentioned to discover the Maluka Islands. To suppose they contracted marriages with some Indian nation, where they have multiplied and taught them to build cities and the use of bells. Oval says that when he wrote the history of Chile, he received letters and other informations that there is such a nation in those parts, and that one of the missionaries had been in the country with Captain Navarro, and found the people to be of a white complexion with red in their cheeks. By the shape of their bodies they seemed to be men of courage and activity, and by the goodness of their complexion t'was probable they might be mixed up with a race of Flamengus, who had been shipwrecked in those parts but there being no farther account of these people since Avail's account of chile in the year sixteen forty six we believe this relation to be fabulous m de bouchanguin who is the last that attempted the passage of the straits of magellan that we have heard of came to an anchor at the virgin's cape in the mouth of this strait on the twenty fourth of june sixteen ninety nine and the wind being contrary he lay at anchor betwixt the continent and terra del fuego he weighed again the winds being still contrary and on the third of july anchored at port famine in the straits where the spaniards had built a garrison but were forced to quit it for want of provisions he observes that from the mouth of the straits to this place the climate seemed to be as temperate as in france though now the coldest season of the year in those parts he found abundance of wood for firing but the greatest inconveniency he met with there was from the great storms of snow though it did not lie long being carried off by rains which come from the west he is of opinion that a settlement might easily be made here in a part of the country extending above twenty leagues that he was informed the islands of st elizabeth in the straits are proper enough for corn and cattle if planted with them he sent his sloop ashore on terra del fuego where he saw fires and found the savage natives by fifty or sixty together in companies and some of them came aboard his ship that lay five leagues from the shore they were very peaceable and friendly but more miserable than our beggars in europe having no clothes but a straight coat of wild beast skins that comes no lower than their knees and pitiful huts made up of poles covered with skins of beasts and this is all the shelter they have against the extremity of the weather they came in such multitudes to beg from him as soon made him weary of their company so that he weighed again the sixteenth of august and stopped at port galland to leave some letters there for those who were to follow him from france as had been agreed upon and here he observes that both the climate and the navigation of the straits are very unequal and that from this place to the entrance of the south sea there is nothing but extraordinary high mountains on each side from whence come very impetuous and frightful torrents and scarce any place for anchorage to be found or one day without either rain or snow he adds that he found an island opposite to the mouth of the strait of st jerome that is set down in none of our maps this island, he says, has two good harbors, which may be of great consequence to those who pass this way. He took possession of it, called it by the name of the island, Louis de la Grande, the largest harbor he named Port Dauphin, and the lesser, which is very convenient, Port Philippo. After having given this character of the straits, he says one may be sure of a passage through them, provided it be in the proper season, but tis very difficult in the winter. 
he came out of those straits into the south sea on the twenty first of january seventeen hundred and went to view the harbor of san domingo which he says is the spanish frontier and the only place where a new settlement can be made there the rest being all possessed already he arrived there the third of february seventeen hundred and on the fifth anchored on the east of an island called by a different names but the latest authors call it st magdalen's island he sent his first lieutenant to view and take possession of it who brought him word that it was a very pleasant place and shewed him some fine beautiful shrubs and peas blossoms that he found upon the east side of it from whence he conjectures that it may be a proper place to inhabit though he owns that the climate is very moist and they have frequent rains and mists which he ascribes to the high mountains he made ready to discover four other islands which lie in view of this isle and the mainland and sounded as he went on but durst not venture to go among em with so large a ship because there blew a strong northwest wind followed by a thick mist which made him lose sight of land so that to his great sorrow he could not complete the discovery of that frontier he adds that tis full of high mountains down to the very sea but was afterwards informed by a spaniard who wintered in those parts that there's a very good harbor for ships to ride in where they may be moored to tall trees and that there are very few inhabitants on this coast but some wandering savages like those on the straits of magellan this and the other journals convince me entirely that the best way to the south sea is around cape horn the route we pursued in our voyage besides what i said from my own observation to prove how extensive a trade we might have in those seas i shall add the following observations from m de bouchain who says that though he was looked upon as a freebooter and that the then spanish governors on those coasts were forbid to trade or suffer the people to trade with any but their own subjects in those seas and that the valdivia and other places they fired at him when he approached their harbors and denied so much as to sell him any provisions or to suffer him to wood or water yet at rica some particular persons traded with him to the value of fifty thousand crowns and told him that that place was not so proper for them to act so manifestly contrary to law but if he went to a place more retired they would buy all he had though both his ships were full of goods accordingly when he came to hilo a great number of merchants bought all that he had of value at good rates he owns that the cloth he had on board was half rotten that the merchants were vexed at their disappointment and expressed the resentment that he should come to those parts so ill provided but in other places the people bought all to the very rags he had on board and brought him provision in abundance to sell though they were forbid doing so on pain of death and the officers themselves connived at it he returned by the way of cape horn in fifty eight degrees fifteen minutes january seventeen o one and had as good a passage and season as could be desired but saw no land on either side till the nineteenth of january seventeen o one when he discovered a small island about three or four leagues round in latitude fifty degrees odd minutes not marked in our maps with strong currents near it and on the twentieth he came to the isle of Sebald de Vert, which is a marshy land with some rocky mountains, no trees, but abundance of sea flow. It is proper here likewise to give an account of the Straits of Le Mer, so called from James Le Mer, an Amsterdam merchant, their discoverer in 1615. They lie in south latitude, 55 degrees, 36 minutes, and are formed by the Terra del Fuego on the west, and an island by the Dutch called Statenland or the country of the states on the east the straits are eight leagues wide with good roads on each side and plenty of fish and fowl the land on both sides is high and mountainous the discoverer saw very large fowls bigger than sea mews and their wings when extended above a fathom long each they were so tame that they flew into the ships and suffered the sailors to handle them in latitude fifty seven degrees they saw two barren islands which they called barnevelt and the south cape of terra del fuego which runs out in a point to latitude fifty seven degrees forty eight minutes they named cape horn some compute this strait to be only five leagues in length oval says that in sixteen nineteen the king of spain being informed that le maire had discovered these straits he sent two vessels to make a further discovery of them these ships came to the east side of the straits of magellan where the crew found a sort of giants higher by the head than any europeans who gave them gold in exchange for scissors and other baubles but this can't be relied on they went through this strait in less than a day's time it being not above seven leagues in length i return now to my journal 
January 16th, fresh gales of wind with cloudy weather. These 24 hours we had extraordinary smooth water as if we were close under land. Indifferent warm weather. Wind from the west-southwest to west by north. January 20. Yesterday at three in the afternoon we saw high land bearing east by north distant about ten leagues being the land about Port St. Stephen's on the coast of Patagonia in the South Sea described in the drafts. South latitude 47 degrees. January 22. Fair weather with fresh gales of wind from west by south to the west northwest. Last night George Cross died. He was a smith by trade and an armorer's mate. We and the Duchess have had a great many men down with the cold, and some with the scurvy, the distemper that this man died of. The Duchess had always more sick men than we, and have so now. They buried but one man that died of sickness, and tell us they hope the rest will recover. We have but one man whose life we doubt of, though most want a harbor. This day Captain Courtney and Captain Cook dined with us. At two o'clock we saw the land on the coast of Patagonia, being very high, distant about 14 leagues, latitude 44 degrees 9 minutes south. January 26. Fresh gales with clouds and rain. We spoke with our consort this day, who complains their men grow worse and worse, and want a harbor to refresh them. Several of ours are also very indifferent, and if we don't get ashore and a small refreshment, we doubt we shall both lose several men. We are very uncertain of the latitude and longitude of Juan Fernandez, the books laying him down so differently that not one chart agrees with another, and being but a small island we are in some doubts of striking it, so designed to hail in for the mainland to direct us. January 27. Fair weather, smooth water, pleasant gales of wind, veerable from the west to the northwest, had a good amplitude, found the variation to be ten degrees eastward, this is an excellent climate. Latitude, 36 degrees, 36 minutes south. January 28. We have had moderate weather. At six o'clock we saw the land, the easternmost appearing like an island, which we agreed to be the island of St. Mary on the coast of Chile. It bore east by north, distance nine or ten leagues. Our consort's men are very ill. Their want of clothes and being often wet in the cold weather has been the greatest cause of their being sick more than our ship's company. January 31st. These twenty-four hours we had the wind between the south and southwest by west. At seven this morning we made the island of Juan Fernandez. It bore west-southwest, distant about seven leagues, at noon west by south six leagues. We had a good observation. Latitude thirty-four degrees, ten minutes south. End of section seven. Section 8 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. Account of Alexander Selkirk. February 1st. About two yesterday in the afternoon, we hoisted our pinnace out. Captain Dover, with the boat's crew, went in her to go ashore, though we could not be less than four leagues off. As soon as the pinnace was gone, I went on board the Duchess, who admired our boat, attempted going ashore at that distance from land. T'was against my inclination, but to oblige Captain Dover I consented to let her go. As soon as it was dark we saw a light ashore. Our boat was then about a league from the island, and bore away for the ships as soon as she saw the lights. We put out lights abroad for the boat, though some were of the opinion the lights we saw were our boat lights, but as night came on it appeared too large for that. We fired one quarter-deck gun and several muskets, showing lights in our mizzen and fore shrouds that our boat might find us, whilst we plied in the lee of the island. About two in the morning our boat came on board, having been two hours on board the Duchess, that took em up astern of us. We were glad they got well off, because it begun to blow. We were all convinced the light is on the shore, and designed to make our ships ready to engage, believing them to be French ships at anchor, and we must either fight em or want water, etc. February 2nd. 
we stood on the back side along the south end of the island in order to lay in with the first southerly wind which captain dampier told us generally blows there all day long in the morning being past the island we tacked to lay it in close aboard the land and about ten o'clock opened the south end of the island and ran close aboard the land that begins to make the northeast side the flaws came heavy off shore and we were forced to reef our topsails when we opened the middle bay where we expected to find our enemy but saw all clear and no ships in that nor the other bay next the northwest end these two bays are all that ships ride in which recruit on this island but the middle bay is by much the best we guessed there had been ships there but that they were gone on sight of us we sent our yawl ashore about noon with captain dover mr fry and six men all armed meanwhile we and the duchess kept turning to get in and such heavy flaws came off the land that we were forced to let fly our topsail sheet keeping all hands to stand by our sails for fear of the winds carrying them away but when the flaws were gone we had little or no wind these flaws proceeded from the land which is very high in the middle of the island our boat did not return so we sent our pinnace with the men armed to see what was the occasion of the yawl's stay for we were afraid that the spaniards had a garrison there and might have seized them we put out a signal for our boat and the duchess showed a french ensign immediately our pinnace returned from the shore and brought abundance of crawfish with a man clothed in goatskins who looked wilder than the first owners of them he had been on the island four years and four months had been left there by captain stradling in the sinkaports his name was alexander selkirk a scotchman who had been master of the sinkaports a ship that came here last with captain dampier who told me that this was the best man in her so i immediately agreed with him to be a mate on board our ship twas he that made the fire last night when he saw our ships which he judged to be english during his stay here he saw several ships pass by but only two came in to anchor as he went to view them he found them to be spaniards and retired from them upon which they shot at him had they been french he would have submitted but chose to risk his dying alone on the island rather than fall into the hands of the spaniards in these parts because he apprehended they would murder him or make a slave of him in the mines for he feared they would spare no stranger that might be capable of discovering the south sea the spaniards had landed before he knew what they were and they came so near him that he had much ado to escape for they not only shot at him but pursued him into the woods where he climbed to the top of a tree at the foot of which they made water and killed several goats just by but went off again without discovering him he told us that he was born at largo in the county of fife in scotland and was bred a sailor from his youth the reason of his being left here was a difference betwixt him and his captain which together with the ships being leaky made him willing rather to stay here than go along with him at first and when he was at last willing the captain would not receive him he had been in the island before to wood and water when two of the ship's company were left upon it for six months till the ship returned being chased thence by two french south sea ships he had with him his clothes and bedding with a firelock some powder bullets and tobacco a hatchet a knife a kettle a bible some practical pieces and his mathematical instruments and books he diverted and provided for himself as well as he could but for the first eight months had much ado to bear up against melancholy and the terror of being left alone in such a desolate place he built two huts with the pimento trees covered them with long grass and lined them with the skins of goats which he killed with his gun as he wanted so long as his powder lasted which was but a pound and that being near spent he got fire by rubbing two sticks of pimento wood together upon his knee in the lesser hut at some distance from the other he dressed his victuals and in the larger he slept and employed himself in reading singing psalms and praying so that he said he was a better christian while in this solitude than ever he was before or than he was afraid he should ever be again at first he never eat anything till hunger constrained him partly for grief and partly for want of bread and salt nor did he go to bed till he could watch no longer the pimenta wood which burnt very clear served him both for firing and candle and refreshed him with its fragrant smell 
he might have had fish enough but could not eat em for want of salt because they occasioned a looseness except crawfish which are there as large as our lobsters and very good these he sometimes boiled and other times broiled as he did his goat's flesh of which he made a very good broth for they are not so rank as ours he kept an account of five hundred that he killed while there and caught as many more which he marked on the ear and let go when his powder failed he took them by speed of foot for his way of living and continual exercise of walking and running cleared him of all gross humours so that he ran with wonderful swiftness through the woods and up the rocks and hills as we perceived when we employed him to catch goats for us we had a bulldog which we sent with several of our nimblest runners to help him in catching goats but he distanced and tired both the dog and the men catched the goats and brought them to us on his back he told us that his agility in pursuing a goat had once liked to have cost him his life he pursued it with so much eagerness that he catched hold of it on the brink of a precipice of which he was not aware the bushes having hid it from him so that he fell with the goat down the said precipice a great height and was so stunned and bruised with the fall that he narrowly escaped with his life and when he came to his senses found the goat dead under him he lay there about twenty-four hours and was scarce able to crawl to his hut which was about a mile distance or to stir abroad again in ten days he came at last to relish his meat well enough without salt or bread and in the season had plenty of good turnips which had been sowed there by captain dampier's men and have now overspread some acres of ground he had enough good cabbage from the cabbage trees and seasoned his meat with the fruit of the pimento trees which is the same as the jamaica pepper and smells deliciously he found there also a black pepper called malagita which was very good to expel wind and against gripping of the guts he soon wore out all his shoes and clothes by running through the woods and at last being forced to shift without them his feet became so hard that he run everywhere without annoyance and it was some time before he could wear shoes after we found him for not being used to any so long his feet swelled when he came first to wear em again after he had conquered his melancholy he diverted himself sometimes by cutting his name on the trees and the time of his being left and the continuance there he was at first much pestered with cats and rats that had bred in great numbers from some of each species which had got ashore from ships that put in there to wood and water the rats gnawed his feet and clothes while asleep which obliged him to cherish the cats with his goat's flesh by which many of them became so tame that they would lie about him in hundreds and soon delivered him from the rats he likewise tamed some kids and to divert himself would now and then sing and dance with them and his cats so that by the care of providence and vigor of his youth being now but about thirty years old he came at last to conquer all the inconveniences of his solitude and to be very easy when his clothes wore out he made himself a coat and cap of goat skins which he stitched together with little thongs of the same that he cut with his knife he had no other needle but a nail and when his knife was wore to the back he made others as well as he could of some iron hoops that were left ashore which he beat thin and grounded upon stones having some linen cloth by him he sewed himself shirts with a nail and stitched them with the worsted of his old stockings which he pulled out on purpose he had his last shirt on when we found him in the island at his first coming on board us he had so much forgot his language for the want of use that we could scarce understand him for he seemed to speak his words by halves we offered him a dram but he would not touch it having drank nothing but water since his being there and twas some time before he could relish our victuals he could give us an account of no other product of the island than what we have mentioned except small black plums which are very good but hard to come at the trees which bear em growing on high mountains and rocks pimento trees are plenty here and we saw some of sixty foot high and about two yards thick and cotton trees higher and near four fathom round in the stock the climate is so good that the trees and grass are verdant all the year the winter lasts no longer than june and july and is not then severe there being only a small frost and a little hail but sometimes great rains the heat of the summer is equally moderate and there's not much thunder or tempestuous weather of any sort he saw no venomous or savage creature on the island nor any other sort of beast but goats etc as above mentioned 
the first of which had been put ashore here on purpose for a breed by juan fernando a spaniard who settled there with some families for a time till the continent of chile began to submit to the spaniards which being more profitable tempted them to quit this island which is capable of maintaining a good number of people and of being made so strong that they could not be easily dislodged Ringrose, in his account of Captain Sharp's voyage and other buccaneers, mentions one who had escaped ashore here out of a ship, which was cast away with all the rest of the company, and says he lived five years alone before he had the opportunity of another ship to carry him off. Captain Dampier talks of a mosquito Indian that belonged to Captain Watlin, who, being a hunting in the woods when the captain left the island, lived here three years alone, and shifted much in the same manner as Mr. Selkirk did till captain dampier came hither in sixteen eighty four and carried him off the first that went ashore was one of his countrymen and they saluted one another first by prostrating themselves by turns on the ground and then embracing but whatever there is in these stories this of mr selkirk i know to be true and his behavior afterwards gives me reason to believe the account he gave me how he spent his time and bore up under such an affliction in which nothing but the divine providence could have supported any man by this one may see that solitude and retirement from the world is not such an insufferable state of life as most men imagine especially when people are fairly called or thrown into it unavoidably as this man was who in all probability must otherwise have perished in the seas the ship which left him being cast away not long after and few of the company escaped we may perceive by this story the truth of the maxim that necessity is the mother of invention since he found means to supply his wants in a very natural manner so as to maintain his life though not so conveniently yet as effectually as we are able to do with the help of all our arts and society it may likewise instruct us how much a plain and temperate way of living conduces to the health of the body and the vigor of the mind both which we are apt to destroy by excess and plenty especially of strong liquor and the variety as well as the nature of our meat and drink for this man when he came to our ordinary method of diet and life though he was sober enough lost much of his strength and agility but i must quit these reflections which are more proper for a philosopher and divine than a mariner and return to my own subject end of section eight section nine of a cruising voyage around the world this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers Juan Fernandez to Lobos and Northward We did not get to anchor till six at night on February the 1st, and then it fell calm. We rowed and towed into the anchor ground about a mile offshore, forty-five fathom water, clean ground. The current sets mostly along shore to the southward. This morning we cleared up ship and unbent our sails, and got them ashore to mend and make tents for our sick men. The governor, though we might as well have named him the absolute monarch of the island, for so we called Mr. Selkirk, caught us two goats which make excellent broth mixed with turnip tops and other greens for our sick men, being twenty-one in all but not above two that we account dangerous the duchess has more men sick and in a worse condition than ours february third yesterday in the afternoon we got as many of our men ashore as could be spared from clearing and fitting our ship to wood and water our sail makers are all mending our sails and i lent the duchess one to assist them this morning we got our smith's forge put up ashore set our coopers to work in another place and made a little tent for myself to have the benefit of the shore the duchess has also a tent for their sick men so that we have a little town of our own here and everybody is employed a few men supply us all with fish of several sorts all very good as silverfish rockfish pollock cavallos old wives and crawfish in such abundance that in a few hours we could take as many as would serve some hundreds of men. There were sea fowls in the bay as large as geese, but eat fish. The governor never failed of getting us two or three goats a day for our sick men, by which, with the help of the greens and the goodness of the air, they recovered very fast of the scurvy, which was their general distemper. Twas very pleasant ashore among the green pimento trees which cast a refreshing smell. 
our house was made by putting up a sail round four of em and covering it atop with another sail so that captain dover and i both thought it a very agreeable seat the weather being neither too hot nor too cold we spent our time till the tenth in refitting our ships taking wood on board and laying up water that which we brought from england and st vincent being spoiled by the badness of the casks we likewise boiled up about eighty gallons of sea lions oil as we might have done several tons had we been provided with vessels etc we refined and strained it for the use of our lamps and to save our candles though sailors sometimes use it to fry their meat when straightened for want of butter etc and say tis agreeable enough the men who worked ashore on our rigging eat young seals which they preferred to our ship's victuals and said was as good as english lamb though for my own part i should have been glad of such an exchange we made what haste we could to get all necessaries on board being willing to lose no time for we were informed at the canaries that five stout french ships were coming together to these seas february eleventh yesterday in the evening having little or nothing to do with the pinnace we sent her to the south end of the island to get goats the governor told us that during his stay he could not get down to that end from the mountains where he lived they were so steep and rocky but that there were abundance of goats there and that part of the island was plainer captain dampier mr glendall and the governor with ten men set out in company with the duchess's boat and crew and surrounded a great parcel of goats which are of a larger sort and not so wild as those on the higher part of the island where the governor lived but not looking well to em they escaped over the cliff so that instead of catching above a hundred as they might easily have done with a little precaution they returned this morning with only sixteen large ones though they saw above a thousand if any ships come again to this island the best way is to keep some men and dogs at that part of the island and sending a boat to them once in twenty-four hours they may victual a good body of men and no doubt but amongst those goats they may find some hundreds with mr selkirk's earmark february twelfth this morning we bent the remaining sails got the last wood and water aboard brought off our men and got everything ready to depart the island of juan fernandez is nearest of a triangular form about twelve leagues round the southwest side is much the longest and has a small island about a mile long lying near it with a few visible rocks close under the shore of the great island on this side begins a ridge of high mountains that run cross from the southwest to the northwest of the island and the land that lies out in a narrow point to the westward appears to be the only level ground here on the northeast side tis very high land and under it are the two bays where ships always put in to recruit the best bay is next the middle on this side the island which is to be known at a distance by the highest table mountain right over this bay you may anchor as near as you will to the shore and the nearer the better the best road is on the larboard side of the bay and the nearest the easternmost shore provided you get well in you cannot mistake the road the other bay is plain to be seen under the north end but not so good for wood water or landing nor so safe for riding in this bay where we rode there's plenty of good water and wood the best water is in a small cove about a good musket shot to the eastward of the place i have described you may ride from a mile to a bow shot off the shore being all deep water and bold without any danger round the island but what is visible and very near in this bay where we rode is open to near half the compass the easternmost land in sight bore east by south distance about a mile and a half and the outermost northwest point of the island lies something without our bay and bears northwest by west distant a good league we were about a mile off the shore and had forty-five fathom water clean sandy ground we were designed to have ran farther in and new moored but mr selkirk informed us that this month proves the fairest in the year and that during winter and summer the whole time he was here he seldom knew the wind to blow off from the sea but only in small breezes that never brought in a sea nor held two hours but he warned us to be on our guard against the wind off shore which blew very strong sometimes the bay is all deep water and you may carry in ships close to the rocks if occasion require the wind blows always over the land and at worst along shore which makes no sea it's for the most part calm at night only now and then a flaw blows from the high land over us near the rocks there are very good fish of several sorts particularly large crawfish under the rocks easy to be caught also cavalillies gropers and other good fish in so great plenty anywhere near the shore that i never saw the like but at the best fishing season in newfoundland 
Pimento is the best timber, and most plentiful on this side the island, but very apt to split till a little dried. We cut the longest and cleanest to split for firewood. The cabbage trees abound about three miles in the woods, and the cabbage very good. Most of them are on the tops of the nearest and lowest mountains. In the first plain we found store of turnip greens and watercresses in the brooks, which mightily refreshed our men, and cleansed them from the scurvy. The turnips, Mr. Selkirk told us, are good in our summer months, which is winter here, but this being autumn they are all run to seed, so that we can't have the benefit of anything but the greens. The soil is a loose black earth, the rocks very rotten, so that without great care it's dangerous to climb the hills for cabbages. Besides, there are abundance of holes dug in several places by a sort of fowls like puffins, which fall in at once and endanger the wrenching or breaking of a man's leg. Mr. Selkirk tells me, in July, he has seen snow and ice here, but the spring, which is in September, October, and November, is very pleasant, when there is abundance of good herbs, as parsley, purslane, siths, in great plenty, besides an herb found by the waterside, which proved very useful to our surgeon for fomentations. Tis not much unlike feverfew, of a very grateful smell-like balm, but of a stronger and more cordial scent. Tis in great plenty near the shore." We gathered many large bundles of it, dried them in the shade, and set them on board, besides great quantities that we carried in every morning to strow the tents, which tended much to the speedy recovery of our sick men, of whom none died but two belonging to the Duchess, viz. Edward Wilts and Christopher Williams. Mr. Selkirk tells me that in November the seals come ashore to whelp and engender, when the shore is so full of them for a stone's throw that tis impossible to pass through them and they are so surly that they'll not move out of the way, but like an angry dog run at a man, though he have a good stick to beat them, so that at this and their whelping seasons tis dangerous to come near them, but at other times they'll make way for a man, and if they did not, twould be impossible to get up from the waterside. They line the shore very thick, for above half a mile of ground all round the bay. When we came in they kept a continual noise day and night, some bleating like lambs, some howling like dogs or wolves, others making hideous noises of various sorts, so that we heard them aboard, though a mile from the shore. Their fur is the finest that I ever saw of the kind, and exceeds that of our otters. Another strange creature here is the sea-lion. The governor tells me he has seen of them above twenty foot long and more in compass, which could not weigh less than two ton weight. I saw several of these vast creatures, but none of the above-mentioned size. Several of them were upward of sixteen foot long and more in bulk, so that they could not weigh less than a ton weight. The shape of their body differs little from the sea dogs or seals, but have another sort of skin, a head much bigger in proportion, and very large mouths, monstrous big eyes, and a face like that of a lion, with very large whiskers, the hair of which is stiff enough to make toothpickers. These creatures come ashore to engender the latter end of June and stay till the end of September, during all which time they lie on the land and are never observed to go to the water, but lie in the same place above a musket shot from the water side, and have no manner of sustenance all that time that he could observe. I took notice of some that lay a week without once offering to move out of the place whilst I was there till they were disturbed by us. But we saw few in comparison of what he informs us he did, and that the shore was all crowded full of them a musket shot into the land. I admire how these monsters come to yield such a quantity of oil. Their hair is short and coarse, and their skin thicker than the thickest oxhide I ever saw. We found no land bird on the island but a sort of black bird with a red breast not unlike our English blackbirds, and the hummingbird of various colors, and no bigger than a large humblebee. Here is a small tide which flows uncertain, and the spring tide flows about seven foot. I shall not trouble the reader with the descriptions of this island given by others, wherein there are many falsehoods, but the truth of this I can assert from my own knowledge. Nor shall I insert the description of the cabbage and pimento trees, being so well known and so frequently done, that there is no manner of need for it. I have insisted the longer upon this island, because it might be at first of great use to those who would carry on any trade to the South Sea. February 13th, at a committee held on board the Duchess the 13th of February, 1708-9. It was agreed as follows. Resolved to steer from Juan Fernandez, northeast by east, for the land, and when come within six leagues of the shore to keep that distance, steering along shore to the northward. The next place we design to stop at, to build our boats and land our men, is the island of Lobos de la Mar. In case of losing company, to wait for each other twenty leagues to the northward of the place where we accounted we were when we separated. 
then to lie at six leagues distance from the shore the space of four days and to proceed with an easy sail for lobos in case of not meeting taking special care of the rocks called ormigos lying about that distance off from cayo the seaport of the city of lima in case of seeing one or more sail the signal for chasing if not out of call is to clue up our main top gallant sheets with the yards aloft and the general method we design to take in chasing is for the ship that sails best or is nearest the chase to chase directly after the sail discovered and the other to keep to or from the shore at a convenient distance as occasion shall require to prevent being known and if the ship that is nearest the chase believes her to be too big for one ship alone then to make the same signal or any other plainer to be distinguished than the signal for the chase and if either ship comes up with the chase and have her in possession or under command if in the day to show a white jack on the main top masthead and if in the night to make two false fires and carry as plain lights as possible to leave off chase the signal by night is one good light at the main top masthead and to fire no gun but in a fog or very thick weather either night or day to prevent being discovered to leave off chase by day the signal is to haul down the top sails keeping out our main top gallant stay sail and in case of losing company we refer ourselves to our weekly signals to discover each other in case either ship in chase or other ways should run into any danger of shoal water or other kind then the ship in such danger is to fire a gun with a shot and to stand from it in case of a separation each ship as they enter lobos to carry an english pennant at the foretop masthead and if the other happens to be there she must show her english colors and if either ship anchor short of the road she shall put out three lights viz at the main top masthead poop bolt spirit end either ship arriving at lobos and not finding his consort there he is immediately to set up two crosses one at the landing place nearest the farther end of the starboard great island going in with a glass bottle hid underground twenty yards directly north from each cross with intelligence of what has happened since parting and what their further designs are this is to be done and in readiness that if they give chase or be forced out by the enemy the missing ship may not want intelligence from her consort we began this method at cork to secure the best place we could possible to rendezvous at hoping by this means and our signals always to keep company and know each other through the whole voyage these directions being something particular made me insert them in the journal february thirteenth yesterday in the afternoon we sent our yawl a fishing and got near two hundred large fish in a very little time which we salted for our future spending this morning we concluded what we began last night being the foregoing agreement to direct our affairs from this place and as all our success depends on a strict secrecy the precautions may not be useless february fourteenth yesterday about three in the afternoon we weighed had a fair pleasant gale at south southeast mr van brew came on board our ship again in exchange with mr bath i hope for the best course north latitude thirty two degrees thirty two minutes longitude west from london eighty three degrees six minutes february sixteenth had moderate gales of wind with calms this morning i went on board the duchess with captain dover and captain dampier and dined there wind at south february seventeenth most part of this twenty four hours was calm and cloudy weather about ten o'clock we hoisted our boat out and fetched captain courtney and captain cook to dine with us whilst they were on board we settled and signed the following instrument one for each ship further to secure our methods and to regulate the affair of plunder which if well followed will prevent the bad effects of so dangerous an obstacle to our good proceedings which has proved too hard a task for all others in our time that have gone out on the same account so far from great britain which i believe is chiefly owing either to want of unity or good measures god be thanked we have a good concord between each ship's company hitherto at a committee held by the officers of the duke and duchess seventeenth february seventeen o eight nine mr george underhill mr david wilson mr lance appleby mr sam warden you being chosen by the officers and men on board the duke to be managers of the plunder which we may take in our cruising at sea on the coast of new spain tis our order that mr lance appleby and mr samuel warden do go and continue aboard the duchess in the place of two other men from them who are to search all persons that return from such prize or prizes that may be taken by either ship 
as also all persons that the captains of either ship shall give leave whose advice you are continually to follow and apply to them for assistance if occasion require and immediately to inform of any persons belonging to either ship that shall be perceived to use clandestine methods to hide plunder or endeavor to avoid the searching them if the ships duke and duchess are separated when any prize is taken then one of you is to be on board the prize and the other to remain on board the ship and in each place be very strict and keep an exact account of what comes to your hands and as soon as possible secure it in such manner as the captain of either ship shall direct still observing the command of the superior officer on board the prize who is also to assist you to the utmost of his power if any person not concerned in this order nor employed in the same by captain courtney concerns himself with the plunder except the commanding officer you are to forbid him and if he disobeys to give immediate information of such person or persons you are not to encumber the boats with chests or plunder out of any prize at first coming aboard but mind what you see and the first thing you are to do is to take account of what you find aboard that is plunder and remove nothing without the captains of either ship's orders or in case of their absence the chief officer or officers of either ship that shall be aboard the prize to avoid trouble and disturbance you are by no means to be rude in your office but to do everything as quiet and easy as possible and to demean yourselves so towards those employed by captain courtney that we may have no manner of disturbance or complaint still observing that you be not overawed nor deceived of what is your due in behalf of the officers and men the persons appointed to be managers by the duchess were the underwritten john connolly simon fleming simon hatley bartholomew rowe to whom the foregoing orders were also given and signed by the committee thomas dover president woods rogers stephen courtney william dampier edward cook robert fry charles pope thomas glendall carlton van brew john bridge william stratton john rogers john connolly william bath george milborne john ballet february seventeenth captain courtney and captain cook being aboard we agreed that mr appleby should appear for the officers on board the duchess and samuel warden for the men mr simon hatley and simon fleming were to have the like charge on board of us to manage the plunder according to the foregoing orders february eighteenth about three yesterday afternoon we saw the main distance nine leagues its very high land with several islands february twenty eighth yesterday afternoon we came within about six leagues of very high land this morning we put both pinnaces in the water to try them under sail having fixed them with each a gun after the manner of a paterero and all things necessary for small privateers hoping they'll be serviceable to us in little winds to take vessels wind at south and south by east march first having little wind and smooth water we heeled both ships and tallowed march second we are in sight of land distance twelve or fourteen leagues within the country there is a vast high ridge of mountains named cordilleras all along this course some parts i believe are full as high if not higher than the pico teneriffe with snow on the top we had a good observation latitude seventeen degrees three minutes longitude seventy degrees twenty nine minutes west from london march fourth fine pleasant weather with fresh gales of wind this day we came to an allowance of three pints of water a man per day though we had a good stock aboard my reason for it was that we might keep at sea some time and take some prizes and not be forced to discover ourselves by watering before we attempted anything ashore because an enemy being once discovered there's nothing of value as i'm informed puts to sea from one end of the coast to the other they have great conveniences of giving notice by expresses and strict orders for all officers on the shore to keep lookers out upon every headland march eighth fine pleasant weather a brisk gale at southeast at three this morning we lay by and at six saw the land distant about fourteen leagues after which i made sail the duchess had a boy fall out of the mizzen top down on the deck and broke his leg of which he is in a fair way to recover latitude twelve degrees thirty one minutes longitude eighty four degrees fifty eight minutes march ninth fair weather a moderate gale at southeast we go under an easy sail in hopes of seeing rich ships either going or coming out of lima being now near it we keep about seven leagues from shore to prevent our being discovered 
we shall not lie long there but design to go for lobos to build our boats and get things ready to land at guayaquil march tenth pleasant weather moderate gales at southeast this morning perceiving white rocks at a distance which looked like ships we brought to and sent our boats under the shore having kept them ready astern four days that if we saw a sail near the shore they might take to them to prevent their discovering us to those on the continent march thirteenth fair weather moderate gales at southeast this morning we ran near land and the duchess kept in the offing to see if we could meet any of the traders there being as i am informed ships of good value sometimes on this coast our men began to repine that though come so far we have met with no prize in these seas march fourteenth the nights are very cold in comparison of the days which are warm enough but not so hot as i expected in this latitude here's never any rain but great dews in the night almost equivalent to it though the air be generally serene at eight last night we hailed up north northwest for the island lobos march fifteenth we saw land yesterday and supposing it was lobos stood off and on all night in the morning it proved very hazy till ten when we saw it again right ahead but we stood nearer till we were convinced it was not lobos but the mainland of peru within it so we stood off at twelve and had a good observation latitude six degrees fifty five minutes march sixteenth yesterday afternoon we spied a sail our consort being nearest soon took her she was a little vessel of about sixteen ton belonging to peta and bound to chiripe for flour with a small sum of money aboard to purchase it the master's name was antonio heliagos a mustis begotten between an indian and a spaniard his company was eight men one of them a spaniard one a negro and the rest indians we'd asked them for news and they assured us that all the french ships being seven in number sailed out of these seas six months ago and that no more were to return adding that the spaniards had such an aversion to them that at cayo the seaport for lima they killed so many of the french and quarrelled so frequently with them that none were suffered to come ashore there for some time before they sailed from thence after we had put men aboard the prize we hailed off close on a wind for lobos having shot within it and had we not been better informed by the crew of the prize might have endangered our ships by running in farther because there are shoals between the island and the main the prisoners tell us there had been no enemy in those parts since captain dampier which is above four years ago they likewise informed us that captain stradling's ship the Singaports, who was dampier's consort foundered on the coast of barbacor where he with six or seven of his men were only saved and being taken in their boat had been four years prisoners at lima where they lived much worse than our governor selkirk whom he left on the island juan fernandez this morning we saw the island lobos which bore south about four leagues at noon it bore south by west distant six miles we sent our pinnace thither manned and armed to see if there were any fishermen upon it and secure them lest they should discover us to the people on the main march seventeenth yesterday about five in the evening we got well into anchor but found nobody at the island we had twenty fathom water clean ground in the thoroughfare between the two islands above a cable's length from each shore tis a bold going in and a good road the wind blowing constantly over land we resolved here to fit out our small bark for a privateer she being well built for sailing and this morning we had her into a small round cove in the southernmost island where we hauled her up dry on the land the carpenters also got the timber ashore to build our boat for landing men march eighteenth in the evening we launched our small privateer having cleaned her bottom well called her the beginning and appointed captain cook to command her we got a small spare mast out of our ship which made her a new main mast and our mizzen top sail was altered to make her a mainsail the duchess heeled and cleaned their ship this morning i got all our sick men ashore and built tents for them the duchess also landed hers we agreed to stay the building of our boat and fitting out the privateer while the duchess cruised about the island and in sight of the main march nineteenth yesterday afternoon we sent the yawl a fishing got the bark rigged and almost ready with four swivel guns and a deck near finished this morning the duchess sailed a cruising and appointed to meet the bark off the southeast end of the island march twentieth the bark being got ready this morning we victualled her out of our ship and put twenty of ours and twelve of our consorts men aboard her well armed i saw her out of the harbor with our pinnace she looks very pretty and i believe will sail well in smooth water having all masts sails riggings and materials 
like one of the half-galleys fitted out for Her Majesty's service in England. They gave our ship's company three huzzas, and we returned them the like at parting. I told Captain Cook if we should be forced out of the road or give chase hence, we would leave a glass bottle buried near a remarkable great stone that I showed him, with letters in it, to give an account how it was with us, of the occasion of our departure, and where to meet again. I bid him acquaint Captain Courtney with it. March 22nd. This morning a Spaniard belonging to us, named Sylvester Ramos, died suddenly, and we buried him at night. Most of our men are healthy, except two or three who are ill of the scurvy. March 23rd. This morning we began to scrub our ship, and cleared abundance of barnacles off her bottom almost as large as mussels. A ship grows foul very fast in these seas. March 25th. We caught plenty of very good fish. The seals are numerous here, but not so many as at Juan Fernandez. A large one seized a stout Dutchman, had liked to have pulled him into the water, and bit him to the bone in several places in one of his arms and legs. March 26th. This morning the Duchess came in with a prize called the Santa Josepha, bound from Guayaquil to Truxillo, burdened about fifty tons full of timber with some cocoa and cocoa nuts, and tobacco which we distributed among our men. The Duchess and Beginning took her between this island and the main. She had very little of value on board. March 27th. This morning we gave our ship a good heel and tallowed her low down. A Dutchman belonging to the Duchess died of the scurvy ashore and was buried on the island. March 30th. Yesterday afternoon we got the second prize, which we called the Increase, aboard us, and cleaned her. We brought all offshore and launched our new boat to tow at our stern, and at ten o'clock came to sail, after we had put Mr. Stratton to command the beginning, and all our sick men and a doctor of each ship aboard the Increase, of which Mr. Selkirk, our second mate, was appointed master. By observation we had here, this island lies in latitude six degrees fifty minutes south, the variation thirty degrees thirty minutes easterly, and I reckon it lies in the longitude of eighty-seven degrees thirty-five minutes west from London. The two largest islands, called Lobos de la Mar, to distinguish them from others called Lobos de la Terra, within two leagues of the land, are about sixteen leagues from the main and six miles in length. There's another small island close by the easternmost to windward, not half a mile long, with some rocks and breakers near the shore, all round and off of each side of the entrance to the road, which is bold and has no visible danger. There's a passage for boats to windward to come into the road, which is to the leeward of these islands in a sound between them. Tis not half a mile broad, but above a mile deep has from ten to twenty fathom water and good anchor ground. There's no coming in for ships, but to leeward of the islands. We went in with a small weather tide, though I never perceived it flow above three foot whilst we lay here. The wind commonly blows southerly, veering a little to the eastward, on the easternmost island, which was on our larboard side as we lay at anchor in the sound. There is a round hummock, and behind it a small cove, very smooth, deep, and convenient enough for a ship to careen in. There we hauled up and fitted our little frigate. The highest part of the island appears in the road not much higher than a large ship's top masthead. The soil is a hungry white clayish earth mixed with sand and rocks. There's no fresh water or green things on the islands. There's abundance of vultures, alias carrion crows, which looked so like turkeys that one of our officers at landing blessed himself at the sight and hoped to fare deliciously here. He was so eager that he would not stay till the boat could put him ashore, but leaped into the water with his gun, and getting near enough to a parcel, let fly at him. But when he came to take up his game, it stunk insufferably, and made us merry at his mistake. The other birds here are penguins, pelicans, boobies, gulls, and a sort of fowls like teal that nestle in holes on the land. Our men got loads of him, which they skinned and praised them for very good meat. We found abundance of bulrushes and empty jars that the Spanish fishermen had left ashore. All over this coast they use jars instead of casks for oil, wine, and all other sorts of liquids. Here's abundance of seals and some sea lions. The seals are much larger than at Juan Fernandez, but the fur not so fine. Our people killed several with a design to eat their livers, but one of our crew, a Spaniard, died suddenly after eating them. I forbade the use of them. Our prisoners told us they accounted those old seals very unwholesome. 
the wind always blowing fresh over the land brought an ugly noisome smell above from the seals ashore which gave me a violent headache and everybody else complained of this nauseous smell we found nothing so offensive at juan fernandez our prisoners tell us they expect the widow of the late viceroy of peru would shortly embark for aquapoco with her family and riches and stop at peta to refresh or sail near in sight as customary in one of the king's ships of thirty-six guns and that about eight months ago there was a ship with two hundred thousand pieces of eight aboard the rest of her cargo liquors and flour which had passed peta for acapulco she would have been a welcome prize to us but since she is gone it's not worth while to follow her our prisoners added that they left senor morel in a stout ship with dry goods for lima recruiting at peta where he expected in a few days a french-built ship belonging to the spaniards to come from panama richly laden with a bishop aboard peta is a common recruiting place to those who go to or from lima or most ports to windward in their trade to panama or any part of the coast of mexico upon this advice we agreed to spend as much time as possible cruising off of peta without discovering ourselves for fear of hindering our other designs at these islands captain dampier in his last voyage left his ship the st george at anchor and went to the east indies in a spanish brigantine with about twenty-five men after he had plundered puna in 1704 and watered his small bark near it he endured many hardships and for want of his commission to show which he lost at puna he was imprisoned and had all his goods seized in the indies by the dutch before we came hither we held a committee and published an order in both ships forbidding our officers or men on severe penalties to hold any correspondence or talk anything that in the least concerns the voyage with our prisoners which was strictly observed to prevent the discovery of our designs to the spaniards april first small gales fair clear weather this morning i went in our yawl on board the duchess and afterwards spoke with the beginning we agreed how to act in case we see more than one sail at a time to chase april second yesterday in the afternoon we were surprised with the color of the water which looked as red as blood for several miles occasioned by the spawn of fish this morning at daybreak we spied a sail about two leagues to windward we immediately hoisted out and manned our pinnace commanded by mr fry my chief lieutenant who by eight in the morning took the ship she was called the ascension built galleon fashion very high with galleries burdened between four and five hundred ton two brothers being commanders vice joseph and john morrell she was laden with dry goods and timber had above fifty negroes and several passengers bound from panama to lima april third we immediately manned this prize took some of the spaniards out of her and put in mr fry commander we found a good stock of fresh provisions on board in the evening we saw another sail which the beginning took and brought her to the rest this morning she was a vessel of thirty-five tons laden with timber from guayaquil to the chancy near lima the master's name was juan guastelos the crew eleven white men and one negro we agreed with the duchess and beginning when and where to meet and having all our stations appointed they left us we were informed by the prisoners that the bishop of choqueagua a place far up the country in the south parts of peru was to have come from panama in this vessel for lima in his way to the said bishopric but the ship springing a leak at panama he went on board a french built ship belonging to the spaniards that was following them for lima but would stop at peta to recruit as the morels had done being near that place we resolved to watch narrowly in order to catch the ship with his lordship april fourth about six in the evening we parted with mr fry in the great prize having ordered him with the two other prizes to keep together and ply about eight leagues offshore in sight of the hummocks called the saddle of peta because they appear in that shape with low land betwixt them we stood in for the shore and next morning saw a ship to leeward and gave chase she made a signal by which we knew her to be the duchess but being at a distance and we not having kept out our signal long enough they did not see it we kept on sail till we came near her which made them clear their ship in order to fight i did this to surprise them and at noon went on board april fifth i kept the duchess company till the evening and whilst i was on board her the beginning came down to us we agreed on an exact station the beginning to keep close in with peta the duchess eight leagues to leeward and i to lie right off of peta about seven or eight leagues a little to windward just as the sun set i left them they fancied they saw a sail and chased in great haste but we saw nothing except the blowing of a whale of which there are abundance on this coast 
Wind from the southeast by south to the east southeast. April 6th. We came up with our three prizes about four o'clock in the afternoon and found all in good order. Mr. Fry had fitted out the great boat we built at Lobos, which we called a launch, with sails and oars, ready to give chase if they saw anything in little winds, having men enough for that end in these peaceable seas, where they are in no fear of an enemy. April 7th. At eight this morning the saddle of Peta bore east-northeast seven leagues, at noon northeast distant ten leagues. I went on board the galleon to Mr. Fry and stationed him again, leaving signals for the other two if he saw him, and after having dined on a good quarter of mutton and cabbage with him, which is a great rarity to us here, I came on board in order to leave him the second time. Mr. Van Brew threatening to shoot one of our men at Lobos, only for refusing to carry some carrion crows that he shot, and having lately abused Captain Dover, as he said, the latter desired a committee might be called to examine into Mr. Van Brew's conduct, and we came to the following issue, that Mr. Van Brew had committed sundry misdemeanors, and according to our orders, we not believing him a fit person to be one of the committee, had chosen Mr. Samuel Hopkins in his stead, which was signed and agreed to by all the committee in both ships. At the same time, while we were together, we had a second committee which concluded as follows. We have examined and do approve of all the proceedings and transactions since our leaving the island of Grande on the coast of Brazil, both as to punishing offenders, our dispatch at Juan Fernandez, and staying at Lobos to build our boat, and acting in all cases for the best of our intended voyage to this time. In testimony of which we have set our hands the day and year above written, signed by all the chief officers in both ships. April 11th. Yesterday afternoon we all met aboard the Duke to consult how to act. For beginning to grow short of water, we can't keep the sea much longer. April 12th. This morning we came to a full resolution to land and attempt Guayaquil. In order thereunto we fixed two barks, put ammunition and arms aboard them, with our four quarter-deck guns and field carriages. And for the management of this expedition, we held a committee and resolved on the following particulars at a committee held on board the Duke frigate. We have consulted and examined sundry pilots taken in prizes and had several meetings on this occasion being provided with convenient vessels to carry our men, guns, arms, and other necessaries to Guayaquil. We resolved to attempt it, having also consulted the most secret way of managing our attempts on it without discovery. We do approve and appoint Captain Thomas Dover, Captain Woods Rogers, and Captain Stephen Courtney to command the men designed to land in three equal parties, except twenty-one men with Captain William Dampier and Mr. Thomas Glendall, who are to manage and take care of the guns, ammunition, provisions, etc., which we agree to be lodged in a convenient place, as near as possible to the best landing place nearest the waterside, in order to take care and help ship off the effects that we may take in the town who are also to serve either commander where most wanted. We leave the management of this expedition wholly to the prudent conduct of the above commanders whom we heartily wish and desire to consult each other on all occasions, as the most promising method to succeed and keep our designs secret, which is the only way to prevent the enemies removing their wealth or giving us a vigorous reception. This is our opinion, in witness whereof we have set our hands the twelfth day of April, 1709 signed by all the chief officers in both ships memorandum we have considered the opinion of the foregoing committee signed this day and do jointly concur with them and accordingly design to prosecute it with our lives and fortunes to the utmost of our power and judgment witness our hands this twelfth day of april seventeen o nine thomas dover president woods rogers stephen courtney end of section nine Section 10 of A Cruising Voyage Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. A Cruising Voyage Around the World by Woods Rogers. At Guayaquil, Part 1. April 13th. We appointed an officer to every ten men to prevent disorders and straggling ashore. The committee, having agreed on our method of command, left it to us jointly and vigorously to attack the enemy ashore. 
we knew that misfortunes attend sailors when out of their element and hearing that they began to murmur about the encouragement they were to expect for landing which they alleged was a risk more than they were shipped for to prevent their desertion which we had reason to apprehend since they were a mixed gang of most european nations we the commanders agreed on the most plausible methods we could then think of to form a good discipline among them if possible and to give them all needful encouragement that we might depend on their good order and bravery and therefore came to the following resolves whereas as it is agreed to land and take the town of guayaquil we fully resolved to do it with all manner of privacy and dispatch and that we ourselves and our men may have full encouragement to attempt it bravely and cheerfully we publish this following order in prime all manner of bedding and clothes without stripping all manner of necessaries gold rings buckles buttons liquors and provisions for our own expending and use with all sorts of arms and ammunition except great guns for ships is plunder and shall be divided equally amongst the men of each ship with their prizes whether aboard or ashore according to the whole shares two it is also agreed that any sort of wrought silver or gold crucifixes gold and silver watches or any other movables found about the prisoners or wearing apparel of any kind shall likewise be plunder provided always may make this reserve that money and women's earrings with loose diamonds pearls and precious stones be accepted and if anything is short and omitted in this publication we do hereby declare that when this expedition is over every particular man shall have a hearing or the persons already appointed for the company of both ships may come to us and insist on what is or ought to be deemed plunder either more or less than what is here inserted and that a general committee of the officers of both ships shall immediately meet and at once resolve if any moors is or ought to be plunder and that we shall give all manner of encouragement without fraud to the owners or prejudice to ourselves officers and men in the same manner as agreed on at the island of st vincent on this head provided always that our intent and meaning for the men's encouragement be not made liable to a construction prejudicial to the owners or ships company's interest and that under pretense of the aforesaid movables allowed to be plunder no person whatsoever do seize on or clandestinely hide any wrought or unwrought gold or silver pearls jewels diamonds and other precious stones which are not found about the prisoners or their wearing apparel which shall be accounted a high misdemeanor and punished severely and that no person do presume to keep any plunder but immediately deliver it to his officers publicly and carry it directly to the place appointed for plunder in case this or any other town fort ships or the like be taken in this expedition by storm then the same encouragement shall be allowed each man as agreed on at st vincent over and above the gratuity promised by the owners to such as shall signalize themselves in time of action as by their instrument appears but if any party of ours or the whole or any separate body shall be engaged with the enemy on shore and become victors then all prisoners the money arms and movables about them are immediately on that place to be brought to the officer or officers of that body or party and put into a general stock to be divided proportionately amongst those only of our men that were engaged in that action who are to enjoy the whole reputation and right of it to themselves and though there has been nothing yet taken worth a division of plunder we don't question but the effecting this good enterprise will equally encourage us all and that we shall gladly and expeditiously get the wealth of the town brought to the places appointed on shore there shall at the same time be several places appointed and men to receive plunder and a sufficient time before we leave the town allowed to ship it off by itself and men appointed to take care and an account of it which with all other plunder shall be entered in public books and when we come on board we hope and design to divide it equally to the satisfaction of all concerned and to prevent all manner of pernicious and mischievous ill conduct that may accrue by disorders on shore we pressingly remind you that any officer or other that shall be so brutish as to be drunk ashore in an enemy's country shall not only be severely punished but lose all share of whatsoever is taken in this expedition 
the same punishment shall be inflicted on any that disobeys command or runs from his post discourages our men or is cowardly in any action or presumes to burn or destroy anything in the town without our order or for mischief's sake or that shall be so sneakingly barbarous to debauch themselves with any prisoners on shore where we have more generous things to do both for our own benefit and the future reputation of ourselves and our country we shall always take care to keep prisoners of the best note as pledges for our men that may be accidentally missing for as soon as any man is wanting we shall engage the spaniards to bring him to us or give a satisfactory account of him but we desire no man to trust to this or be a moment from his officers and post and if all the foregoing rules be strictly followed we hope to exceed all other attempts of this nature before us in these parts and not only to enrich and oblige ourselves and friends but even to gain reputation from our enemies dated and signed on board the duke the thirteenth of april seventeen o nine thomas dover president stephen courtney wood rogers april fourteenth this morning we got all our arms ammunition and provisions with part of our men etc aboard our bark being the largest we took in part of captain courtney's men and his bark carrying the rest we stood into the great bay of guayaquil all night designing to leave the ships a good distance at sea for fear of being discovered from the town called tombs which lying on the starboard side going in would ruin our design wind at the south but very little latitude four degrees twenty three minutes eighty five degrees forty two minutes april fifteenth at break of day we saw a ship between us and the land being calm we sent off both our pinnaces manned and armed but our men expecting no resistance from that ship they hurried from us left out their swivel gun and carried but a slender stock of arms with them my brother john rogers being unfortunately aboard our ship to assist me in getting ready because he was to be lieutenant of my company ashore he stepped into our boat i had before this opposed his landing which he resented as a slight and this hindered me stopping him now though it was not his business he being second lieutenant of our consort and we having officers enough of our own for that service but mr fry who commanded the boat being related to us was the occasion of my brother's willingness to go as a volunteer with him the duchess's pinnace was worse provided than ours and had not arms enough for their men as captain cook told me afterwards about nine o'clock our boat came within shot of the ship which proved to be the french built ship belonging to lima the same we have been a cruisin for they hoisted their spanish ensign in its place and a flag at their top masthead which our boats took to be the bishop's banner because it was broad made of white satin and fringed which was unusual colors in ships they fired a gun at our boat which lay still above half an hour before the duchess pinnace came up she not rowing so well as ours when they came up captain cook mr fry and my brother consulted how to begin the attack with advantage they agreed that our boat should ply her under the stern and the other on the bow till they could get near enough to board at once but when they came up the spaniards brought a gun right aft and upwards of twenty small arms pointed into the boats so that the fight began before they could reach the station agreed on and both were forced to engage the enemy abaft where they had five guns mounted our people were constrained to fall astern twice after the loss of one man killed and three wounded the boats and sails were much damaged by the enemy's partridge shot yet they again attempted to come up and board her at this attack my unfortunate brother was shot through the head and instantly died to my unspeakable sorrow but as i began this voyage with the resolution to go through it and the greatest misfortune or obstacle shall not deter me i'll as much as possible avoid being thoughtful and afflicting myself for what can't be recalled but indefatigably pursue the concerns of the voyage which has hitherto allowed little respite our men upon this disaster left engaging and put all their spare men and arms into the duchess's boat who was to keep between the enemy and the shore to prevent them from landing their riches our ships having little wind were yet at a distance and our boat came aboard after noon with two dead and three wounded men april sixteenth we got possession of the spanish ship about two yesterday in the afternoon 
she had upwards of fifty spaniards and above one hundred negroes indians and mulattoes on board they would not strike to within half shot of our ships the duchess being somewhat nearest fired two shot over her and then she struck and bore down to us but we missed the bishop who ten days before landed at point st helena with his attendants plate etc designing to stop at guayaquil this morning we saw a small sail under the shore we sent our pinnace and the beginning who brought her off to us she proved a small bark from peta with soap cassa fistula and leather about twelve we read the prayers for the dead and threw my dear brother overboard with one of our sailors another lying dangerously ill we hoisted our colors but half mast up we began first and the rest followed firing each some volleys of small arms all our officers expressed a great concern for the loss of my brother he being a very hopeful active young man a little above twenty years of age april seventeenth we made ready to go ashore and read the encouragement agreed on the thirteenth to the men who all expressed themselves well pleased with the undertaking and were so forward to land that they make all the interest possible to go ashore not considering that we must secure a safe retreat by leaving a sufficient number on board our ships to man em and guard our prisoners but it was a proof of their courage since the advantage was alike either to stay on board or go ashore to prevent their straggling when landed we gave each man a ticket that he might remember what company he belonged to and appointed the best and soberest man we could pick to command every ten men under the captains captain courtney and i being willing to compliment our present captain dover agreed that he should have the preference in command at our landing being a considerable owner in our ship he had an equal third part of the men allotted to be under his command whilst ashore we were afterwards to take it in turns april eighteenth yesterday afternoon captain courtney and i settled everything on board our ships and prizes and got all the men designed for landing on board the barks we proportioned the rest and put irons on board every ship because having many more prisoners than we could leave men to guard em we must have em well secured we agreed to leave on board the duke forty-two men and boys sick and well robert fry commander thirty-seven aboard the duchess edward cook commander fourteen aboard the galleon john bridge master fourteen aboard havre de grace robert nolman master and four aboard the beginning henry duck master the whole being one hundred eleven and two hundred and one were designed for the shore the prisoners on board were above three hundred more than one-half spaniards and indians and the rest negroes the captain and seven of the chief spaniards taken in the last prize i carried aboard our bark to go with us to the town fearing they might be dangerous persons to leave behind us last midnight we left the ships everything being in good order aboard both embarkations we were when we parted about nine leagues distant from the island sancta clara and not less than thirty-six from guayaquil we ordered captain cook and fry to keep at sea undiscovered forty-eight hours and then to make the best of their way to point arena and stay there at an anchor till our return having engaged signor morel and another spaniard to be their pilots at about twelve this day we passed by the island sancta clara having little wind and the weather very hot this island appears like a core extended therefore the spaniards call it morto it's not above two miles long we left it on the starboard side which is not the ship's channel for none enter that way but barks by reason of shoals both on the island and toward the main within it to the northward about ten last night we came to an anchor in sight of point arena with both barks not being able to stem the tide at four in the morning we weighed when captain courtney and i with our boat and forty men left the barks and ordered em to lie at puna one tide after us that we might have time to surprise guayaquil before they should appear in sight of it to alarm them for we had noticed that they keep a lookout a league below the town we reached about halfway to puna and landed on the island where we stayed during the ebb tide and hid our boats under the mangrove branches this island is not passable being full of thick mangroves and swamps that swarm with mosquitoes april twentieth yesterday in the evening we rowed and towed one another with the flood that if seen in the night we might look like drift timber we had an excellent indian pilot that advised us to come to a grapplin about eleven at night to lie in our boats about a mile short of the town and to surprise em by break of day 
we took his advice but just as we got in by the town saw two lights by the waterside in bark logs which we secured with all the canoes but an indian escaping he alarmed the people about the church who ran into the woods before we could reach the houses however we secured the lieutenant that governs here with his family and about twenty others who assured us there could be nobody to give notice of us to guayaquil now we had secured them and the rest being fled to the woods we sent some of our men who took the lookouts at their posts and cut all their canoes and bark logs to pieces there and also at the town the day was hot and two of our men finding liquors in the houses got drunk betimes this place has about thirty houses and a small chapel we found a spanish paper here that gave us some uneasiness it was directed to the lieutenant who had the chief command here and ordered him to keep a strict watch signifying that they had notice of captain dampier's coming pilot to a squadron into the seas the copy of this paper was sent from lima to all inhabited places on the coast of peru signifying that the french were on the first notice to fit out after us and the bark that came from paita told us of two great ships that lay in cayo road and one at pisco besides two in concepcion a port of chile being all french frigates from forty to fifty guns and upwards notwithstanding the report of their not coming into these seas any more but to our great satisfaction we are certain that we were not discovered before this and that it's next to impossible any sufficient force can arm out from lima to be here in less than twenty-four days by which time we hope to finish and be gone where they cannot find us but since we perceive their accounts of us imperfect and that they believe a squadron comes under captain dampier's pilotage and he being known by the people because he surprised this village when last in these seas we agreed amongst ourselves how to improve this spanish story of a squadron which i hope will not only hinder their fitting out from lima but even alarm them there the substance of this spanish advice paper in english is as follows to the lieutenant-general don jeronimo bosa y solis corregidor and judge of the city of st jago de guayaquil under the jurisdiction of the captain-general for his majesty i have a letter i received from his excellency the lord marquis de castel dos reyes viceroy governor and captain-general of these kingdoms with the copy of another of that tenor following in the packet with letters from spain which i have received there are orders from his majesty giving an account of a squadron of seven sail getting ready at london by several lords from forty-four to seventy-four guns each to sail to the south sea under the conduct of an english man named dampier that they are first to sail for ireland in april to victual there and afterwards to possess themselves of an island and harbor in these seas and particularly the island of juan fernandez you are to give an account to all those provinces where it is necessary that they may take proper measures to guard the coasts and harbors order don jeronimo as soon as he receives this to give notice of it to the people on all the coasts under his jurisdiction to withdraw their cattle and provisions and that he don't neglect to put this in execution that so the enemies finding no provision may be obliged to retire from these seas whether they can't bring provision enough to maintain them for so long a voyage and let the said don jeronimo place guards on all the coasts and in all the seaports where it is necessary with orders to be vigilant and carefully to observe every sail that comes into any port and give an account of their numbers with the utmost dispatch to don jeronimo the corregidore that he may send the same from one corridor to another until it come to the viceroy's hands without fail all along the coast belonging to don jeronimo and particularly that those he has given orders to do immediately dispatch em for the king's service this i trust he will do to all that can give notice of the enemy's motions that it may be impossible for him to get provisions on the coast when tis well guarded or in the villages of his jurisdiction and i trust to his activity and zeal for the royal service in a matter of such weight and consequence and that he also give notice if there be on the coasts or ports in his jurisdiction any french ships as we hear there is in these seas and give em warning of the enemy's squadron take a certificate that he gave em such notice and send it to me that they mayn't pretend to have been surprised if the enemy get any advantage of em 
God Preserve Don Jeronimo, etc. Lima, March 20, 1709. El Marques de Castel de los Reyos, Don Jeronimo Boza de Solis, etc. The like orders are sent to the Lieutenant General and the other officers belonging to the sea coast and the Lieutenant of Puna, etc. April 21st. At two yesterday afternoon I left Captain Courtney and Captain Dampier at Puna, and went in quest of the barks, admiring they did not come in sight, they being now a tide and half behind. I carried with me the lieutenant of Puna, and went with the great launch and our pinnace, designing to join Captain Courtney and Captain Dampier again, who are to lie all night in the river to prevent being discovered by any advice going before us to Guayaquil. I found the barks about four o'clock, four leagues below Puna. They had been with us according to appointment, but last night were misinformed by the pilot aboard the Duchess's bark, who brought them to anchor with a fair wind below that place, thinking they had got the length of it. Our bark's pilot, who was the best, being with us in the boats. We got other pilots at Puna and left him aboard the bark, where I punished one that I brought aboard drunk from Puna, and had him severely whipped before the whole company as a terror to the rest. I was not aboard above half an hour before low water, and had just time to embark Captain Dover and part of his company in the launch, and as many more as we could carry in our pinnace to get before the barks up the river. We rowed till twelve at night, judged it high water, and came to a grappling. We saw lights which we took to be Puna. It blowed fresh, was very dark, with a small rolling sea, and the boat being deep laden and crammed with men, I had rather be in a storm at sea than here. But in regard we are about a charming undertaking. We think no fatigue too hard. At daybreak we saw a bark above us in the river. We thought it to be a stranger, and sent our pinnace to her. I was in the launch behind a shoal, which we were forced to go round to get into the channel where the bark was. By eight o'clock I was aboard her and found it to be our bark, which the honest pilot had brought so high the last tide. We have no sight of the Duchess's bark since we left her last night. About ten we came up with Captain Courtney and Captain Dampier, who told us they had kept a good lookout, and that nothing had passed to them up the river. About noon it was high water, we lay with the boats under the mangroves all the ebb, and the bark off in the river. We were now about halfway up to Guayaquil from Puna, and might have gone farther, but that there was a plantation or farm a little higher which would have discovered us, and alarmed the town, should we have gone higher before night. April 22 it was very hot yesterday, and we were pestered and stung grievously by the mosquitoes, as we lay under the mangroves. At six in the evening the bark and boats made way up the river. By twelve at night we were in sight of the town with all the boats, in which we had one hundred ten men. We saw a very great fire on the top of an adjoining hill, and lights in the town. In half an hour we were abreast of it and ready to land, but saw abundance of lights appear at once coming down the hill, and the town full of them. We inquired of the Indians, our pilots, whether it was any saint's day, or what might be the occasion of it, and they answered us that it must be an alarm. It was very dark whilst we lay still driving on the river. Being just high water, we heard a Spaniard from the shore talking loudly that Puna was taken, and that the enemy were coming up the river. This made us conclude it was an alarm. Immediately after we heard their bells making a confused noise, and then a volley of small arms and two great guns. Above an hour was spent in debate betwixt Captain Dover, Captain Courtney, and myself whether we should land. I asked the consent of the lieutenants in all the boats about landing, telling them I supposed this to be the first alarm and that we had best land during their consternation, but they differed in opinion, and few were for landing in the night. I asked Captain Dampier how the buccaneers behaved themselves in such cases, and he told me they never attacked any large place after it was alarmed. It drew near two in the morning, and the ebb run so strong that the great boat and yawl could not row up to land, so that it being too late to attempt the town, I advised to fall down the river out of sight of it, to meet our barks, and land with the morning flood. Upon this all our boats drove down with the ebb about a league below the town, where we lay till daybreak, and saw our bark, Mr. Glendall Commander, brought by the honest Indian pilot a mile above us, for we had passed by him in the night. 
we rode back to him and recruited our men as well as we could we found the water fresh there and drank of it though yesterday it was a little brackish the bark lay against a wood of tall trees close by the shore and we kept a file of musketeers with their arms pointing into the wood with orders to fire if they saw any man and we kept firing a musket now and then into the woods to prevent ambuscades about three our yawl and launch came aboard for they could not row back with us to the bark till the tide slackened and the flood was coming at ten we saw the duchess's bark come in sight immediately i ordered the anchor to be got up to fall on the town which was about two miles from us but captain dover opposed it pressed that we might have a consultation with as many of the officers as were present and to lie in the boat astern of the bark that what was debated might not be overheard by the rest of our company we immediately assembled there accordingly and captain dover insisted on the difficulty of attempting the enemy now they had been so long alarmed alleging we should but throw away our own and our men's lives or else weaken ourselves so much as might occasion the loss of the remaining part of the voyage that chiefly brought us from england and was our greatest dependence that the town appeared large and consequently was much more able to hold out than we to attack it and though the spaniards in these parts had no extraordinary fighting character yet if they armed the mulattoes as they generally did on the like occasions we might find the attempt very desperate with other objections not fit to recite here he concluded that our best method would be to send a trumpeter with proposals to the enemy to trade with us for the cargoes of negroes and other goods aboard our prizes that immediate meeting should be appointed the prices for the negroes and goods fixed and good hostages given us for the performance within a limited time and if they agreed to this that we would not land this proposal i withstood by the best arguments i could and urged our landing immediately lest the enemy gain time by our delays might send off their wealth and get leisure to strengthen themselves so as to bid us defiance this being put to the vote the majority was for landing and as an obligation to captain dover who was a part owner in our ships we agreed he should lead on the attack as he requested and if he took the town he should give the watchword that night and captain courtney and i to take it in turns after him but this resolution did not hold for captain dover reflected on me and said i should be answerable for all the damage that might happen to us on our landing by these reflections and some other people's indifferency i had reason to doubt the consequence of attempting the enemy with success since we were so divided amongst ourselves therefore at length i yielded to send two of our prisoners instead of a trumpeter as captain dover first proposed with the foregoing proposals the other prisoners in our bark obliged themselves for the return of these two in less than an hour and this method every one seemed to be pleased with so we put the captain of the french built ship and the lieutenant of puna ashore in our boat and charged them to return from the shore in less than an hour otherwise we would land in the meanwhile we ran up with the other bark and lay against the middle of the town at an anchor as we sailed up we saw four barks put off from the town to go higher up the river and just as the limited hour was passed we sent our boats well manned and armed after them who soon took and brought them to us meanwhile our prisoners returned in a boat from the town with the spanish master le camp who discoursed with us and told us that at his return ashore the corridor or governor with another gentleman would come off and treat with us we soon put him ashore again and quickly after came off the corregidor with another gentleman captain dover and i met them in our boat with a linguist and carried them aboard one of the barks that our boats had taken as they endeavored to escape up the river april twenty third we did nothing yesterday in the afternoon but secure the barks and treat with the governor several of our prisoners told us they did not doubt to find credit here and that they would also deal with us so that we were in hopes of more profit by selling our cargoes and negroes than if we had ransacked the town the corridor and we had verbally agreed for the goods by the lump at one hundred forty pieces of eight per bale one sort with another and talked of the price for other things we parted about five in the afternoon he having desired to go ashore that he might prevail with the other gentlemen to agree with him and promised to meet us three commanders on board one of our prizes at eight in the evening we ordered our linguists to get candles lighted and the best entertainment we could provide for them 
but the time being elapsed and they not appearing it gave us great reason to suspect we were tricked therefore we sent our boats again above the town and alarmed them afresh in the night our sentinels hailed a boat after midnight that came aboard us with a gentleman who told us he was sent from the corridor with a present of two bags of flour two sheep and two hogs ready killed two jars of wine and two of brandy and to assure us the governor had been with us according to appointment but that one of the chief merchants concerned was absent yet he would come off in the morning by seven o'clock on board one of the new ships next the shore where he desired us to meet him and requested us to believe he was a man of honor for though he had been considerably reinforced since he left us and that more men were continually coming into the town he resolved to discharge yesterday's promise and therefore hoped we would forbear offering any hostilities above the town because the women and children were there in sanctuary with little or no wealth to prompt us to plunder them we the three commanders returned our humble service to the corridor and our kind thanks for his present being sorry we had nothing to oblige him with by way of return but desired he might be told from us that we all admired at his not keeping his word according to appointment and still depended that he would convince us he was a man of honor by meeting us at seven in the morning where we agreed last night otherwise our treaty was at an end we were all uneasy till seven in the morning when we saw a flag of truce aboard the new ship and supposing the governor to be there we manned our pinnace and sent our linguist to give our promise that if the corridor came aboard the bark our prize he should be at liberty to return upon this he with three more came aboard and we ordered our two frigate barks to go close under the shore next the best part of the town and that everything should be kept in readiness for landing lest we should not agree with these gentlemen nothing else was transacted this morning but our conference with these men our first proposals were fifty thousand pieces of eight contribution for the town and we would deliver them their two ships that lay near the shore and six barks provided they would oblige themselves to buy our two prizes cargoes of goods and negroes and gave us sufficient hostages for payment within nine days the latter they gave us some hopes of complying with if we would take their words and two hostages which we thought too little for though they came to our price for the goods they would not give near that sum for the town and ships alleging they were not yet in our power and consequently not liable to so large contributions adding that they had men and arms sufficient in the town and ships to protect them we all concluded by their dilatory treaty that they only designed to trick us and gain time upon which we gave them this answer that the ships we could have in a minute or set them on fire that we did not fear taking the town at pleasure that we looked upon it as much our own as if it was in our possession and must have the money or good hostages otherwise before night we would set it on fire by noon the corridor and the other gentlemen agreed with us to buy both cargoes and to give hostages for forty thousand pieces of eight for the town two new ships and six barks but neither of us were to sign this agreement till it was confirmed by the chief of men of the town ashore which the corridor was to procure in an hour's time april twenty seventh about one yesterday afternoon the governor was put ashore in my pinnace some insisted on our stopping him because not long before an indian came in a canoe from the master le camp and the other officers ashore to know whether the governor had agreed because our barks lay near the shore the spaniards kept to arms expecting we might fall on them suddenly and said they wanted nothing but him and if he could not come his orders when to begin the fight with us if we did not agree this message was delivered in our hearing and occasioned disputes among us about keeping him prisoner those who were for it urged that if he went ashore the enemy would certainly fight us and that as he had broke with us last night we might break with him now but i was utterly against it since we had given him our word of honor to the contrary and at last we agreed and sent him ashore the three gentlemen stayed with us as hostages upon the request of the corridor neither they nor we doubting but the agreement would be ratified ashore the time allotted for answer being passed a messenger from the town came to inform us they could raise but thirty thousand pieces of eight and not a word of the trade so we sent our linguist and a prisoner with our final answer that if they did not in half an hour send us three more good hostages for the forty thousand pieces of eight agreed on we would take down our flag of truce land and give no quarter and fire the town and ships in the meantime we saw the spaniards quit the new ships and we took possession of them 
our messenger returned and in half an hour three men more from the town came to the bank against our barks holding out a white handkerchief to parley again they told us their resolution was to give us thirty-two thousand pieces of eight and no more so we ordered our linguist to tell them we had done treating and bid the spaniards ashore retire forthwith and keep out of shot of us if they designed to save their lives we all at once hauled down our white flag of truce and let fly our english and field colors i ordered two of our guns of about six hundred weight each mounted on field carriages into the great launch to land before their faces and we filled our three boats full of men i went in our pinnace captain dover in the launch and captain courtney in his pinnace the three boats landing about seventy men we towed the launch ashore mr glendall third lieutenant of our ship tarried aboard our bark with ten men to ply our guns over our heads into the town as we landed the enemy drew up their horse at the end of the street which fronted our men and barks and also lined the houses with men within half musket shot of the bank where we landed they made a formidable show in respect to our little number that was to attack them we landed and fired every man on his knee at the brink of the bank then loaded and as we advanced called to our bark to forbear firing for fear of hurting our men we who landed kept loading and firing very fast but the enemy made only one discharge and retired back to their guns where their horse drew up a second time we got to the first houses and as we opened the streets saw four guns pointed at us before a spacious church but as our men came in sight firing the horse scoured off this encouraged me to call to our men to run and seize the guns and i immediately hastened toward them with eight or ten of our men to within pistol shot of the guns when we all fired some at the gunner and others at the men in arms at the front of the church where they appeared very numerous but by the time we had loaded and more of our men came in sight the enemy began to run and quitted the guns after they had fired them with round and partridge shot one of the last was discharged at us very near but thanks to god did us no hurt and they had not time to relay them we that were foremost ran into the church and seized about ten or twelve prisoners by that time many of our men were coming up and captain courtney and captain dover with the rest of their company came all to the church where i stayed to secure that post with a few men the rest marched with them to the other end of the town from the time we landed till we took their guns and possession of the church which lies above a furlong from the waterside i believe was not much above half an hour i posted captain dampier and above twenty-five men with guns which we turned on the enemy who had run clear out of the town by this time the remaining part of our men were landed and joined me at the church then i marched after captain courtney and captain dover with this latter gang for most of those that got to the church with me first i could not stop after i had secured the guns so that seven of them ran into the valley and woods adjoining to pursue the spaniards and having cowards to deal with came well back but being offended at their boldness i reprimanded them and they promised never to be guilty of the like folly again all the men in general behaved themselves with great courage but like sailors could be kept under no command as soon as the first piece was fired however it happened much better than we could expect for now the attack is over they keep handsomely together and forbear immoderate drinking i overtook captain dover and captain courtney at the other end of the town and left captain dover to keep guard at a church there as i marched back with captain courtney i left him in the middle of the town at another church and i came to my first post at the church where the guns were planted and sent captain dampier with his men to reinforce captain courtney and captain dover thus we were in quiet possession of the town by sunset and posted our guards having no opposition after the enemy quitted the great church in the evening i went aboard our boats settled a good watch and secured the spaniards the corridor left behind them then i returned ashore to the church captain dover set the houses on fire that fronted the church where he was posted which burnt all night and the next day there was a hill near his quarter and thick woods within half shot of the church so that the enemy were almost continually popping at him all night he told me that the next day some parties appeared out of the woods but when he fired a volley at them they retired our quarters were quiet and out of hearing all night the enemy might have done him mischief had they been courageous since we were not near enough to assist him in the night for the town being long we could not keep the hole without dividing at such a distance but his firing the houses covered the worst part of his quarters that night which was of great service to him 
Captain Courtney relieved him at daybreak, and they both quitted Captain Dover's quarters as being too much exposed to the enemy. An Indian that I had taken prisoner told us that he knew of much money up the river in bark logs and houses, upon which Captain Courtney and I last night detached twenty-one men out of our companies and sent them in his boat up the river under the command of his new second lieutenant, Mr. Connolly. I would fain have sent both pinnaces to make the best use of our time and seize that wealth, finding little or none of it in the town but the rest would by no means consent to it lest the enemy might engage us next morning and then we should want our boats and men when i could not possibly prevail for another boat and men enough to man both pinnaces i desired captain courtney's boat might go because the largest and she was manned out of both our companies in the morning we began with iron crows and mauls to break open the other two churches and all the storehouses cellars etc which was soon done for nobody was left at home nor much of value to be found but flour peas beans and jars of wine and brandy in great plenty we began to carry it to the waterside but having sultry hot wet and unhealthful weather and our men being fatigued they became so weak that they could not work very well at this new employment they would fain have had the boarded floor of the church taken up to look amongst the dead for treasure fancying the spaniards might hide their money there but i would not suffer it because of a contagious distemper that had swept off a great number of people not long before so that the church floor was full of graves we had yet found but two of the enemy killed in the town and one prisoner who was slightly wounded in the head but this day i heard fifteen of them were killed and wounded amongst whom was the chief gunner an irishman that fired the last gun at us who had lived some years amongst them on our side we had but two men wounded one of them yerrick derrickson a dutch man belonging to my company was shot through between the lower part of his neck and shoulder but i believe not mortal and one john martin a portuguese mortally wounded aboard the bark occasioned by a cohorn shell which split as soon as fired out of our cohorn mortar the spaniard's force being variously reported by our prisoners i'll not insert it until i am better informed the fatigue i have had since i left our ships in this hot weather has weakened and disordered me very much april twenty fifth we kept our colors flying on the tower of the church captain dover keeping guard there all day whilst i and captain courtney took care to get everything we found useful carried to the waterside yesterday in the afternoon we sent the lieutenant of puna and another prisoner into the country with proposals to ransom the town a great part of the enemy being in the woods about a league from us they have but ordinary quarters because of the great rain their horses being in parties and continually in sight alarm us several times a day the prisoners returned to us in the evening with an ambiguous answer but desired they might go again in the morning to prevent burning the town about ten last night the boat returned that we had sent up the river having been from us about twenty-four hours they were seven leagues up and sixteen of them landed at six several different places the other five kept the boat having a swivel gun to defend themselves at one place they separated and mr connolly with three others rambled so far in the woods to look for wealth that after three hours search they could not find the way back to the rest but by accident met again and got to the boat william davis one of my men was shot through the hinder part of the neck by the enemy the wound was not dangerous and none the rest hurt they chased thirty-five horsemen well armed that were coming to help those of guayaquil the houses up the river were full of women and particularly at one place there were above a dozen handsome genteel young women well dressed where our men got several gold chains and earrings but were otherwise so civil to them that the ladies offered to dress some victuals and brought them a cask of good liquor some of their largest gold chains were concealed and wound about their middles legs and thighs etc but the gentlewomen in these hot countries being very thin clad with silk and fine linen and their hair dressed with ribbons very neatly our men by pressing felt the chains etc with their hands on the outside of the ladies apparel and by their linguist modestly desired the gentlewoman to take him off and surrender him this i mention as a proof of our sailors modesty in respect to mr connolly and mr selkirk the late governor of juan fernandez who commanded this party for being young men i was willing to do em this justice hoping the fair sex will make em a grateful return when we arrive in great britain on account of their civil behavior to these charming prisoners 
they called at this house for provisions as they returned down from the river and being so civil at first they gave their fair landladies no uneasiness or surprise at a second visit they took a large empty bark but left her up the river and brought with them in gold chains earrings and plates i believe about one thousand pounds value with a negro that had been serviceable in discovering part of the hidden treasure but they all agreed that the want of another boat lost much more than they got for while they'd searched and plundered one side the canoes and bark logs did cross the river and carry the people and purchase out of their reach for want of another boat to prevent it they also informed us that in the places where they had been above the town they saw more than three hundred armed horse and foot in several parties so that we apprehended the enemy designed to gain time by pretending to ransom till with a vast odds they might attack us and reckoned themselves sure of victory but we for fear of being surprised agreed to assemble in a body at every alarm which was beat several times a day on the sight of large parties though it hindered our business we found five jars of powder some match and shot with a good quantity of ordinary arms three drums with several swords and lances in the church where i'd picked the corridor's gold-headed cane and another captain's with a silver head for among the spaniards none carry a cane but the chief officers and of those none under a captain must wear a cane with a silver or gold head so that those gentlemen were much in haste to leave the badges of their office behind them after captain dover had quitted his post yesterday morning one of our men came to tell me that the enemy was coming down the hill that way upon us we beat an alarm and leaving part of our men with the guns i marched with the rest and met captain courtney and part of his company on the bridge retiring he told me the enemy was numerous and well armed in the north end of the town i desired him to join us and we would visit them he left his chief lieutenant and the rest of his men at arms in his quarters and we went together with seventy men to face the enemy as we marched forward they retired only now and then they shot at us out of the woods we looked into the two churches and several houses but found nobody the woods were very thick and joined to the backs of the houses from whence we had several shot all round us which we returned at a venture but none of them touched us which was a very great providence for it was really strange that they missed us captain courtney and i could not agree to keep that end of the town so we marched back again took what we liked best into our boats and carried it aboard the barks april twenty sixth about one yesterday in the afternoon our prisoners returned with an offer of thirty thousand pieces of eight for the town with their ships and barks to be paid in twelve days which we don't approve of nor should we stay so long for a greater sum but these delays they design to gain time that if they don't fight us they may draw their forces from lima for we know an express was dispatched thither immediately on our arrival this morning we sent our final answer viz that they should see the town all on fire by three in the afternoon if they did not agree and give us sufficient hostages for the above mentioned sum to be paid within six days during which time we would grant a cessation of arms between guayaquil and puna where we expected they would meet us and purchase our cargoes a frenchman belonging to my company whom i sent with the others by request of captain courtney to strengthen his quarters being put sentinel last night shot hugh tidcombe one of their men so that he died the accident happened by a too severe order at their quarters to shoot any in the night that did not answer and neither this man nor the sentinel as i am informed understood how to ask or answer the watchword which by neglect a man was unaccountably lost mr gardner one of their officers and nine men more yesterday in the afternoon engaged at the north end of the town with a party of spaniards whom they chased into the woods but following them too far were attacked by others and one of our men shot through the calf of his leg and another of them while he stopped to relate his piece was shot against the middle of the pole axe that hung at his side which made an impression on the iron and bruised the part under it so that it proved a piece of armor well placed the other man who was wounded in the leg by his irregularity and hard drinking fell into a fever that carried him off at the same time mr stratton captain courtney's chief lieutenant having his pistols hanging at his side one of them unluckily discharged itself against the outside of the thickest part of his leg and left a bullet in the flesh but there's little danger of his life he being by this accident disabled to make a quick retreat if occasion required his captain immediately ordered him on board the bark 
Upon these accidents, and perceiving the enemy to increase and grow bolder, Captain Courtney brought his company to my quarters. Last night we all lay in the church, round which we kept sentinels within a musket shot, the sentinels, as customary, calling to each other every quarter of an hour, to prevent their sleeping, an hour being surprised in the night. Every man kept his arms and ammunition in exact order by him, and was strictly charged to rise at the least alarm. We unhung a small church bell and sent it aboard for our ship's use. We have done little this twenty-four hours towards shipping off goods, because the enemy were continually popping at us from the woods. The weather was very wet, hot, and faint, the streets deep and slippery, and the ways to the waterside very bad, which mightily incommoded us. End of section 10